Thank you, uh, uh, Mayor Holyrood, and uh, once again, uh, thank you uh, the community of Haines for uh, allowing us to come in and participate in their community. Uh, uh, next, we are uh, uh, we, next guest is going was going to participate remotely. So as you saw with our technical difficulties this morning with uh, the coffee maker and plug in, sometimes technologies always work well at both ends. So uh, Mr. Peterson is not uh, connected. He's trying this uh, at some point kind of up there in. So, so well, Mr. Herrero, you're, you're, you're on deck. Why don't we call That's it on? Right. Right. All right. And, and so, uh, yeah, but I, think I just want to do a, a shout out to, uh, to uh, to, to Mayor Allroad and, and some reference to uh, President Peterson as well. The, the next generation of leadership that is uh, emerging and really has their heart and soul based in these communities. Uh, it's just uh, something that is uh, heartwarming to see as, uh, as, as it occurs, the leadership that happens in President Peterson and President Head of Central Council is just a, um, a very key partner for Southeast Conference. So look forward to hearing from him. But um, we can uh, we can go right into the governor's office. We're uh, we're just excited to have Mr. Randy Morero joining us. He's going to be here as much as he can over the next couple of days with us as well, and has really taken a keen interest in so many of the issues that are on this agenda. So you may see him a couple of times, but um, we're just glad to have him, and hope we can give him a warm Southeast Conference welcome. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of Governor Dunleavy, my name is Randy Murraro, I'm the Chief of Staff. I ask you to attend for him today while he continues work in the legislature on a number of issues. Uh, so hopefully that will resolve well. Uh, today, I think this is the scheduled last day of that special session. Uh, there's bills on the agenda for COVID relief measures to help our hospitals. And there are appropriation bills, the permanent fund dividend that's on the agenda. Uh, fiscal plan for the state of Alaska is on the agenda. And so hopefully in these closing hours, we can make some progress on all those uh, and uh, move the state forward. So um, maybe called back by the governor to Juno to work on these uh, last hours of the session. If not, I'll be here through Thursday in the very run. So. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, thank you for the mayor. And, uh, Senator Murkowski is here. Uh, all the officials, everyone that puts it together, everyone that works on the food. Uh, it takes a lot of work to put these together, so thank you. Uh, before I start, I wanted to just ask all the state employees, eight employees, to stand up real quick so you can see them. They'll be here, I think, through the, through the event. Uh, we have eight of personnel. Several others. So feel free to engage them on issues, uh, things that come up to your mind. Um, so I wanted to start out my presentation with some news on the ferry system since that's a top issue for uh, Southeast Conference. Where I think, I, and I really believe, we're at a unique moment in time for the ferry system where we have a chance to rebuild it. Uh, reform it and turn it into a, uh, a model nationwide that uh, other states will envy. So, and uh, the reason I say that is if, if we look at where we're at, we've basically got a foundation that's now been reset for the ferry system. And when I say foundation, I'm thinking of four things the budget, the schedule, the management of the system, and the uh, taking in public comment and a new Marine Highway Operations Board that's going to help. Uh, uh, put the system on a better course. So uh, coming out of the governor's working group on the ferry system, Admiral Baird and his, his members recommended a longer uh, budget period and schedule. And so the governor working with Senator Stedman and Senator Bishop uh, proposed a 18 month schedule and budget for the ferry system. And that passed the legislature 
That's the first time in the history of the system that they've had such a long schedule and budget and their budget uh, to support that schedule came in at uh, roughly 10 million a month that's available to run the system 182 million dollars over 18 months uh, but to note that number is even better because there is no use of ferry receipts of the fare box that that is that budget is supported by non-receipts and that means that roughly four million a month is estimated to pile up into the uh, Green Highway Stabilization Fund and be available in future years to help the, help the system. So uh, the last estimate I saw was that the way we structured the budget, there'd be roughly $80 million in fair revenue built up by the end of 2023. Uh, Budget-wise, the ferry system is on a very good course. And then we look at uh, beyond the budget, the schedule, we have an 18 month schedule now, which uh, is expected to bring in several million more dollars in revenue just because people wanting to book on the ferry system will be able to do that in advance. Uh, in past years, uh, the schedule has been tied to the annual budget so closely that the schedule for the ferry system wouldn't be printed even until May uh, when the budget passed sometime in April, the first part of May. So the longer schedule really helps us stabilize the system and get it um, uh, to be reliable for the community. Um, so we've got the budget in place, we've got the schedule in place, and then we look at management. Uh, we have a new commissioner of DOT uh, by the name of Brian Anderson, who's been with the department for quite a few years in Northern region, uh, but has already made a trip to catch a can and talk to uh, DOT staff there about the system, start learning about it. The governor has asked me to take it on as a personal uh, effort uh, to oversee the, the ferry system and management of it. So I'll be working with Ryan, I'll be working with Marine Highway staff, and we'll be making sure that uh, very good decisions are made for the ferry system going forward. So, so we've got the budget, we have the schedule, we have the management in place. We have a marine highway, a new marine highway operations board that right now is taking applications for members. If anyone wants to serve on that board, they should file their applications on the online at the governor's, uh, the governor's site and just file online and put your name in the hat and we'll be filling out that board here in the next 30 days. So feel free to, to jump in and help. Uh, help run the system through that board. Um, so we have budget schedule management in place, and we're also gonna be setting up a website here soon to take comments from anyone. Uh, those comments will be coming to myself as well as Commissioner Anderson and DOT. So if you have ideas on improvements, in, including, you know, anyone can submit a comment, uh, crew members, uh, captains, members of the public, uh, communities, um, anyone can submit comments, so uh, that'll be up and running, I think, in about a week, and you'll be able to get to that off the governor's website. So uh, we're going to use those comments to uh, review the system and how it's running from everything from fair levels to scheduling and other things. So uh, that'll be a good management tool for us. So uh, we're in good shape on those fronts on the capital budget. That's basically terminals and ships. Uh, for terminals and ships, we have um, several improvements that are happening on the ferry cupboard. Uh, the governor asked the legislature for $15 million to put crew quarters on the boat so that it can run and, and, and be used on more routes. I think that work's going to start here maybe in another 30 to 45 days. <clears throat> and that'll give us a very flexible boat to use around, around coast, coastal Alaska. We've got the Tustamina replacement, which is designed near complete. Uh, that uh, vessel uh, project should be going out soon as well. Uh, the Columbia has some work on some fins and a stabilizer, some other parts, annual maintenance. It is in the schedule. The Columbia will be running again. That'll give us three mainliners. Uh, the Malaspina is not in the schedule. It's tied up at the dock. I went out to Ward Cove, didn't get to get on the boat, but my understanding from talking to staff is there's some buckling in the deck and uh, 
some severe issues with that boat and the estimate to repair it uh, is climbing and it's nearing $70 million. So we'll have to make a, you know, there's a decision there whether that 70 million would be better spent into a new vessel. Um, on terminals, Prince Rupert is a key terminal we're looking at. I'm planning a trip to Prince Rupert. I think Robert Venables is going to come with me. We may have some others come with us, but uh, we've got a design solution to get the terminal up and running. Prince Rupert service is in the schedule, and so we'll be pushing that forward. Um, Cascade Point uh, is a terminal project with Gold Belt, uh, last minute corporation. Uh, that should be moving forward soon. Uh, we're talking with mayors in Saxman and Metlakatla and other communities that want some better service and have some ideas how that can happen. I've been in Saxman twice and met with Mayor Saluto in the last 30 days. So I think we're gonna make some pro progress uh, on that run. Um, and then there's roads, you know, there's a uh, Southeast Transportation Plan in 2004, I think is the last one that's been adopted. Uh, but it had it envisioned a number of connecting roads to shorten some ferry runs. Um, and then Congress also provided in 2006 a number of easements across federal land to build roads. Um, we built several in the last three or four years. At Bounder Bay near Ketchikan, we built 79 miles of new road. Catalan Bay Road in Sitka was another 79 miles of new road. Cape Petersburg Road uh, was 40, roughly 40 miles of, of road work. Most of that was existing roads, but I think there's 10 to 12 miles of new road there. Uh, the Shelter Cove Road is another seven to nine miles, and we're looking at some other 4407 easements. It's the federal name for those easements. We're looking at some more of those around, around the coast to see if, if we can get those going. So. Um, lots of progress on the operating side, lots of progress on the capital side. And the good news is that in addition to all that work, we now have a bill pending in the House in this infrastructure bill that provides even uh, more significant resources for terminals, for roads, uh, and for new ferries. And Senator Murkowski, who's here, has really done a great job of getting those provisions into the bill. And, and uh, we're still uh, at our level, breaking them down, trying to make sure we understand exactly what funding amounts are coming to Alaska and, and what the eligibility of the uses is. But that that those resources, if that bill passes, would be a really significant help to the marine highway system. And thank you, Senator, for all your work on that. Um, so where we end up at the end of the day uh, on marine highway system is we have a, a good budget in place. Uh, we have a schedule, 18 month schedule in place. We have a Marine Highway Operations Board, a new management that's going to start driving downward into the uh, management of the system to make sure that improvements are made. Uh, and then we'll have an opportunity for everyone to comment, you know, their thoughts on improvements that we'll, we'll review and, and look for good ideas. And I, you know, I, I think the crew, particularly, and the captains will come forward with some really good ideas. So I look forward to. To reading all those comments. Um, we also have a uh, authority in federal statute, I think we may be the only ferry system in the nation that can flex uh, federal highway funds, regular road funds over the ferry system for use. So we're going to make sure we use all the tools and we're going to try to develop a really effective, efficient, but reliable system for the community you know, coming up here. And I think they're going to see a lot more progress in this next uh, year, 2022, is going to be a really big year for the new highway system. Uh, I look forward to working with the federal staff. I'm, I'm on with, with the congressional delegations, chief of staff. Every Monday at 7 a.m., I, I, we, we get on and talk about issues, and ferry system is one of those. Uh, so it's a real opportunity uh, to work together I think, at the federal level, the state level, the local level, um, and even with individuals to get the ferry system headed uh, off to a, a great new start. Um, and so that, it's really a bright future, I believe, for the ferry system. We are having some labor uh, recruiting issues, so we're offering incentives right now to recruit and retain uh, workers for the ferry system. If you know anyone that wants to apply, they can go to the State of Alaska website and apply for a job. Uh, 
My grandfather was a steward on the, on the ferries, I think, in the early 70s. And my uncle was a purser uh, on the Aurora for, I think, a couple decades. So it really is a good, it, it's a good career choice and pays well. And, and uh, you know, it's a really good opportunity, particularly for young people, I think, to start now with the great. So that's the ferry system. There's a, a lot of other things happening um, that I want to talk about. A lot of that has to do with the Biden administration, federal overreach and state rights. Um, we've got a combination now of a administration that is not pro-development or pro-resource development, at least in Alaska or America. Um, and then we have a lot of NGOs that are filing uh, petitions right now. There's a petition to list uh, walrus, there's a petition to list bumblebees as endangered species, uh, wolves, I think that's the fourth time we've tried that one, uh, starfish, flying squirrels, the Mexican humpback whale, uh, and we already have significant protections for sea otters, seals, and almost everything that eats king salmon is protected. Um, and so our response, the governor's response to these issues has been to request $4 million from the legislature to perform our own research and litigate if necessary to protect our statehood rights. Um, many folks might not know, but Alaska is, I think, one of the only states that has language in its statehood act that says we will be able to develop our resources. Um, and we're not being allowed to do that. I think. The Biden administration has already shut down ANWR, has shut down NPRA, uh, is refusing to release uh, millions of acres of federal land to the state for state selections or for Alaska Native veterans to select their allotments on. And so we're, we're going to push back on all these fronts and try to keep the ability for Alaskans to work. And one of the governors you know, issues that I hear frequently about is, you know, if the production isn't done in Alaska under the strictest standards in the world, it's going to be done somewhere else with no standards or very little standards. Uh, and that is an increase in pollution beyond what we would have had if we would just let Alaska work and produce resources. So uh, a lot of the focus is on the North Slope on oil and gas. Uh, we're working with a group called The Voice, which is 19 tribes and other in indigenous communities on the North Slope that believe that uh, oil and gas research can, uh, uh, development uh, and production can be done and should be done on the North Slope in a reasonable, in a reasonable way. Uh, and so we'll be uh, working with them. We are working with them to push back and point out to the Biden administration that it, you're not really winning when you attack the North Slope or its communities. You're just creating you know, more, you're shoving that demand or shifting that demand over to other countries like Kenya or Russia, which, you know, Russia's Yamal gas uh, field has 1300 flares right now. So they're burning off massive amounts of natural gas. And in Alaska, we have a statute that says you can't waste any oil or gas. So if you want to develop, Alaska is the place to do it. Um, so we're going to continue pushing back on that. We do have some funds from the legislature. Again, Senator Stedman was uh, significant help in getting those funds. Um, and I, I guess, you know, we're basically seeing the attack across all areas. So Timber, Secretary Vilsack you know, decreed that there would be no more logging in, in the Congress. And that's a threat to a bunch of Alaska families and businesses that have been at work for a long time. And again, we don't think they're looking at the whole picture because if you put Viking sawmill out of business on Prince of Wales, they're the major power uh, consumer on that island. And with them out of business, everyone else's power rates are going to go up. And the demand for those trees will shift to the probably DC or another location. And they'll just log more down there. So, uh, we're trying to work with the Biden administration. Frankly, we haven't got, I don't think, a single response uh, uh, from the White House. We've requested a meeting with President Biden multiple times and have not been able to achieve that meeting. So we're going to keep working on that. But, um, you know, that 
just a single job and resource development uh, can can make a huge difference. I worked my way through the coal mill, uh, and that's what paid for my college and, and allowed me to move forward with a career. So uh, the governor feels jobs are incredibly important, especially for our youth, and we need to keep fighting for that. So that's what's happening on the federal side. I do want to mention one thing that a lot of people may not understand is that when they list an endangered species in the coastal waters like a walrus or uh, that basically can federalize the entire fishery even if it's in state waters and what we saw happen with stellar sea lions out of ocean chain is the federal agency shut off state fishing uh, because they said there was not enough cod for the for the stellar sea lions to eat. and so people tend to come in last when these species are listed and there's also a lawsuit pending now against the state that is claiming the Magnuson Stevens Act gives the federal government the right to manage salmon fisheries in state waters. So we're pushing back against that. We don't think that would be helpful or good for anyone. Um, and if any city managers or other folks are interested, I can give you the case number for that lawsuit. You might want to look into it uh, or join it, consider joining it to push back on the uh, on that possibility, it's not been decided yet, but that possibility that the federal government uh, would take over uh, control of salmon fishing in state waters. So we're, we're being vigilant, we're watching everything, we're working with the uh, chiefs of staff of the congressional delegation at the federal level, and we'll be reaching out more and more out to the communities and, and trying to work with everyone to keep Alaska open for business. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you for that. Um, we'll have the president do a song here first because we will. Oh. Uh, so, uh, I know a couple weeks ago you were down in Texas County representing the governor at the NOAA uh, facility. Can you speak to that for a minute and some of the other significant roles that perhaps the, the military, the Coast Guard, and other people can play? Expanding the presence of federal infrastructure and, and uh, presence in, in along coastal Alaska. So we just did get the NOAA facility after 20 years of attempting to get built in Ketchikan. That project's going to go forward. Um, took a long time to get them there, but they're there. And so I think next year you'll see it move facility in Ketchikan to the Fairweather vessel, and that should bring uh, 30 to 40 jobs to Ketchikan, uh, which was, again, I mean, none of these things happen fast. Um, it's been a fight, uh, but finally, uh, you know, I think with the help of the senators and uh, former Commerce Secretary Ross and current secretary, uh, we're able to get that project over the top and, and get uh, NOAA, that NOAA boat there. It's in federal statute, it's supposed to have been there since 2001. So we're glad they're there. We wish things didn't take so long. Um, and we're also looking at other opportunities to expand the Coast Guard bases, uh, military housing for the bases. Uh, and we do have a Navy submarine. Uh, it's not really a base, I don't think it's a sound sound facility, testing facility at Back Island down in Ketchikan, but um, we think there's a lot of opportunity to try to grow the military uh, uh, presence, Coast Guard, NOAA, uh, and have them become a part of uh, the economy in Southeast Alaska and along coastal Alaska. So we'll continue working with the delegation. We have some ideas there. Uh, and we'll see what we can get, get moving on that. And since uh, we don't have President Peterson, we do have time for a couple of questions. So, sure. if, you don't, if you don't mind, is there a question or two for Warren? You're going to let him off the hook easy since he's going to be here for two, two days. Yeah. Or so, here you go. Motion one. So, thanks. And thanks very much for your presentation. I wonder if you could elaborate just a little bit on uh, Cascade Point moving forward soon, what that kind of means. Sure. So uh, Cascade Point is uh, several miles up the canal from Juneau. Uh, Gold Belt Heath owns a stretch of uh, property there that they're 
interested in having a, a, a at least a part of the year ferry terminal on. Uh, we do not view Cascade Point as a substitute for general access. Uh, and we will, we're going to continue trying to do that project forward as well. Well, I guess so that's all this this morning. Oh, we got we got questions over here. Thank you. Uh, I just wondering if um, the federal funds that, that, that the governor's office plan is to use the uh, the Buy America program when building the various paper parts. Of that. Sure, I think the, the Buy America program is in the statute, so we have to comply with that or get a waiver, which I believe is pretty hard to do. So we'll be, you know, we'll be following whatever the rules are to get it built. I was at the shipyard last week in Ketchikan, and, and we have two shipyards, another one in Seward, and I'm really hoping that they can fit, come in and be the ones that build those main boats in Alaska. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ferraro, and thank you to the governor's office for uh, uh, being uh, such an active participant with Southeast Conference and. Uh, and the work that we're trying to do for Southeast. Uh, I saw a, an interesting photo today that uh, was kind of a representation of Alaska and had a series of, of states overlaid over Alaska. And the one that really struck me is the state of Florida is roughly the size of Southeast Alaska. So, uh, which I thought was, uh, I had never seen that. I'd seen Texas broken up into a, you know, a couple of sides, but I hadn't seen it. So basically, we're working with a, you know, a state the size of Florida, and uh, we're just in it. Um, and it's, it's pretty remarkable to see this group of people come together and uh, uh, over such a uh, terrific distance. Um, so you know, and part of what we uh, what we do every year at the annual meeting is we talk about uh, the Southeast Alaska by the numbers. And uh, we do a regular update as to uh, uh, what our economic activity is, what our economic uh, projections are. And none of this could occur without the incredible talents of uh, uh, Meilani. And uh, so if, uh, I'd like to welcome Meilani to give us her, her Southeast Alaska by the numbers for 2021. Meilani. So thank you so much for having me. It, you know, my first um, Southeast Conference in Haines was 18 years ago. I was six weeks pregnant. I was putting on the whole event. I organized all the food. I couldn't eat any of it somehow. Um, and I was going immediately from the conference to run the Klondike. And <laughs> at that time, that, that seemed like a crazy Southeast Conference Haines event. But this, you know, we, we've, got, we've got masks. My, my lipstick is all over my mask. I, you know, so we're, we're figuring out how to even be more crazy this year. And it's fun because, um, you know, when I look back at 18 years ago, my first name, Southeast Conference, there's a lot of people in this room that were in that room. So I see Rosemary Hagedig, Mary Becker, um, Jimmy Clark, uh, of course, Robert Benvolz and um, Dave Kensinger. So it's it's fun to see, like, over time, have all these um, same people coming back and back to me and Southeast Conference. Um, so... As Mark said, this is this is something that we do on an annual basis. We like to get you caught up, um, Southeast Conference likes to get you caught up on just the, the data, the numbers. And usually we take the, um, and, and I will be talking about the, the, the year 2020, the calendar year in review, but what I really thought we'd do is start by, um, figuring out if this works. Am I pointing this in the right spot? Okay, so clicker. All right, I think we'll just, I'll just ask if we have you click through the class. So um, 
what we're going to do is just start talking about the pandemic economy. So, it, you know, that the pandemic wasn't really polite. It didn't follow the calendar year. So what I really want to talk about just for the next couple of minutes is April 2020, when the, the pandemic really hit our economy hard to July 2021, which is what we have the data for. And when if we just look at that 16 month period, we see that in Southeast Alaska altogether, we are down by 15% of all of our jobs. We've lost nearly 6,000 jobs during that time. And as we know, what's been hit the hardest is our transportation sector, which includes a lot of scenic and sightseeing transportation, leisure and hospitality, our retail sector, our information sector, professional services, and our fishing sector. So that's that 16 months in a nutshell. Next slide. And this is looking month to month and what I'm doing here in the, for the first 16 months of the pandemic, I'm comparing it back to the same month in the non-pandemic. And what you see is that we were hit really, really hard in June, July of 2020. We were down by almost 25%, almost a quarter of all jobs, 24% of all jobs were just gone in June, which is crazy. We were then down 10,000 jobs in July of 2020, which, you know, I, I get upset when we're down like a couple hundred jobs and we're down by 10,000 jobs. Um, we saw that we sort of built back up employment through November to March, um, down seven or eight percent. But when we get got back into those summer months in Southeast Alaska, sometimes we call it the working months, um, we, we saw that that um, employment decline again. So the um, next slide I want to talk about is just to get a sense of how Southeast Alaska has been impacted compared to the other regions in Alaska, compared to Alaska, compared to the rest of the United States as a whole. If we look at the United States as a whole and compare numbers of July of 2021 back to July of 2019, the United States is, is actually 3% below employment of where it was two years ago, which is um, you know, getting back there. And um, Alaska as a whole is down by 10%. Southeast as Alaska as a whole is down by 17%. So, you just really see that we've been hit harder than the state or nation. Um, Northern Alaska is down by 18%, but they, they were doing better than us earlier and they have a smaller economy, but it's just, I just wanted to put it in perspective. Next slide. So I wanted to start with the good news about 2020. There was, let's talk about the good indicators because we had a couple of good indicators. And the first one I want to talk about is construction. And so you see me come up here every year and say, well, construction's down again. And um, so actually, next slide, the um, construction sector, I can report was, um, employment was up for the first time in seven years. So not only was it up, it was a surprise um, change, change um, in terms of employment being up. Jobs were up by 2%, wages were up by 2%. And you can see some of my, my pictures on the bottom, a lot of that had to do with building up um, infrastructure for the visitor industry. So you see the gondolas in Huna, um, the Ward Cove dock and facility, the Sitka cruise ship dock and the archipelago project in Juneau. We also had a lot of federal construction dollars in the region. I think the Juneau airport is a good example of that. Um, moving forward on construction, it could be really exciting because we're, we're hoping that <laughs> infrastructure bill passes and if it does, it's gonna be really, really good for Alaska, not only it's, it's going to bring $5 billion potentially into Alaska, and, and right now um, we, we just seem to have really great Senate representation. <laughs> um, and we're looking at getting the, the highest economic or the highest per capita spending um, for Alaska than any other state. So this would really help us build upon that, that construction sector. And I think we're going to have Garrett, John, and Mills later talk about what the infrastructure bill would mean for Alaska and Southeast Alaska. The next spot in which we had positive indicators was actually our federal government. So again, it's something that I've often said was down. Federal government, employment and wages were up in 2020. Jobs were up by 2%, wages up by 1%. And this is really because it was a US census year. So these are not jobs and wages that we're going to be able to build on and keep. But it was really nice to have the, those extra jobs and wages in 2020 when we when we really needed them. Another um, really positive was the federal money that came to Southeast Alaska, um, the CARES money, the, the, the COVID relief funds. We got more than a half billion dollars um, of aid into Southeast Alaska. And let me tell you, we really, we really needed that aid. It, it was just really 
of critical importance to our businesses and our communities and our institutions. Um, next slide. We, we did a survey in April of 2021 of our, of our business leaders. We asked 440 business leaders what the federal aid that, that they received meant to them. And 45% said that it was critical in helping them keep employees that they would have either had to fire or furlough. And nearly 29% said they would have closed permanently without receiving that federal aid. So it, it's just, it means that we have economy to come back to. So it's just, it was um, a really important economic tool when we really needed it. And since I talked about the US Census, I'll, I'll put that in here too, and, and I'm calling it good news. So if we look at 2010 and compare that to 2020, our population is up. We are up by 1% by 622 people. Um, and one really interesting thing, fun thing, is that we have uh, 1,100 more Alaska Natives in Southeast Alaska than we had 10 years ago. And I know what you're thinking, like a lot of blankets must have come from Wisconsin and the Netherlands and like other places in the world. But <laughs> no, we didn't have a big immigration of blankets from all over the world. Um, we just did a, a much better job at counting. Um, a lot of institutions, uh, Alaska Native groups worked really hard on making sure the census counters connected with people in our rural communities and they did a really good job at that. So now more than a quarter of our population in Southeast Alaska is Alaska Native, 26%. And so I think that's a really, really um, tremendous number. So I wanted to spend a, a couple more slides, one more slide on the, the 2020 census and just look at what was lost and what was gained. And so we see the, the communities that lost the most in terms of population is number one, Angoon, number two, Haynes, number three, Craig, and number four, Wrangell. And um, it was really quite a surprise to us the, the population loss in Haynes and Wrangell. We had counted those communities much higher. And so um, each of those were down by uh, about 400 people, more than we were expecting them to be down by. So that was kind of a surprise for all of us across the board. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, the community of East Davis was up by 48%. Skagway was up by 28% and Huona was up by 23%. And I do want to point out, since I'm saying the population is up, that we're actually in a six year population decline. So if we don't start at 2020, but we start at 2014, um, we see that our, our population has been trending downwards, but we was a little bit less in this last year. Another thing that we've been tracking in 2020 and 2021 is school enrollment. So if we look at all K through 12 enrollment in 2020, it was down by 6% and it was, and I think we, we were able to not have more losses than that because we had school districts in Southeast Alaska that were already online before the pandemic started. And so people were able to shift to those. The two school districts where we saw the biggest losses was Juno, which lost 12% of its student population and Wrangell, which lost 41% of all students didn't, didn't sign up for school last year. Um, I did check in with both of those school districts right before this presentation. They both got about half of those kids back, which makes sense because about half of their kids are, have the vaccine. So it's good to see those numbers turning back up. Okay, and, and now the bad news. <laughs> um, so first of all, jobs. Um, jobs as a whole, if we just look at 2020, we're down by six thousand jobs that just the, the, I, I, I'm having trouble even counting that high it's, it's really um these are really big numbers so this again was just 2020 jobs total jobs in 2020 were down by 13 percent and this is even considering that the first um three months um April or January February March of 2020 were really good months for Southeast Alaska wages were down by eight percent so wages actually weren't down as much as jobs were so I'll, I'll call that a win just because. Um, but we did lose, uh, Southeast Alaskans were paid $190 million less in 2020 than they were in 2019. When we look at the communities that were hit the hardest, um, sorry, Caitlin, Skagway <laughs> just really, really was hurt hard. Um, Skagway lost 48% of all jobs in 2020, which is just devastating. Um, followed by Haynes, um, Cleflon, Huna, and 
Ketchikan ended up losing the most jobs, even though it was a slightly lower percentage just because it's a larger economy. Um, we do have good news on this slide. I, I don't know if anyone's from Yakutat today, but Yakutat actually increased the total jobs in 2020, which is which was um, the culmination of many years of effort to increase population and workforce there. So there was, we took really three major hits to our economy in this, in this last uh, period. And the first, of course, was tourism. So tourism jobs were down about half and wages were down about half. Um, we, passenger arrivals into Southeast Alaska were down by 89%. And this includes air, cruise, ferry, passengers, includes residents, includes everyone coming into the region. And um, we had 1.6 million fewer people arrive at our terminal than, than we were expecting. Um, if we look, we do see growth though. I mean, we are coming back. So if we look at air, air passenger statistics for 2021, we're 80% higher than we were at this time last year, but we're still 25% lower than we were um, two years ago. So we're, we're coming back, we're just coming back slowly. And of course, um, we, we need to talk about what's happened with the cruise ship. So in 2019, we had 1.33 million cruise passengers come to Southeast Alaska. Mm -hmm. In 2020, we had 48. <laughs> And these were on our two smallest cruise ships. We had a, 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 a um, Uncruise and Al Marine both sent out very tiny cruises. And, and we ended up with 48 passengers altogether across our entire cruise industry. This year, fortunately, we, we've had the, um, through, through hard work and determination of many people and many people in this room, we were able to get about 10% of our cruise season back. We're operating now and in, through October, we'll have a later season than we've ever had. And next year we're looking, if ships are at full capacity, we're looking at 1.57 million cruise ship passengers coming to Southeast Alaska. Um, we don't know exactly what the, how many people will be on those ships, but, but right now we're gearing up for 1.57 million. And I think part of the challenge here will be making sure our communities have the capacity to provide services for those passengers, to provide food, to provide um, trips, and make sure those passengers are able to leave their money in Southeast Alaska communities, which is what we really want. And we're going to have, of course, Wendy and Julian here soon, later today, to, to talk, to tell you a lot more about what's going on with the cruise ship sector. So just in terms of um, what we're expecting right now for our top three ports in Southeast Alaska, in Juneau, we're looking at 1.57 million passengers. <clears throat> In Ketchikan, 1.4 million passengers, and in Skagway, 1.2 million passengers. So that this is what we're we have our fingers crossed for, and we'll see what happens. So the next, I told you there were three major hits to our economy last year. The first was tourism. The second was our seafood sector. We ended up having a just tremendously difficult, um, low seafood catch in 2020 which was sort of decoupled from the pandemic, which just made the timing really, really terrible for us. We were down a hundred million pounds of seafood than we had been in 2019 and 2019 had not been a really great year. So we were down by 48% of the catch. And when we compare it to other years, so the, the red um, circle, is the value of the catch in millions and the blue bar is the volume of the catch in millions of pounds. Um, and you can sort of compare it um, to other years, you can sort of see how, how far it is down. And then in the next slide, I, I took the species total, one more slide, and compared it to the 10 year average. So total pounds, at, comparing to the 10 year average total pounds um, of volume of seafood caught in Southeast Alaska last year was down by 63%. The total inflation adjusted value was down by 55%. Our, our pink salmon was down 78%, sockeye 63%, chung 60%, herring down 93%. Crab was up significantly and, and black cod was, was up by a slight percentage. I do have good news when it comes to the seafood sector. Um, then the numbers this year, were, our fishermen are still out there, they're still catching fish, but the numbers this year are up tremendously. So sockeye is up 128% so far. Pink, we're actually not comparing it to last year, we're comparing it to two years ago because we're on that two year 
life cycle of, of pink salmon, but it's up from 114% from 2019. Coho is up 49% and Chum is up 39%. And I, I just forgot to mention earlier, so we have the double whammy of, of the low volume, but that wasn't related to the pandemic. And then we have the, the hit of the value of, the, of our seafood products, um, which was pandemic related. We thought restaurants closed nationally, globally, which really reduced the demand for high quality, wild Alaska seafood product. And so we had our fishermen out there working the hardest they'd ever worked to, to get low volume and then really low prices for that fish. And so the prices this year are also up. So we're seeing, we're just really seeing a lot of good movement in our seafood sector. So for, so um, the government picture I chose this year, um, three of these five people are actually sitting in this room. So we got the Juno Assembly. We've got a lot of Juno Assembly here today. So this was my, my photo for government. Um, government as a whole was down by 4%, but wages were actually flat and even up slightly um, over the pandemic year. So I told you we have our three hits and our, our third hit is just that, that ongoing fiscal crisis. We are near eight of the Alaska fiscal crisis. Um, we have been spending our savings. We're, we've spent $19 billion in savings from our Alaska savings account in the last eight years. And we've also been cutting our way out um, in terms of job cuts. And Southeast Alaska has been hit harder than anywhere else on, on those job cuts. So if you look at the job cuts to the state jobs in Southeast Alaska, over the last eight years, we've lost 20% of all state jobs. If we look at the rest of Alaska, the rest of Alaska has lost 12.5% of all state jobs, which is still a really big number. It's still double digit, but is, is significantly lower. And so it's just been, um, obviously the state has been our largest uh, sector wage provider in our economy. So that's that's been uh, very difficult. And in, we haven't just had cuts to state jobs, we've had cuts to regional state services. And the, the best case in point is obviously the ferry system. In the last five years, this isn't fair because this includes the, the 2020 pandemic year. So we're hoping those numbers go up in 2021 and 2022. But in the last five years, we've lost 85, 83% of all um, passenger services in terms of people riding on the ferries in Southeast Alaska. So that's a number we're hoping to come back. Um, our timber sector, we in, in 2020, timber jobs were down by 14%, wages were down by 10%. Randy Gerard would be, the, I think, a really good interview talking about some of what's been going on in the, the timber sector. Um, timber's been really interesting lately. In October 2020, the U.S. Department of Agriculture um, instated, reinstated the Alaska roadless rule exemption, and by July 2021, the U.S. Department of Agriculture um, reversed their decision on the on restoring the and and restored the 2001 roadless rule. Um, so, Jim Clark can tell you a lot about that. <laughs> um, and then also in 2021, Sea Alaska, which has been a mainstay, real powerhouse in the timber industry in Southeast Alaska for 42 years announced that they were transitioning away from logging and to focus on ocean-based food and tourism opportunities. And I believe Anthony Malat is the next speaker, so he's going to be able to tell you a lot more about that. And so it's been, there's been a lot of really interesting developments on that front. Mining has been good. Um, total mining wages were up by 9% in 2020. If you look at jobs as a whole, technically they were down, but that's really had to do with um, pandemic mitigation measures that was month on, month off. And, and so mining employment really has been stable. Our number one healthcare, our number one economic sector in 2020 was really healthcare. Um, it, it ended up being critically important. Jobs were down by 4%, but wages were up. And wages up, it seems like a good thing, except that the fact is there's not enough healthcare workers nationally in Alaska or in our region. So the wages are continuing to go up so that we're able to attract and retain healthcare workers in Southeast Alaska. And so it's, um, I think we're gonna continue to see increasing wages as we have a lack of, of healthcare workers nationally to, to fill those needed slots. One thing that we've seen um, across the region is 
infrastructure development related to healthcare. So we see the Juno, um, the, the enormous Juno project going up in the first picture. We, we see a um, search development that's, going, that's being planned in SICTA um, for a major state of the art hospital there. So the Wrangell Hospital search just built and a new, a new dental clinic in Petersburg. So we're seeing a lot of really significant infrastructure investments in healthcare. And this is the slide I usually show that the, let's talk about the whole Southeast economy, but I want you to focus on the, the earnings. Um, you know, when we look at what our number one private sector wage provider is in Alaska, in Southeast Alaska, it used to be timber, it moved into seafood, then it became tourism. And this year it is healthcare. Healthcare was our number one private sector wage provider. And that is even with the fact that so many of Southeast Alaska's healthcare jobs are public, even, even though, even if we don't count those, it was still our number one wage provider. And so becoming a bigger and bigger part of our economy. Um, I mentioned earlier that we do a survey with all of our business leaders across the region. We surveyed 444, 440, and asked what they what they thought the um, the outlook was. And so this was in April. Half were positive, half were somewhat negative. I always find it really interesting to break it out into um, communities and businesses. So if you look at the community that has the most pessimistic outlook moving forward at Skagway, followed by Haynes, Huna, Ketchikan, and Wrangell. And the communities that have the most positive, um, optimistic outlook moving forward included Prince of Wales, Sitka, Petersburg, and Gustavus. When we break it out into businesses, when we look at the business sector, our most pessimistic sector is actually real estate as more people are working from home and, and moving out of um, office space. The food and beverage services as people are less likely to go to bars and restaurants, our tourism sector and our art sector. And the um, sectors that were the most optimistic moving forward included our mining sector, our nonprofit sector, our healthcare sector, and the construction sector. So really the question is, I feel like, like maybe I've depressed you a lot at this point. So <laughs> the point is, are we, is it getting better? And the, the, the answer is emphatically yes, we are digging ourselves out of the 2020 economy. Um, don't look at January, February, March, because those were good months in 2020. But if we look at April, May, June, July, and 2021, and compare them to 2020, we're up by about 2,500 jobs a month, um, seven to nine percent um, in terms of employment coming back. So we are, we are slowly but surely coming back. And as we come back, um, I wanted to point out that Southeast Alaska has just finished its five-year 2025 economic plan. There's um, plans on the table over there. You can grab one. There's a lot of federal grant opportunities right now. And as you're writing, going back to your community or your organization and you're writing that federal grant, you use this document. It's going to help you leverage um, the work that was done here and hopefully um, help, help you get that grant. This was a um, document that we spent more than a year working on. We, we worked with 400 Southwest Conference members to, to put it all together. Next slide. Here are the top 50 economic initiatives that have been prioritized. You can't read them, but Jessica and, and team so nicely handed out Southwest by the Numbers. So you've got this list in Southwest by the Numbers. You have it in the sets. I, I, do, I am gonna quickly go over the top four economic initiatives that, that Southeast Conference has prioritized. So number one is to sustain and support the Alaska Marine Highway System. Number two is mariculture development. Number three is market Southeast Alaska to attract more visitor spending and visitor opportunities. And number four is to promote beneficial electrification. And so the, the key economic indicator that I keep putting, I keep ending all my presentations with is the vaccination rate across um, Southeast Alaska. And one of the benefits of having your population cut so much in Haines is that suddenly you are the most vaccinated community in all of Southeast Alaska when we change that number on the bottom. <laughs> so now 75% of all Haines residents have been fully vaccinated. Across all of Southeast Alaska, it's 63%. Um, and in Alaska, we're just still below that 50% threshold. 
And that is what I have. Oh, there's these documents. They are um, on the desk over there. Feel free to grab as many as you want. We don't want to bring any home with us. Give it to your, your assembly, your committees, your boards, your community members. Feel free to pass these out. This document is also online. You can access it electronically. And I will be here if you have any questions. So thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Vanwani. This the annual meeting and rollout of Southeast Wider Numbers is one of the most anticipated uh, releases that we have. Uh, besides the five year session plan that just went forward. And so, you know, one of the exciting things is just how Southeast Conference and the region is able to take these in, this information and build on that. And you're going to see throughout the, the next day and a half all the different initiatives that fall right into. What we're doing is picking those four top priorities. So, without any further ado, we'll keep rolling through our agenda. Um, one thing I want to note is that you see the QR codes throughout the building. Uh, that is the electronic code to be able to get the bios. And we want to, we just spent a lot of time just talking about how accomplished these speakers are. And we are going to not take time from the presentations to do that. So, if you want to know more about the speakers, you can get all that. We have an electronic uh, bio list for you on that. Um, so next up is Anthony Malott, who, where is, where are you, where, is, where are you? There he is, he's coming in the wings. Again, one of those next generation, uh, you know, leaders that has done amazing work. And the thing that I really so appreciate about Anthony is that, you know, success aside, we incorporate. He could talk for, for hours and hours on what the corporation is doing. But in the midst of all those, he's always his part is in the community. And every single time that we have a conversation, it's about how we don't have success unless that success trickles down to our communities and our villages. And so I just so appreciate his heart and the fact that he's able to uh, be here with us again today. So without any further ado, please welcome Mr. Anthony Malak. Jeez, very nice to be here. Um, I come here and I kind of bring almost the same presentation every year, uh, but there's enough new faces and we want to continue to repeat our story. I hope uh, those that have heard it before, I hope I add something new and those that don't know Sea Alaska, maybe are new to Southeast, maybe new to Alaska, learn a little bit more. So my name is Anthony Malott. I uh, grew up in Yakutat. Nice to see Yakutat's population grow. Uh, a lot of it is attributed to a very successful tribe there, uh, a seafood plant that is doing all it can to support uh, that community, um, and a sport fishing uh, industry that is uh, propping up bed and breakfasts and lodges up there. So it's nice to see how everything comes together to support a community, but that's not all the cases, as Robert said, across our community. So uh, we work wherever we need to do the best work to support our communities. And so Sea Alaska represents 23,000 Tlingit, Haida, and Simshian shareholders. We are the regional Alaska Native Corp uh, in Southeast Alaska. We have 13 village corp partners across Southeast. And there are 19 federally recognized tribes that are all our partners throughout Southeast. And I would really, really like to have listened to Richard Peterson, Clinton and Haida and our tribes in Southeast are, are doing fantastic. They are really making a difference in our communities in a way that they never have. And to hear their story and all the great things they're doing is something that I think is, is very important to Southeast, but I'll, I'll hit on, on some of it. And it, we see Alaska connects into almost every industry in Southeast and I'll get into that. But I, I start kind of with, with what 
um, we believe is a pretty powerful story and it connects into our focus on ocean health. So when, when we see this doc, quick uh, Klingit lesson for, for any, if you, if you ever see a Klingit word spelled out and it has an underline, so there's underline G, underline X, underline K, it's guttural. And so a guttural G, you have to hold your throat here and go, God, you can try it. You'll, you'll get a sore throat, but this is God. It's one of the most uh, spiritually connected food sources. And to us, we see this, we see our way of life. Uh, Hakusti eats the tea. So herring eggs almost describes our way of life, the respect we have for that food, how we gather it, how we share it across all of our communities, and how right now we are extremely scared of maintaining that connection. So if we have healthy oceans, if we had the best data and science and we had the best management structure, we would not have to worry about this. We would not have to worry about our way of life. But our herring eggs need us to address climate change. Our herring eggs need us to have better data and monitoring of our ocean environment. And our herring eggs need improved management. And improved management means a recognition of all the multiple uses that we know that are out there, but one that appropriately recognizes the user group that is the subsistence traditional harvester. Again, subsistence is a word that we're trying to get away from, and instead we're using the term our way of life, because it's more than just filling our freezers. It's how we've been taught. It's how we've been, how we've uh, ingrained in us from our grandparents and our uncles and aunties, the history of living in a place for 10,000 years. It's, it's all here. And when I explain how do you put a subsistence user at the table within the fisheries management circles, I think once we're ready for that, we'll, we'll, we'll be there side by side with you. But I go back to why Anxa Corps are in existence. It was a land claim battle, a land claim mission. Uh, and I thank our AMB, ANS uh, brethren who really, really created that, that land claims effort all the way back to the early 1900s. But an unknown little feature of Anxa right as they were giving us the land and capitalizing us, they also said, you are now foregoing all of your commercial rights to your traditional fishing and harvesting. Not your right to, to go do the traditional harvesting, but you can't make commercial claims, kind of like the Bolt decision in Washington. And the only reason that we accepted that deal is because of, at the same time, they said they, the state, the federal government, um, we will prioritize your traditional way of life, subsistence harvest within our management structures. And 50 years later, this is the 50 year anniversary of ANSA, we have not achieved that. The state has constitution issues. The federal government does not have full management authority, and we're stuck in the middle. But the whole concept of uh, post-traumatic traumatic growth is a fantastic place to start from. What I hope is not a downer of a story, because this is this is this makes us get through the winter to know that we have herring eggs in the spring. So that sense of a springhood, this sense that we have trauma, that we can take that trauma and, and have that concept of post-traumatic growth. And now we have partners that are, are ready to support our communities and our people and the population growth that we saw of Alaska Native people in Southeast. It's a fantastic moment. And now I'm gonna jump into what is the Sea Alaska story after that grounding 
Uh, sea Alaska comes from the land. Uh, ha Ani is our homeland. That's why Sea Alaska is in, is in existence. Our people have lived here for 10,000 years. Uh, that indigenous right to this to our homeland is, is why we are here, and that is why we will always be land managers. We may have gotten out of the logging industry, but we're still the largest private landowner in Southeast Alaska, 365,000 acres, uh, over 600,000 acres when you include our village for partners. We're getting out of the old growth logging industry. We support the young growth transition. We work with industry, uh, the Forest Service, others to continue the transition that is necessary for young growth. So it's not a complete getting out of logging for us. I first started coming to Southeast Conference when I took over as CEO in 2014. And we had we just simply had a concept. If if we follow our traditional values and let the traditional values that have sustained our people for 10,000 years lead Sea Alaska, we we believe that those values will give us the same attributes and success that they gave our clans and our people. Resiliency, adaptability, growth mindset, the ability to perpetuate our success to future generations. And so we had just lost $55 million, so let's give it a shot. What else do we have to lose? Uh, I, I joke a little bit because Sea Alaska has always used our traditional values, but we, we dove in and dedicated ourselves to translating our traditional values when back in 2014 or in other years where I presented to Southeast Conference, I, I gave, I walked through what Haani means, the value of our land, but the systems thinking that comes from being so ingrained and connected into an environmental system, which uh, which is just balance, I think a search for balance describes a lot of a lot of the efforts that that is going on in Southeast Alaska. Uh, we describe how seeing our strength and how we go back to our strength, and, and that strength gives us responsibility to train and educate our people and continually look to improve our communities, our education, and the career success of our people. And Hashuka, which gives us that that forever responsibility to continue to perpetuate this, so we give and provide to our future generations. We've continued to translate that this, and I've created a set of uh, workplace behaviors that that are effectively sub values. They fall out of those core values that I just described. But simply put. When we're working together towards a significant vision like ocean health or the educational and career success of our people or the health and wellness within our communities, and we're applying curiosity and we're bringing truth and honesty and data and having the hard conversations that need to, to be had. And we are making sure that everybody is focused and driven to achieving that vision, then we start making incremental progress towards that vision. We put visions out there that are not going to be achieved in five years, maybe not in 10 years. And we're fine with that. We are fine with creating that incremental progress. And in 2014, we had 110 million in revenue. This year, we're gonna have close to a billion in revenue. Revenue is not, the financial picture we look at, we've had uh, operating income improve in every single one of those years as well. It gives us the sense and the confidence that, that this is working and we want more of this. And the, the key is the working together. And to stand up here and, and think that Sea Alaska is going to provide everything we want for our communities is we, we, we don't even have close to the resources to provide everything we want for our communities. We need our tribes. We need our state government. We need our federal government. We need our municipalities. And we need industry.
industry to achieve what we are looking for for our communities. And so working together is going to feed through almost everything I hope you see from, from Sea Alaska. A, a quick snapshot of, of the billion in revenue that we have, we are focused on working with the land, food, and water. Uh, land is obvious, we are land managers. Uh, we are getting out of logging, but we still manage environmental programs on our lands. And we manage a, a bunch of community and cultural use priorities that our community members, our shareholders, our tribal people prioritize access for uh, traditional hunting and gathering and harvesting of cultural wood or carving totem logs, canoes. Uh, that is still happening. And we are still regrowing in 42 years of logging that Leilani pointed out. We have regrown every single acre. We've planted over a million trees. Uh, we do healthy forest treatments called silviculture, where we do uh, silviculture treatments not only for the regrowth of the forest, but also for uh, improved habitat as well. So all of that is happening on the land side. Food, we are focused in the seafood industry. Seven years ago, when we were less operationally successful, uh, we knew that Sea Alaska needed to be in businesses that mattered to their people and tied to their homelands. And so I, we, at that point in time, couldn't think of a, a, a better industry than seafood that ties to what we care about and their homelands. Um, there's kind of a, both the lessons learned and the fact that we believe seafood is an industry that we can invest in for, for decades. Uh, the lessons learned is for Alaska Native Corps, you know, for-profit business structures are not the best, you know, mix with the social, the social structure we have as, as clans and people. And so you have to you have to make sure that there's not a conflict within operating a for-profit corporation and still maintaining your nativeness. And so when we think of the businesses that Sea Alaska has not operated well, we kind of haven't cared about those businesses. They've been somewhere out in the lower 48 that, that we're just supposed to be an investment that was gonna make us money, and then we can invest that money back into our communities. That, that doesn't work. And, and I think many Alaska Native folks have proven that. And so being able to be in businesses that matter to our people is probably the biggest risk management uh, you know, initiative that we have. So we will always care about being land managers. We will always care about our food and we will all, always care about ocean health and the water environment that surrounds us, not only for our way of life, but for the opportunities in business that it provides us. I mentioned uh, land management, the support for second growth. Uh, I'll hit the USDA decision really quickly. It was nice to hear of the philosophy and the initiative to create this sustainable transition. Uh, but the fact that you think $25 million could make that much of a difference when you effectively just took it away an industry that was providing 25 million in annual income and 300 jobs in the region, and more importantly, jobs in our rural communities where Robert said that every single job is critically important. The USDA knows that 25 million is not the answer uh, and they want to work with Southeast people. They wanna work with government. They wanna work with tribes. They wanna work with Sea Alaska. We're having those conversations with uh, many policymakers right now. First and foremost, 25 million is not enough. Uh, the USDA by itself is not enough. We need the Department of Commerce. We need NOAA. Uh, we need the Park Service. And you know, we need other agencies side by side USDA to really achieve what is exciting for our communities 
one of the things that is exciting coming out of the Biden administration for our communities is if the executive order that declares for all the programs that the federal government is putting out there, we are looking for inclusive growth, social justice, a focus on tribal communities, and the need to address climate change. And you cannot have four priorities that pinpoint or point to our traditional communities more than those four priorities. If you go to Angoon, they are the definition of missing out on economic opportunity. They require a very keen focus on what inclusive growth looks like for Angoon, for Cake, for many of our other communities who have missed out, who have 25 years of losing access to commercial fisheries. Angoon went from 104 commercial fishing uh, limited entry permit holders to two. They went from close to a million in Halibut IFQ uh, to zero. And you think of a rural Alaska community, why wouldn't they be commercial fishing? I don't know all the answers. Uh, we want to find out and we want to work with people who are serious about that concept of inclusive growth to, to support communities like Angoon, Cape, Tlaloc, Heidelberg uh, that have lost so much access to commercial fisheries and also haven't tied into what is the success of our visitor industry and tourism. And now we're losing extractive industries. So again, a really tough equation, but I think the concept of post-traumatic growth the concept of working together, all the federal dollars, all the programs that are coming in. And if we can all just repeat those mantras, inclusive growth, focus on social justice, tribal communities, and the need to address climate change, we will all kind of be on that post-traumatic growth journey with our rural communities. And I, I wanna point out, because I think we all recognize this, if our rural communities are healthy, Juno's healthy. If our rural communities are healthy, Ketchikan's healthy, Sitka's healthy, healthy, Randall, Petersburg, Juno knows it and feels it from the success of Huna. And Huna is such, such a great example of a community that has a high capacity village corp, a high capacity tribe. They're working together. We have the Huna Native Forest Partnership where the state and the Forest Service are working with Sea Alaska, with HIA, again, with Huna Totem. We are addressing you know, stream restoration in the community. We're pinpointing how they can continue their way of life while also tapping into you know, economic opportunity. And you see their population growth. And I think Juno feels that economic boom that is a successful Huna. So let's make Angoon successful. Let's make Cape successful, Heidelberg, Co-op, again, those communities that that need that additional help and focus. So all of Southeast benefits. We, we strongly, strongly believe that. What do we, what do, we do with our money? Um, see Alaska, the, every dollar we ever make goes back to our shareholders. And our shareholders' top priority are not dividends, education, culture, language, many, many different priorities. So we put together structures that mainly investment structures that, that endow uh, benefit far into the future for our people. We have a $20 million scholarship endowment. We provide over a million in scholarships in 2020. Extremely happy to see 500 of our Tlingit Haida and Simshian students going to school, uh, being supported by a Alaska scholarship. Those are the people that are on that path, on that path to post-traumatic growth. Uh, memorial funds, stood up a $10 million language revitalization. I think there are 60 Tlingit birth speakers left, uh, two Haida birth speakers left, and one Sitchian birth speaker left in Southeast Alaska. 
high dining since you and have more bird speakers on the Canadian side, but we want to support them having more connection to to the speakers on the Canadian side, and we want to support all of our language learners uh, on their own journey because our, our language can be critically important to our own education, uh, our own pride, and the ability to describe again uh, the 10,000 years of history we have in this place. So partnerships, community investments, and the focus on education and career successes is what we do with the income we, we create from our businesses. Right now, our tribes are our greatest partners. They have, they have more resources now than they may have ever had in, in their history. And we want to work side by side then, thanks to the federal government. They have tremendous resources right now that can be a once in a lifetime opportunity to make a difference for our communities. Uh, and we are working first and foremost on broad broadband Clinton and Haida, with their capacity, have taken the right steps to bring in tremendous broadband expertise. Broadband leads to better education in our villages. Broadband leads to better health outcomes in our community. Our ability to work together. Working on social infrastructure, working on uh, economic infrastructure within our communities. Uh, our tribes have that capacity to do all of the above with the not only the ARP funding they have right now, but also the, the breadth of federal programs that is the infrastructure bill and uh, the reconciliation bill that, that will be coming, I hope. Uh, community investments. We have made a small investment in Barnica Seafoods. It, it's it, to us, it, it's a philosophical investment. We love the people, they're entrepreneurial, they're focused, they are committed to Southeast. And it's a nod to what the mariculture aquaculture industry could be to Southeast Alaska. Uh, we, we want to learn that industry from being within the industry and being invested in Barnacle Seafoods allows that opportunity for us. Uh, looking for similar opportunities in tourism, learn the industry by being within the industry. Um, our partnerships, Sustainable Southeast Partnership, they are not on the agenda, so I was supposed to cover all sorts of things, all things Spruce Fruit, all things SSP. Uh, instead, I will just ask you, check out their websites. They are, they're fantastic websites, they've been updated. Uh, it's hard to describe what is the SSP. Uh, except that it, in my mind, it's a breath of fresh air in Southeast Alaska. Southeast Conference sees it, Robert sees it. He's, he's one of the greatest partners we have. And to have the SSP count Robert and Southeast Conference as a, as a partner uh, is one of the reasons we are extremely committed to the success of the Sustainable Southeast Partnership. Uh, Spruce Root, doing economic uh, entrepreneurial fostering of, of small business success in Southeast Alaska. Fully behind that, all things SHI. SHI is just doing amazing things in education. Um, you know, really refocusing the success of our native students. They have a reading program that in five years has closed a tremendous gap between third grade reading levels between native students and non-native students. They've almost eliminated a uh, a performance gap that is one of the keystone gaps in creating that educational success for our native students. Uh, and they're not done, they're going to keep working on that. And so education and career success is, is so important to address all the health and wellness that we want for our people that uh, we don't do many programs. We fund programs, we fund SHI, we fund Spruce Root, but educational and career success is one area that where we, we will have specific Sea Alaska programs for our shareholders uh, within these areas. Uh, I'll end with the Sustainable Southeast Partnership. We have an announcement on Thursday uh, with additional partners, the Nature Conservancy. Uh, we trust 
you will have the opportunity to again check out the website, hear it in the news, follow up with me uh, at any point in time. I'll be here through tomorrow and would just point out that, that this is an untapped resource in my mind. I think our communities, we're in seven communities and we work really well within those seven communities. And the tribes are our key partners in each one of these rural communities, but we want to be supporting and have partners in every single community in Southeast Alaska. So whatever the SSP is doing is intriguing to you, whether you are in Angoon or another location that is not an SSP community, uh, please talk to us because in our mind, every Southeast community is an SSP community. And we are going to use the announcement that we have on Thursday to paint that picture of what a fully fleshed out and funded SSP is uh, and what it will mean for Southeast Alaska. And so a lot to throw out there, and I don't know if I'm on time or not, but I will go ahead and end it there. I have a question or two, and you know, Milani talked about the, the few but significant infrastructure projects in the region. Would you like to speak to the one in your parking lot? And uh, we'll take another question or two from that if uh, the time allows. Yeah, another you know, SHI knows how to get things done. They, they funded in during COVID a significant uh, expansion of their campus to include an arts campus. It's one of their their key initiatives to create Juno and Southeast as the Northwest art capital of, of the world, uh, increase the, the uh, acknowledgement of our form line and our art and our carving as a unique uh, global art form. And that art campus will provide training for carvers, for metal workers, uh, for artists, for form line, um, and they'll connect into UAS, they'll connect into our school systems. And it's definitely a part of the educational and career success because we want to prove that you can have successful careers as native artists and SHI is, is making that happen with their arts campus. Okay, question over here. Deborah? Hello, Anthony. I wonder if you would speak to any partnerships you might have with the Ketchikan Indian community. So we we met with uh, KIC, and the number one thing they wanted to point out is that don't you think you're a tribe? And I and I say that because we've confirmed that, and there is some confusion with the Supreme Court case that some people say. Alaska Native Corps are now tribes. We've heard that from, from our shareholders. That is not the case. The Alaska Native Corps uh, can be eligible as tribes for very specific federal programs, but we are not tribes. And the one thing KIC wanted was you admit that and you respect tribal sovereignty and, and our Sea Alaska Board has put a resolution uh, in their support of our tribal communities and tribal sovereignty, saying that Sea Alaska does not uh, want to be sovereign, and we respect uh, all of our tribes and their positions. So that's one one immediate thing that we did with KIC. KIC said we want support of our language funds. So we, in our last board meeting, I believe we provided 175 thousand to their language effort, and. We're going to go back, we're going to meet with them uh, and continue to work with them on whatever their next priority is. Uh, they are a large uh, tribe down there. They have their own success um, and we want to continue working with them. It hasn't always been the best relationship, uh, but we're committed to going back and, and improving that relationship with KIC and again with any tribe that has had any historical issue with, with Sea Alaska. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, see, Alaska has been a great supporter for the, the conference in the region. And we're going to go into our, our break and let you get outside some fresh air. We're going to do some wipe down. So if you stay inside, you're going to grab uh, something.
the help in that effort. But again, the thank you for the, all of our sponsors and for C Alaska's presentation today. Thank you. Only on our airplanes, but in the airports. Um, getting this out, this message out was really important to start to encourage travelers to think about flying because they went from fear of flying, which was understandable during a pandemic, to making them feel safe when they wanted to fly again. People were concerned and we balanced the messages um, and you probably heard some of that with understanding of that concern and using terms like when you are ready when we talk to potential travelers. Um, particularly around Q4 of last year, when we did begin offering sales. It was pretty slow ramp up, but we wanted to actually see if we could stimulate demand and make people feel like it was a good time to start thinking about traveling. And then that brought us into, of course, um, 2021. Um, what we did know, and I think probably uh, what a lot of you may have experienced as well, is that the data shows there's a direct correlation between COVID case counts nationwide and travel demand. So anytime there, were, there was news about an outbreak or waiting for vaccines um, or any media reports of fear of travel or being in large groups, you could watch the travel bookings decline. On the opposite side of that, as 2021 entered and we started seeing more and more vaccine availability, more and more people being able to get vaccines, we started to see an uptick. People started to get excited about thinking about travel again. And we knew that there was pinup demand, uh, both in the state of Alaska and throughout the country. People had been in their houses a long time. They had been homeschooling their children, working from home people were starting to think about wanting to get out. So in Q, Q1 of this year, um, as everybody knows, it became clear that the cruise ships to Southeast would be delayed. Um, so we turned around and partnered with the visitor industry, Southeast partners, many of you in that room today, focused on tourism, and we wanted to stimulate and encourage independent travel. Led by Scott Haverstad, who I know that you all know, who's just sitting right outside um, my office here, um, waiting to see how, what kind of job I do today. Um, and Casey Hostetler, who I know that you all know, who leads our work in Southeast Alaska and is a Southeast Conference board member. Um, we worked with the Southeast communities. We serve directly and indirectly to promote in-state travel for Alaskans, which was something we had talked about for a long time and felt like this was a great opportunity to encourage Alaskans to not only support local businesses throughout the state, but to get out and see this great state. This was gonna be a great opportunity to do that. And it was communities like Haines that put together vacation packages and tied packages with air travel for an eight week promotion, summer promotion. And it was a great success. It, it encouraged and communicated to the people in the state of Alaska that there is a lot of this state, and I bet for a lot of people, that they had never seen before. And so we made opportunities available for them and found that people got really, really excited about that. And so that was encouraging to us. And I hope that's something I think that we will look at doing year after year because it's a great way to see this great state. And so as we moved on, one of the things I wanted to bring up and Scott said I could blame him, but I'm not gonna do that. Um, the difficult part for us, and I know those sitting in the room that live in, a, in uh, any part of Southeast Alaska where we fly, was trying to set the flight schedule for the summer. We couldn't easily predict in December of last year, which is about the time we would sit down and, and look forward to summer of 2021, we could not 
at that time predict what independent travel would be or demand in general? Uh, and in some cases we didn't get it right. And um, I wanted to bring that up today while we were all together because um, the good news of, of that were people came into Southeast Alaska better than we predicted. The downside was because of that, there were times this summer when there wasn't enough capacity. Um, and that's when it made it difficult for those of you living in Southeast Alaska. We apologize for that. We know what we can do right. And we know that the summer of 2022, we're literally looking at a schedule that would mirror the summer of 2019, skipping 20 and 21 altogether. And as we look to the future, as I said earlier, travel demand continues to be driven partly by this virus. With the dangerous Delta variant out there right now, any disturbing news about case counts, um, can cause a slowing or drop in ticket sales. So for us, it's almost like a roller coaster. As news reports bad news, you see the ticket sales go down. As it reports good news, like an increase in the number of people getting vaccinated, then you'll see the, the ticket sales go up because people want to plan. People want to go see family again. They want to vacation again. So they just look for that hint of good news. So I think that we're all in a great position moving into the summer of 2022. I think that we're going to see um, these variants um, based on everything that we know today. And I'm not a doctor, I'm not an expert, I'm not the CDC, but everybody looks forward to summer of 2022 thinking we can get this in a good place that we can look forward to welcoming a full cruise season. Uh, with a hopefully a record number of visitors. And I know Wendy's probably gonna to touch on that. And at the same time, we'll work again with our tourism partners to drive independent travel into Southeast Alaska. I think it's an incredible combination and an incredible story that out of something bad over 2020 and the early part of 2021, I think we've learned a lot. And I think together we can turn this into a real positive going into the summer of 2022. So it's great to get together and talk about the positive future. Um, we care deeply about Southeast Alaska. Scott will tell us almost on a daily basis that he is a Ketchikan High School graduate. Um, so it means a lot to us in this, in this room here in Anchorage. Um, and we know it means a lot to the people and businesses that depend on a healthy visitor industry. Um, thank you all for having me today. I look forward to listening to the rest of the panel and answering any questions you have. And thank you for all you do to make Southeast strong. So thank you very much. All right, thank you so much, Marilyn. And we will uh, we'll bring you back in for Q&A at the end. Next up, we have Jillian Simpson, who's the Vice President at the Alaska Travel Industry Association. And again, you see the bios for uh, these amazing folks uh, on the QR code that we've gone paperless for as much as we can be COVID safe. And so uh, continuing to take a look, not this, this is the next presentation. So uh, whatever Jillian has, if she has some slides, if you can bring her on screen for her virtual appearance to continue the, uh, the, the overview at the macro level of some of the, the bigger issues in the tourism industry. So there she is, you are full screen and ready to go. So good morning and welcome to Southeast Conference. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really sad not to be there in person. Um, so thank you for this opportunity. I hope you can hear me all okay. Um, yeah. Well, thank you. I'm with the Alaska Travel Industry Association, and I'm excited to be on um, this panel this morning because I get to share this um, time with two of our greatest partners. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about um, how this past season went for us um, in a statewide perspective. So um, we commissioned a study to see how COVID impacted businesses in um, 2019. Um, we partnered with uh, McKinley to do that. And we saw that no surprise that there was an 80% decrease in visitation in 2019, as well as an 80% decrease in revenue um, and wages during that time. Um, so everybody was really hopeful, of course, for 2021 until, um, unfortunately, we got the news early on, I think it was in February, that 
Um, we were not going to be able to have ships because of the Canadian border remaining closing, which also impacted, of course, any people wanting to drive up through Canada. Obviously, the biggest impact, though, was the, the cruise ships. And so at that point, we really needed to pivot and make sure that if there was going to be any way to salvage the season, that we could um, attract independent travelers to Alaska and get out the message that you definitely can fly to Alaska and that we are open for business. Um, at the same time, communicating at that time, the various um, guidelines for travel around COVID and testing and things like that. So we really wanted to get that message out. And fortunately, um, there was a lot of federal money available. So between ATIA, the governor's office, um, other DMOs, including many of you down in Southeast Alaska, um, we were able to put a $20 million marketing campaign um, in the spring and in the summer into the national as well as the in-state market. So ATIA focused on our campaign, which we called Go Big, Go Alaska, and it was really encouraging independent travelers to um, think big and knowing that as Marilyn said, there was a lot of pent up demand. People were really tired from homeschooling, trust me, I know. Um, and we really needed to, to get out there and travel and to not just think about a quick weekend getaway to someplace nearby, but to, you deserve a, the best vacation of your life and Alaska is here to deliver it. Um, and I think that we definitely saw a lot of success um, having that kind of um, implementation of that kind of um, marketing budget made a big difference. Um, so I'd say that our recovery this summer um, was a mixed recovery. So if you were a business that your business model really focused on um, smaller volume of people, maybe higher end, where you could make your money um, catering to less people, not necessarily um, a high volume of traffic and you didn't rely on necessarily cruise ship traffic, um, then I think um, that you did okay, actually. Um, I think the independent travelers did come to Alaska um, and, they, and they did spend some money. We did learn um, that there were more jobs that were added back into the market, even though there has been a significant hiring shortage, that has probably been the biggest challenge for our industry this year. Um, but according to the Alaska Department of Labor, um, 4,500 tourism jobs came back in 2021. Um, unfortunately, that's still a significant decline from when um, our peak in 2019, that's still a 26% decline where in 2019 we had over 42,000 um, jobs. State parks, I'm sure you've all heard, um, are being loved. Um, and so their visitation was up 30%, um, revenue was up even higher, and we were seeing even higher trends um, this summer. So all of that we think was good news. Um, in addition to the, the marketing, um, and I really wanna give a big shout out to Alaska Airlines for their partnership. They really supplemented a lot of what we were able to do. Um, by partnering with us for the Go Big campaign, as well as partnering with us, we had um, some different press trips and some influencers. In fact, a lot of them were down in Southeast this summer, and a lot of that was due to the generosity of Alaska Airlines providing flights um, and partnering with us that way. Um, but travelers, we saw as well, they were definitely open to marketing messages. And as, as Marilyn mentioned, you know, when, when the news is good and when people are healthy, they are excited to travel. And we definitely saw that, especially in the beginning of the summer, there was a lot of pent up demand. There were people that had been planning and hoping they had been rebooking their cruises um, from 2019 and really wanted to still travel. And so they came to Alaska as an independent traveler. Um, and then we also actually saw a lot of lift into the state air capacity, um, almost matched 2019 levels. And a lot of that was due to um, planes needing to be repositioned that couldn't go overseas. And so our destination really benefited quite a bit from, um, from those travelers this summer. And we're hoping to keep that momentum up moving forward. Um, the good news um, was that there was, uh, it almost seemed like a minor miracle that the Alaska Tourism Restoration Act was passed and we actually have 80 ships coming up this um, summer into the fall. I know it's 
only, I mean, probably not even 10% of the capacity that we'd had in the past, but it was something and I think it gives us hope and it was really exciting to see um, policymakers, our congressional delegation, um, and everybody just come together in order to really make that happen and make a big impact for our industry in particular. I think um, that really helped somewhat down in, in Southeast Alaska for sure. And, and really grateful that the cruise lines um, in July were actually able to make, um, make that happen where they could actually sail. So that was a really big deal for us. Um, moving forward, um, we continue to look at travel sentiment and consumers' openness to um, marketing messaging for travel. It has waned a little bit um, given what's going on with Delta right now. Um, but nationally, at least when looking at travelers who are looking at traveling over Labor Day weekend, um, and this isn't just for Alaska, this is nationally, 13% of people who had trips booked over Labor Day actually canceled them because of Delta. And they're a little hesitant right now on trip planning for the next three months. However, consumers are very optimistic and are actively planning travel within the next 12 months, which certainly bodes well for our destination um, next summer. Um, so of course, though, I mean, like everything with this pandemic, it is ever changing and we need to be nimble and ready to um, adjust on the fly. And I, it's been really amazing seeing our businesses and our destination um, able to um, pivot quickly. Um, for next year, some of the other good news is that there's still a lot of um, federal money available for, um, for tourism, whether it's through marketing or for some infrastructure projects and for outdoor recreation. So um, I think that there is opportunity for us. Um, I think cruise capacity for next year looks very good um, and hope to see that continuing to grow or break records. Um, and I think probably the other challenges that we are still facing though and still need to deal with are certainly the hiring challenges, the staffing shortages. Um, we haven't heard that that's going away yet, um, that um, that will continue to be a challenge. Um, and what's happening up in Denali, um, which could impact cruise tours um, if that road um, is unable to have a short term and hope, I mean, we're definitely looking for that long term fix. That's probably one of our top priorities. And before COVID, we thought that was the most devastating thing that could happen to our industry. So definitely keeping an eye on that and advocating strongly. Um, and fortunately, we have a very wonderful congressional delegation that's also all over it. So hopefully that road can get fixed and um, that piece of our industry can continue to move forward. But um, so I would say cautiously optimistic for 2022 and um, and and hopeful and gr and grateful for what we were able to have so far um, for this year. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jillian. And we're going to uh, let you slip back to the virtual back seat while we uh, have our invite our, our last three speakers on the panel to come on up to the table. And then we'll bring uh, Jillian and Marilyn back for, uh, for Q&A. And so one of the, uh, I think we're gonna continue on the, the theme with some of the larger scale uh, tourism efforts. And we're so very pleased to have Royal Caribbean uh, represented here by Wendy, who has uh, an accomplished career in Public relations uh, was a vice president at the Railroad Corporation, where I got to know her a bit over the years, and to see her in this role uh, as as well, it's it's, it's great to uh, to have her here and the meaningful partnership that Royal Caribbean plays in the cruising industry for Southeast Alaska, and also in support of our scholarship auction tomorrow night. I want to say thank you. Um, you also say thank you for uh, things that uh, so many have done in the past that may not be as well known. I think a lot of people in Haines probably forgotten. Uh, Royal Caribbean is largely responsible for the, uh, the large cruise ship dock that's out front there. The early days of partnering uh, in a sector that was not familiar to Haines got that, uh, that built way back in the day. A lot of folks have probably forgotten that it was the co-chair of House Finance that helped pay for that, uh, that doc, uh, Representative Thomas, uh, thank you. But, um, you know, and then uh, Oslin Park, if you saw the ball fields coming in uh, into town, those were completely re, uh, refurbished and redone by Royal Caribbean um, back many, many years ago. 
and we don't forget. And so we like to say thank you. And um, so with that, I'm going to turn over to, to Wendy and let her give an update from the Royal Caribbean Group. And um, please give her a warm welcome. everyone. <laughs> it is really, really good to be here. And I'm, I'm so glad that I can actually say for the first time in a Southeast conference that I know so many people in the room, and I'm so happy about that, that my new job has brought me into Southeast, which is such a, an amazing place in Alaska. Okay, James, I need to make sure I'm going to hit the right button here. It's just the forward and I point it to you. <clears throat> Okay, so lovely fact that I got to follow both Marilyn and Julian um, because they covered a lot of what I think I will also cover in maybe a slightly different way, but I'm going to uh, really, I hope that what I can do today is just build some confidence for next year and some trust in the product based on what we saw in our partial season this year. Um, I do want to make a disclaimer, please don't make any investments based on any of my comments today. And we all know the pandemic is still out there and who knows what's it's going to happen. I think someone called it a roller coaster. Yes, it is every single day. So on that note, we'll go to the next slide here. All right. <clears throat> So what is a cruise update unless you show how Alaska shows up in the global market? I know a lot of you have seen this slide before, but Alaska is represents 5% of the cruise destination market. Um, but I like to say we punch far beyond our weight. When you look at cruise guests and how they rank Alaska, it's higher as a preferred destination than anywhere else. And that is extremely consistent with our satisfaction surveys. <clears throat> Alaska is also a very high yield pro product, which many of you heard us, have heard us say, and guests are willing to pay a premium for the bucket list experience that they get here. Okay. This is another chart that I think we're all familiar with from over the years of hearing cruise industry updates. And we've touched on it a few times today. Um, since 2011, you can see the historical and projected capacity figures um, that are represented on the chart. 2019 was a huge year. It was um, our record year. And what we're seeing for 2022 right now is even surpassing that with 1.57 million cruise visitors. Again, hard to say what the pandemic might cause, but right now let's be confident that this number could actually happen. What that means is 39 CLIA membership, um, well, our member lines with CLIA, it means 39 ships sailing to Alaska. And that's about 639 voyages. Um, when you look at 2021, I think we touched on the numbers a little bit. Um, I think the big takeaway for 2021 is we got to shake the dust off. We got to come back in July. We <clears throat> got to build confidence in the product that the protocols put into place by the cruise industry are working. They're working on our vessels, but also the amazing commitment that we have seen from the tour providers, the businesses, the local communities, our local leadership in really wanting to offer um, a healthy and safe product when the guests come here. So I think we've laid a great foundation for next year. <clears throat> All right, James, need a little help here. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Okay, success. All right, so this is the look back slide. I won't spend a lot of time on it. But it took a team to come back this year. And Senator Murkowski, I have to look you without my glasses on. Thank you. Thank you for your leadership. I know Senator Sullivan and Congressman Young were right there. Again, Alaska punches beyond its weight. Every, for everything that we face, we have the delegation that does it for us. But it's not just our delegation. There were voices in this room, our local mayors, our governor, our tour providers, so many stakeholders. Everybody in this room contributed to saying federal government, we have a law that's unworkable. We're letting a, another country, um, and it's not Canada's fault, don't get me wrong, but, but because of our own US law, we couldn't sail up here. Because of our CDC strong restrictions, that was a huge hurdle. And so it's, uh, I look back, it was like pulling a rabbit out of the hat. 
I don't think a lot of us expected it was going to happen, and yet it did. Um, <clears throat> another big thing when I look at the CDC and the restrictions and, and what was required, uh, a really neat thing happened this year. The local mayors and city managers sat down with industry and the state, and we were really um, able to work a standard multi-port agreement with all the protocols and thinking through all the scenarios and getting something into place that would allow the CDC to say, okay, you guys, you have it. So we got the approval needed, sometimes in the nick of time, right before the ship sailed in July. But that was a really neat collaborative effort. And again, going back to it's working and there's a good reason to be confident in the protocols and um, you know the structure put into place to offer the, um, the cruise visits that we've had this year and looking into next year. Excuse me. <clears throat> So what does that mean? This year we uh, mentioned that we had nine large ships visiting um, Southeast Alaska, 78 voyages. Four of those ships were actually Royal Caribbean ships. So I'm gonna talk a little bit from a Royal Caribbean standpoint at this point. Nope, oh, we, we've got the right slide, sorry about that. So uh, as a brand, I think the mayor from Haines, um, you said it best, pandemic has really changed us all. It changed Royal Caribbean as a company. Um, it forced us to examine our brand promise and focus on continuous improvement. So this is who we are now. Uh, we do have five brands. Three of them are coming to Alaska. That's Celebrity, Royal, and Silver Sea. Uh, we have 60 ships, over 1,000 port visitations that uh, you know when we're fully running, that's what we're looking at. We have 13 ships on order. But there were some big changes. Those changes included um, selling Azamara this year. That's a luxury brand just under Silver Sea in terms of kind of its luxury status. Palmentier is a Spanish brand that we divested. We sold a lot of our older ships. And then on the COVID front, we enhanced uh, the onboard technology for COVID mitigation. We implemented a touchless check-in system. We actually developed a new app that would do uh, muster, uh, safety musters uh, electronically. Um, so that was a, a safety um, element that we could uh, implement. Uh, we, we, the new ships are gonna integrate LNG vessels. Uh, they're gonna be LNG vessels and also shore power capa uh, capabilities. Um, so that's kind of Royal where we ended up with uh, after the pandemic. Uh, we do represent our, our, our brand Royal Caribbean International is the largest cruise line by guest volume in the world. And um, our group is the second largest cruise ship company in the world right now. Again, I mentioned we have three brands visiting Alaska. <clears throat> oh, we missed a slide there. You know, I knew I should have bypassed PowerPoint. Sorry about that. This slide's a little out of uh, order, but I wanted to just do a call out to Haynes. I know we mentioned some of the other communities. Haynes, here's what you can expect for next year. 12 ships ranging uh, 200 to 3,000 passengers, 54 voyages, about 80,000 passengers total. We... <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, I think Marilyn said, you know, we've all got a little bit of fatigue on the protocols right now, but I did want to say just again around that building trust for next year, what we're experiencing on the ship. Um, <clears throat> Pre-cruise right now, uh, the Alaska cruises are all requiring 100% for a crew to be vaccinated, passengers over 12. We do have passengers under 12 not vaccinated, but we wanted to make sure families could travel to Alaska. The CDC just changed up their requirement. So instead of testing before embark embarkation three days in advance, now it's two days in advance. Um, and we're looking, you know, I know the, several of the cruise lines are looking at partnerships with uh, different providers for testing. And we're actually looking at options for at home testing as well. So that's a space that'll continue to evolve. Rather than go in to all the protocols on the ship, I just want to say I was on the first revenue sailing to Alaska on the Serenade. It was great, and uh, from a personal experience, I felt extremely safe on the ship. There was mask wearing uh, where vaccinated 
and unvaccinated people mixed. Um, there were certain places you could be unmasked because it was all vaccinated. Uh, social distancing was top of mind and how things were, were set up. Uh, you had um, ventilation systems that were all enhanced, medical capabilities that were enhanced. So I think the slide tells it all. I won't go into any more detail on that, but we were able to, uh, to offer um, on shore kind of an open experience except for the unvaccinated um, families where those, they had to be on more controlled tour experiences. Sorry, I keep losing my voice. Um, <clears throat> I think, again, it goes back to this is an evolving space, but some of these protocols may be with us for a long time, some forever, some will go away eventually, but we'll just evolve as things do. Okay. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail about our environmental, social, and government space but this is a big focus for our company. It's called sustainability, something that's very top of mind. Oh, come on. And, and of course, uh, to strain your eyes, I will just highlight a couple things from, <laughs> from this slide. Reducing our ship's energy con consumption and emission of greenhouse gases and other air pollutants is a critical part of our environmental stewardship strategy. And I know this is just a, a, a very important, um, it's a very important part of our Alaska place that we take care of our environment and we do it right. And our company really feels strongly about that. On the ship side, things that you'll see is, um, will adjust ship speed to lessen fuel use. Um, we have emission purification systems, advanced wastewater systems. Um, we use engine waste, or excuse me, engine waste heat to heat water for our showers. We have events at recycling. So the list goes on, but <clears throat> there's a lot of attention that we, we give to sustainable operations. Um, the other thing I'll highlight here as I move into the next slide, and I'll do a call out for Juno. Juno's got a great program that really looks at the impact uh, that visitors have on the community. So they have the Tourism Best Management Practices um, program, which is a great collaboration between industry as well as the community. It addresses impacts, something that's being implemented in, in various stages in other Southeast communities. So I will spend a little more time on this uh, slide. <clears throat> We've all noted it's been just such a difficult couple of years. Um, uh, so really looking at the, the social impact of the pandemic on our communities has been a, a, a big part of uh, certainly what I've been working on with uh, our Alaska stakeholders. Um, the part about this slide that I think you can really take away is the fact that we have three pillars that we really look at, and it's oceans, education, and community needs. Um, we have partnered with the Raptor Center, the Sea Life Center, Wildlife Center. Um, that's a really important part of the conservation effort. On education, when we first saw our schools all going virtual, we were able to make a key donation into HUNA with computers. Um, and then on the community needs front, you know, there's just a lot of things we really targeted looking at the need, whether it was women's shelters, ski programs for kids, keeping a gym open so that there were places to go during the pandemic where you could just get a little exercise. Um, for Haynes, it was just support in for some of their emergency support that they needed. Um, and, you know, Royal Caribbean wasn't the only company that provided some community support. I think all, our, all of our cruise lines did in so many ways, recognizing just how hard it's been. So I'm gonna wind up with a couple slides here. We are extremely bullish for 20, 2022 on Alaska. Uh, we will have nine ships sailing in Alaska next year. Two of these ships will be quantum size. The quantum of the seas first sailed in 2019 and her sister ship will be coming and joining us in 2022. To accommodate these larger ships, um, we've seen port infrastructure in many ports. One that we recently announced is Royal Caribbean was a minority partnership with a company in Sitka 
to enhance a dock there, it's a Siska Sound cruise terminal. That dock can now accommodate two large ships at a time. That was phase one of a project. Phase two is the development of the terminal and you can see people coming through the terminal. It will include a restaurant and some visitor, uh, other enhancements, gift shops. Very, very cool. So that's also under development right now. Um, I think that example, I hope, shows a good partnership with local stakeholders and how you bring economic development to a community. Um, another thing I'll note here, 80% of our fleet with Royal Caribbean will be back sailing by the end of uh, 2021, and we hope to have a full return by 2022. So I will wind up with a video if it plays, hopefully, and it'll show um, basically how Celebrity, one of our brands, is really marketing themselves now post, not post pandemic, but during the pandemic and looking into next year. And it goes back to that theme, isn't it time? Journey safe, journey wonderful. And I think it really connects the fact that people do want a vacation again. They wanna get out, they want to exercise their wonderlust and go to special places like Alaska, but they wanna do it in a safe way. And I think this captures it. So James, go ahead and flip that. Red roses too. I see them bloom for me and you. I think to myself, oh, what a wonderful world. Pretty in the sky, and so on the faces go by. I think to myself, oh, what a wonderful world. So, with time and care that we put into our new health and safety measures we do think it is time. So thank you for letting me be here today. Thank you, Wendy. And um, keep in mind that there are a pair of cruise ship tickets to be auctioned off tomorrow night for the scholarship auction, and you, that could be you, except for the cell phone ring. I was like, wait a minute, why did they put that dubbed in there? And I said, they're supposed to get away from that. So. We used to do penalties for the scholarship auction if your phone rang, so we'll have to see if we revisit that tomorrow. But next up, in a good segue into um, this section from what Jillian was talking about with the marketing at work, uh, network and some of the, the focus. Uh, one of the things that I'm really proud about is with Southeast Conference is the partnerships we have with you and with the different organizations where the core competencies lie. And here's representing that, uh, Rachel, with so many different hats but including the president now of the Southeast Alaska Tourism Council. So um, yeah. take it away. Well, thank you, Robert. And um, for those of you that don't know me yet, I am Rachel Roy. I am the executive director of the Sitka Chamber and Visit Sitka. And um, as I was kind of coming in here and I saw some familiar um, eyes, I uh, was remembering my six years ago, I just had my anniversary um, in my role last week, and my very first uh, act as the director was to come to Southeast Conference, and I was so well embraced. Uh, Robert just introduced me to so many people, and I thought, wow, this is home. This is like, this is a, a group of people that I can grow with, and I have, um, and it's been really special. So thank you for getting me up on the stage. I don't know about that, but I'm glad to be here, and um, I just think it's it's phenomenal the effort that the Haynes um, committee has done to be able to put this together 
And also thank you to the Haynes community for welcoming us. I think us meeting in person is a really important part of the work that we do. And the connections that are made here go far beyond um, the agenda. And I think it's, um, it's really important. I just wanna recognize a couple people in the room. Uh, we have Lori Boisa with Visit Sitka. Um, and also our mayor and our city administrator, Mayor Eisenbeis and John Leach are both also here. We have some other Sitkans here. We're really um, glad to be able to um, join everyone. I wanna talk about um, the Southeast Alaska Tourism Council. Uh, this is a, a snapshot of what our um, brand looks like and kind of our message that um, the Tourism Council has been, is a group of destination marketing organizations. So your visitors bureaus um, and also your city tourism planners. So if you don't have a visitors bureau, um, you may be represented on our council as part of um, your, your uh, city employee maybe in, um, if you want to go to the next slide, oh, maybe I have it. Um, we have a couple different ways that we are sharing and communicating our message. Um, communities that are involved, Juno, Sitka, Skagway, Haynes, Wrangell, Ketchikan, Petersburg, Gustavus, and Yakutat. We also partner with the Alaska Marine Highway, which is uh, one of the ways that you can get around our, um, our region. And the whole mission of the um, organization is to really attract and promote for independent travelers. And so as um, a group of, of in, uh, communities, we collaborate together to say, come to Southeast Alaska, yes, come to Sitka, but come to these other communities and here's how you can do it. And um, one, one of the really, I think, uh, the benefits of, of the group itself is that you have a, a new director and you have someone that's been there. Um, I, I don't know if, who all we have online, um, but I know Patty has been such a mentor for our group, Patty Mackey and Ketchikant. And just um, thinking about how together uh, we are stronger and this theme of Southeast Strong is so true. Um, for someone to say, hey, what, what about this marketing strategy? I want to help you. I want to help um, Haynes have a successful convention so that Southeast Alaska is that much better. And so um, I think that's really a, a big part of our, of our mission and all of what has really come through. Um, we... Um, <laughs> As we're kind of looking at that, we did have some opportunities as the, um, the funds for marketing and there were some grant opportunities that our council was able to benefit through a partnership, um, not only within our own communities, but with Southeast Conference. Um, and we, uh, so Southeast Conference received a grant and in collaboration with SATC and, and a lot of the pieces that we had together, um, working with Thompson and Co, uh, we're able to do a, um, to get in and get um, collateral. So collateral, it, I mean, it costs the money, the videos, everything that you see, there's a lot that goes into making all of that happen. And so the grant is just going to, I think, for this summer, um, it was a COVID safe travel grant. So we're encouraging uh, visitors to travel, but to look to the future of what you're gonna see on the banners when we're promoting having a convention, what you're gonna see on um, you know, invitations for people to come around and visit. And I think the invitation also exists for all of us to go into our um, Southeast neighbors communities and have that vacation and um, kind of infuse into their, their communities. And I think this year really showed us that for sure. Um, getting a little bit further into the website, um, you can find us at alaskasinsidepassage.com, but you can also follow us on our social media, AK Inside Passage. And so if you're on Instagram or Facebook, you'll find us there. And each community has a profile. It also is a ability to find one place if you are um, doing a trip throughout Southeast or sending someone, you can send them to our site and we can, it's a hub for all of your um, visitor guides from different destinations. Um, and then of course, you know, partnering with our Alaska Green Highway, how do you get around? We, uh, we do a lot of support around finding people, getting them through Southeast on an independent uh, basis. We also have partners um, such as Alaska Seaplanes who are another means to making that happen. 
Um, and we have a short video that kind of shows a little bit of the of the reel of what um, was collected this year. And uh, I'm just really excited. You'll see these pieces as other marketing um, happens and uh, go ahead and, and hit play on that. Well, um, that is just a little taste of, of um, what we've been able to do co collaboratively and together. And I think um, I want to make one plug for our workforce. Um, obviously, uh, kind of across our, our region, there's uh, all these challenges. But I know that our visitor industry is going to see a large need for increase. And um, one of the things I'm saying is I got my start in tourism. I'm still in the industry. But I, I mean, how many in here worked at a coffee shop or you know, restaurant or worked in retail. We got our starts in tourism. So how can we as leaders in our communities help support um, that your favorite coffee shop on the largest ship day of the year? How can you support um, our local businesses so that we can just have a amazing um, 22 season and uh, keep everyone open and running and successful and keep those experiences happening. So thanks for having me. And uh, I love our next speaker to, to kind of round out some collaboration for sure. All right, thank you. So I just wanted to uh, just reiterate some of the things that you just, just heard because I'm so very proud of the regional effort that went into the collaboration to not start something new and competitive because we were able to get um, you know uh, a lot of money for our tourism marketing. We go in, and that's kind of the MO at Southeast Conference. We want to find out who the partners are that are engaged and empower them and enable them. And so the effort to help SATC, and yes, we satisfied all the grant requirements for this year on that, but we did it with an eye to build um, a, you know an inventory that will last for the next five years. Uh, or maybe even beyond. And you can see already in such a short time, the impressions and the hits and the reach that it's had already. And so these kind of things are what we're really proud to do. And so, you know, as we find and seek out opportunities for every economic sector, that's our, our goal. We're, you know, taking a look at another round of tourism infrastructure uh, uh, grants that might be out there through EDA. And we want to reach into the communities and find out what those needs are. We're looking at every single sector and you know transportation tomorrow is going to be another one where we're looking to find the role that we can help uh, uh, support that and so um, our next speaker is really a win-win situation for for haynes she gets the the benefit of having relocated to paradise uh, and uh, and haynes gets the benefit of having the alaska outdoor alliance's executive director be here do some backup for hedc and become part of an amazing community and so I'm really excited to have uh, Lee come and share some of what uh, she's been working on. And uh, we've got the time, so tell us. Uh, but uh, this is, I think, is, your, is this your first official time addressing us in person? Yes. Yeah. In person. So anyway, please welcome Lee Hart. Well, thank you, Robert. Um, sorry, I'll take this off. 
So thank you, Robert, and thanks to the team of Southeast Conference and um, my partners in the local organizing team for um, bringing this event to Haines, um, my new home since May. And um, I'm thrilled to be here. I fell deeply in love with Haines already. And, um, and so it's a pleasure to be here and to welcome all of you to my new home. Um, I'm honored to be invited to speak about an often unsung hero of Alaska's um, economy. My name is Lee Hart. And I'm the executive director of the Alaska Outdoor Alliance, which is I'm dedicated to strengthening Alaska's $2.2 billion outdoor recreation economic sector um, and ensuring that Alaska enjoys the best outdoor recreation economy in the world. Ours is a big tent that encompasses motorized, non-motorized, summer, winter, um, uh, sports, as well as hunting and fishing, guides and outfitters, manufacturers, retailers, educators, career public land and wildlife managers, healthcare professionals, and many more. I want to say that we are so very thankful that we have the congressional delegation that we do that cares so much about this sector and shows it in the work that they do in DC every day. Congressman Young proudly um, proclaims his lifelong support for the Land and Water Conservation Fund that is responsible for trails, campgrounds, and close to home recreation um, like playgrounds all over Alaska. We wanna thank Senator Sullivan for supporting the Connecting America's Active Transportation System Act I'm going to lower this a little bit, um, which uh, will help uh, connect, will strengthen connections between neighbors and the everyday places that they go, while making Alaska's roads more bike and walk friendly. I want to thank special thanks to Senator Murkowski for your leadership on the Great American Outdoors Act, which will now play a, a, a cornerstone role in helping ensure Alaska restores the valuable outdoor recreation infrastructure, and our infrastructure is trails, public use cabins, boat launches, trailheads, and other facilities that attract millions of visitors and fuel local economies throughout the state. We also know that you fought hard um, for the um, American Rescue Plan to include Alaska in the American Rescue Plan Act, which recognizes that outdoor recreation infrastructure is critical infrastructure. Um, and we wanna also say, um, and because it serves um, as, it supports the communities that serve as the gateways to the many bucket list national parks and other federal lands and waters in our state. We also wanna thank you for key provisions in the Infrastructure Act that support Alaska. And in our case, especially for um, reinvigorating the Alaska Marine Highway System and restoring and maintaining public use cabins throughout the Tongass and Chugach National Forest. You don't have to look far to understand how important the outdoors is to Alaskans. Just ask your kids and grandkids. You can even find us at the center of, Southeast Alaska, of the Southeast Conference's 2025 Economic Plan, which recognizes that the region's number one strength is its unparalleled beauty and recreational opportunities. The Economic Plan calls for, among other things, increasing access to public lands, expanding trail networks, and I would say both land and water-based trail networks, and growing cultural arts and tourism. It also calls for working to diversify tourism by supporting and collaborating with communities and entities on new programs and products catering to independent travelers. The plan also recognizes that cultural tourism is the number one economic opportunity for areas that are not already fully engaged in the tourism economy. You know, an old proverb says that tomorrow belongs to the people who plan for it today. And to that end, the Alaska Outdoor Alliance is on a steering committee updating the statewide comprehensive outdoor recreation plan called SCORP. 
um, that will set out our recreational investment priorities for the next five years. Our state parks director, Ricky Geese, has assembled a noteworthy group of Alaska leaders for a statewide advisory group for this effort. And it includes representatives from ADA, the Denali Commission, Alaska Department of Fish and Game, Transportation, Public Health, the Alaska Travel Industry Association, the Department of Labor and Workforce Development, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and the Rasmussen Foundation. I'm also extremely excited to tell you about a coalition that is newly formed that is um, collaborating to secure what we hope will be millions of dollars of American Rescue Plan Act funding so that our tourism economy doesn't just rebound, but is propelled to the head of the class, leveraging Alaska's God-given beauty and culturally rich heritage. This coalition is comprised of the Alaska Outdoor Alliance, the Alaska Travel Industry Association, the Alaska Native Heritage Center, Southeast Sustainable Partnership, and the University of Alaska. It mirrors the same four goals that you heard from Anthony Malat um, at Sea Alaska earlier this morning. But our mission is for our regional growth cluster is to revitalize and shape Alaska's tourism and outdoor recreation industries to establish an equitable recovery, which develops a homegrown workforce that supports business retention, economic growth, and spreads prosperity for more. This proposal leads with equity and inclusivity and justice. Those are the number one priorities from the Economic Development Administration's list of seven investment priorities, and our proposal will lead with that. We're doing this because hundreds of businesses, small and large, and 81% of Alaskans recognize that outdoor recreation is the top reason they live, work, and play here. It adds up to a $2 billion economic sector that means business in a uniquely Alaskan way. Just recently, um, examples here in Southeast include that last year, two of our communities, Sitka and Juneau, allocated over $1.5 million of CARES Act funding to create a homegrown workforce that mirrors the, civilian, the successful um, civilian conservation core from days gone by. And the work that they achieved in their communities was wildly popular and successful. We're now working to integrate that into the plan I just described and the grant money we're seeking. And I also wanna say that um, we recognize that Sealaska and that Clinkett and Haida Central Council is investing and innovating in this sector in impressive ways and in ways probably unseen maybe elsewhere in the, in the country. I also wanna applaud Skagway, our neighbors in Skagway for taking $2 million and investing that this summer in trail work that will not only help prepare their community to be more visitor welcoming, um, but also create a healthier and happier residence. Our sector touches everyone's lives. It's hard to find an Alaskan that doesn't participate in the outdoors to some degree. You add up the amount of equipment you see heading around town on the weekends, whether it's in the winter and snow machines on trailers and on, in trucks and all the gear that goes with that. And that's how we get to the huge sector that we are. We are inclusive, we are collaborative, and I hope to talk to many more of you in this room about how you can get involved in this effort and join us in seeking to transform our tourism and outdoor recreation economy, especially here in Southeast um, for today, but also for seven generations to come. Thank you. All right.
Thank you, Lee. And so if we could bring up on screen the two virtual participants we have, um, the, you know, the outdoor recreation piece is just so filled with incredible opportunity. I'm excited to see where that goes. Southeast Conference has been talking with Lee on some possibilities and we've dust off the, uh, the old borough books. Um, you'll find one of their uh, earlier economic development directors uh, dream plans for the Dalton Trail to be developed. Uh, that was uh, one of John Schnabel's last big dreams to have, take advantage of part of the roaded system and hut to hut down to Pyramid Harbor that you flew over on the way to the airport. Do we have video uh, feeds for Marilyn and Jillian? And we're gonna have time, we've got about uh, 10 minutes for, for questions. So there we go. Uh, great to have you back. You know, I think one of the, one is, you know, with the, the really significant gains in independent travel, you know, how, how does those successes in 2021 then merge with the rebound to 2019 tourism that was already fairly, uh, you know, filled infrastructure wise. So uh, what do we need to do as communities to support the industry growth to accommodate growth in both of those sectors? Um, and maybe Marilyn, start with you and Jillian, and then if anyone up front here has uh, answers for that too. And if you have a, a question audience, raise your hand and Mr. President will some come by with the, with, with the, with the microphone. So Marilyn? Sure. Um, and I, I bet there are people in the room that probably have a, know as much about this as I do, particularly if you're talking about bringing more, even more people into Southeast Alaska. I think what a lot of businesses um, struggled with was getting staffing up, being able to hire enough people uh, in order to anticipate growth. Um, kind of like us with um, what I talked about earlier with getting the right airplane, that number of airplanes and the, the capacity right. Um, I think we were all kind of struggling in what 2021 would look like. Looking ahead to 2022, I think we're all, you know, everybody's going to be um, trying to figure out if you go back to 2019, what those staffing numbers look like, because in order to have more people come, you have to have enough people to work your business when they get off a cruise ship or they get off the airplane. Um, so that would be just my short answer is I think that probably one of the biggest issues, and that's not just in Southeast. I think it's not only a state problem in Alaska, I think it's a nationwide problem right now, but I think it will be one that hopefully over the next year, we can figure out a way to make sure that we can have enough people wanting to work in this incredible industry that is the visitor industry. Thanks, Jillian. Hi, I, I couldn't echo what Marilyn is saying stronger than that. In fact, it's definitely a priority of our, our board to make sure that we are more proactively supporting businesses and conducting outreach um, to excite people to come work in Alaska. And even more importantly, I think to get people within our communities to become part of our industry. Um, I think that's probably one of the, the best things about tourism is that we live here and we can tell our stories the best. And I love the efforts that Lee was just um, talking about, about how we can grow to be a sustainable economy for our communities across the entire state. Thank you. Uh, input, uh, especially Rachel, sure. uh, you know, you, you're kind of where both, yeah. both the rubber hits the road uh, there. Yes. Um, can you hear me? Um, okay. So I, the kind of the notes I, I wrote down is I think as we're all planning for um, this rebound and, and um, as you're, you're going back to your community. So thinking about how do we make it easy for a business to offer a new service or good? How do they, the permitting processes, the, um, the support that you can give to these businesses that then in turn are um, able to, you know, bring in those revenues and into your communities. Um, I think that, there's uh, other other systems that we absolutely are critical is um, the you know the transportation the um, the tugs the making sure that the food is making it into the communities and I mean we felt a lot of that in 
you know, early in COVID, um, but I think we'll feel it again where the demand that we need to make sure all of those systems are, are working and in order. And, um, and so I think Southeast has the, all these mechanisms in place. And so just really kind of preparing that, um, that there will be a higher need for a lot of things to happen and kind of uh, how can we seamlessly make that happen? Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, workforce and um, I think what we've seen is that the uh, we even had some feedback that our independent season was at or even above what 2019 um, was seen early in the season. Our you know our hotels were full in months that we didn't we don't normally see that like pinch point. Um, and so I think we're going to continue to see that a lot of efforts are kind of being made to spread the season out a little bit further into April. April is like a kind of a hidden gem of a month in Sitka, especially, I mean, we just have, you can have just awesome. And what about October? And, um, we're seeing that some, um, you know, Alaska day is, is, uh, a very good time in Sitka to come and visit. And so there's, you know, October 18th. So our season is actually going a little bit longer. Um, how can we, um, yeah, find ways to, to really spread that out through the winter and, um, go and visit each other. And that will help sustain more year round jobs. It'll, it'll spread out the, um, so that it's, we're not just moving into a season seasonal, um, communities, but we can really support those businesses year round and, and keep our businesses open. Thank you. Wendy. Yeah, I'll try to keep it short, but I think there's a few things. One is dispersion. So looking at new tour opportunities, and I know that's happening right now, even in Sitka. The final slide I showed was of a new kayaking tour that was just developed. And so that helps take a little pressure and spread people out in the communities. That's almost a longer term thing. You have to build up to that, but that is something to keep an eye on. Um, you did mention the longer season. So we are seeing ships travel uh, into October. We'll see how that works this year. Um, they are starting to sail earlier too. And I think another thing, especially speaking for our company, is really being proactive with the communities in the transportation and community planning efforts and having a seat at the table, knowing that we have to preserve these very special places and the unique and genuine uh, experience in Alaska. And if you get too many people in one place, that's not a good thing. So how do you, again, disperse people? How do you um, manage traffic flow and impacts in a proactive way and doing that collaboratively with the communities? And I think that's just a big part of how you need to show up as a company. Thank you. So um, we will, we're, we're going to uh, wrap up with a, plenty of time for this question, but I just want to put one thing out there. Um, you know, in addition to the marketing funds that Southeast Conference is able to get, we're looking at an ADA uh, tourism and outdoor recreation uh, grant opportunity. And we've communicated with the destination marketing organizations in the region, but, you know, we think there's probably room for four or five uh, projects that are construction ready, you know, in the 80 to $100,000 range that's already designed construction ready and the match has already been identified. So if there's a municipal person that uh, maybe didn't have a DMO, or didn't get a copy of that, I've sent it out to a lot of folks, um, do uh, uh, be in touch with me because we're, we're, if Southeast only gets its fair share of these funds, I wouldn't be dismally disappointed and considered a failure. We gotta do way better than that uh, because the Senator has opened the barn doors and we're gonna go empty the barn. So Senator, with, with that, your question. Thank you. I love the fact that I get to ask a question instead of being <laughs> asked all of them. So thank you all for, for the presentations that you've provided. And I think the, the optimism, the hope about what's coming in, in, in 22 and, and consecutive seasons. I appreciate the fact that we're all talking about how we encourage these partnerships, these collaboratives, with, with the local communities mm -hmm. to, to really build and empower them. We have such extraordinary things to offer. Our, our amazing seafood, um, every little community that I go to uh, has its own brewery that we're all very <laughs> proud of the local <laughs> brews. Uh, we've got an, we built an export market with peonies that are, are globally known what more can we be doing? And I'm gonna look at you, Wendy, because what you bring in are these literally cities into these communities. 
the opportunity to expose these visitors to some of Alaska's finest, whether it's our fine seafood, whether it's our local beers, or, or uh, uh, got pretty good carrots too. But, <laughs> but our opportunity to help our local communities by exposing them to these things that are unique and special to us so that they, when they leave Alaska, go back to Iowa or whatever country they may be from, they're saying, how can I get more wild Alaska seafood? How, mm -hmm. can, I, uh, how can I tap into some of the local uh, economic projects or benefits that come from our communities that are pretty discreet? Because I know that we try onshore to showcase that. But I think we also have an opportunity within the cruise sector itself to put more local products, to do more local communication about this is what makes us so special. And this is why you're so happy when you come on one of our cruises. Wow, it's almost like I planted that question with you because I totally <laughs> forgot one thing in my speech. So this gives me a chance to talk about it. I think localism is hugely important. And um, I've only been working for Royal for a year, um, but I live in Alaska. I've lived up here for a long time and this place means a lot to me. And we have so many cool products. And, you know, as you stated, Senator, Fred Villa's in the room. I know I have a conversation that I need to have with him a little later in terms of uh, what kind of products eventually could be featured on a ship. It's a, it's a volume issue and a logistics issue. So you have to be big, right? If you have 4,000 people on a ship, that's a lot of product. So that's one of the big hurdles, but if we can define what the, um, uh, you know, what's required there, can we build some of that in? Um, and we're totally open to those conversations. Another thing that we did recently was support a shop local Alaska program. And <clears throat> it was knowing that there just weren't visitors in town. How do we drive uh, folks to shop in local uh, places here in Alaska? So what we did was we worked with voyage.com, a business out of Skagway and by Alaska. And we uh, basically partnered on an online marketplace concept where we connected our guests who have been here before, love Alaska, and we sent out emails to them and said, hey, you can go and shop in Alaska shops, even though we're in the midst of a pandemic. And so it was a great way to connect people that already had um, a love for Alaska. They'd been here before and they were able to come in and support businesses and go buy those products that they remembered when they were here. So that's a good example of something that we worked during the pandemic and, and there's ongoing conversations about what that can look like going forward. So something top of mind for our company. Right. Thank you. And that's, um, you know, another thing that came out of discussions at Southeast Conference when the cruise industry said during the middle of the pandemic last year, yes, we will help pivot our communities from the brick and mortar and help with the online platform so we can at least get some commerce engaged. And then now how our challenge is to build on not just one or the other, but both. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. We've got time for just uh, one and a half questions. So I'm not sure what you have, the half or the one, but go for it, Deborah. It'll come to Judy. This one's for Wendy. In Ketchikan, we have a virulent anti-cruise ship group. Uh, they are convinced that you're spewing, spewing human waste in Tongass Narrows. And I think that you can give us all the statistics about your environmental capabilities and cleanliness, and that just goes past their heads. I believe you need to have a massive public information campaign, engage that sector in discussions and show them videos of maybe track the ship through its passages and show that they're not doing all of this. It really needs to happen. We now have some public elected officials who got elected after circulating a petition that had untruths in it about the cruise ship environmental impacts. So we need to counter that desperately. I believe that there's even stronger movement in Juneau. And some of those people have been connected down to Ketchikan and are feeding into that sentiment as well. And there's a de desperate need to address that. I totally agree, and I think we need a definite refresh on a fact-based conversation about what actually is happening on the ships. These are extremely innovative, technolo techn technically advanced uh, systems that we have on the ships. And um, 
So I am hearing you absolutely. I agree that we need to get better and more robust information. We need to do tours on the ships if that's what it takes so people can come in and see how we recycle and see how we treat water. We don't release um, untreated wastewater into the ocean at all. Um, I mean, there's just so many things I could go there and I had to zip through those three slides because I know we were limited to, you know, uh, 10, 15 minutes for the presentation, but I think a good conversation on this, uh, it's, a, it's a topic that deserves its own speech, quite frankly, and, and a campaign like you're mentioning. So I'll bring that back to both Clea and our company as well. Okay, so one more question over here. This is actually not a question, it's a statement. My name's Judy Cushman DeBose, and I am from the smaller state in the lower fort of the United States, Texas, but we are the largest one in the lower 48. So, and I've seen that t-shirt. First of all, Alaska Air, I have gotten spoiled with your service. It is absolutely rock star. And I appreciate and value the fact that I can get from Seattle to Juneau on Alaska Air, but I would like it to be able to go from Houston to Sitka or some, some of the other places. I have had the honor to visit Sitka, Skagway, Ketchikan, and Juneau. This is my third trip to Alaska. I would like to recommend one thing. Do an Alaska shopping mall on the internet. Have your local artisans, your crab meat, your... Senator, it's all of those kind of things you mentioned. I haven't tried the carrots, but all of those kind of things have an internet state of Alaska shopping mall because one of the things I have done is leave many dollars in Alaska and I love it. And when people ask me being from Texas where I would recommend for them to go on vacation when I go back to Texas, I tell them Alaska is my bucket list dream that I've done. But more than that, your people, your resources, your outdoor activities are rock star. You know, I have really enjoyed every bit of the time I've spent in your state, and I look forward to being here again. Thank you, Robert, for including Thrustmaster, and we look forward to working with you and seeing all of you soon. But do an online shopping mall so that people can go just shopalaska.com and make it happen. Thank you, Judy. You know, and Marilyn, I think uh, one, one of the things, I, I think I finally figured out uh, the problem with Alaska Airlines uh, is like 97% of the time, your staff goes so far above and beyond, way beyond uh, expectations to accommodate us and all of our, our whims and wants that the 3% of the time they follow the rules is just so disappointing. <laughs> uh, so thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Thanks for that. Um, and so um, before we do a final word of thanks to the panel and uh, launch you into lunch, which should be forthcoming soon, I just want to take a minute, because you're quiet, um, to introduce uh, the staff and the amazing team that's making this happen. Uh, they had no, no news that it was coming, but um, yes, we'll, we'll, st we'll start with Sarah there in the very back. Uh, so... She's, she's the brain center for everything that happens. Juliana is our, our, our newest uh, addition to the team, and we're so pleased to uh, have her and stolen from the, the governor's office. So uh, we're really pleased to have her part of the team. And <laughs> returning from the last time we had an event, where's Jessica? Uh, there you go. And so I, you know, at my own uh, peril, I, you know, we spoke so glowing of her, and of course it was obvious. Then CBJ goes and steals her and puts her to work at the, uh, the school district. But uh, she came back for a guest appearance and has been a rock star as, as, as usual. Um, and so, but in addition to that, we have uh, a team from JDC here that is helping us. We've got uh, James uh, Control Center here. We've got Robin back there and we're Soren. There you go right there. So um, you've seen them on Zooms, but you uh, haven't seen them with their mask on and uh, in person. So I uh, want to do a shout out there. And then one, one of the greatest additions to our, our team has been the partnership that we have with the Alaska Center for Energy and Power. And Nathan Green, who is a, an engineer and uh, an employee of theirs, has been embedded in the Southeast Conference's uh, office uh, for the past year and has been a, a part of our team. So I hope you get to know them. Uh, this event never happens well in a community without a local planning team. And so we've got, uh, we've got, I think most of them here. So we've got, we got Lee here. We've got Tracy. 
We've got Jam, we've got Diana and Andrew. Did I miss anybody? Steven. And Stephen. I was over here. Where's Stephen? I saw him applauding for the cruise ship uh, uh, announcement uh, that was coming in there. So, uh, you know, collectively, these are the folks that really have made the extra effort to figure out how we can pull this off and do it well, the quality that we need to, the safety that we have to do. So, um, with that, uh, how I think we're just moments away from lunch. Um, and so you'll see that obviously happen unless there's a more uh, immediate word. Um, and so we want to give you a moment to, to, to air out, launch out. But uh, on behalf of our team, thank you, panelists. Thank you, virtual panelists, uh, for all that you're doing, especially, uh, you know, Alaska. And, and ATI, I really appreciate the, the networking and partnering that we've been doing over the last, uh, um, well, for a long, long time, but in, more intensely during this pandemic. And it's... Uh, has brought us together. And for those of you that are here in person, thank you so very, very much. So with that, um, let's uh, air out, wipe down, and uh, ready for lunch. We have the most amazing speaker coming. And it's going to be a real surprise. But uh, we're looking forward to it. All right. Thank you all. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait. OK, I got to turn my failure from this morning into an educational experience. Did you realize that the plates and, and silverware that you used this morning were actually compostable? No, you didn't notice that because you all threw them away in the trash and I'm in trouble. So um, when, when you get done with your lunch plate and silverware, please put those in the compost, even the dirty ones are, are compostable. So please do that. I've been, and the water bottles, the plastic ones, uh, there's a special uh, uh, receptacle, the lids uh, are, Yes, part of the equation, yes. So the lids and bottle can go into the recycle as well. All right, if, if you want to reuse your water bottle, fine, but um, hang on to it and let's do lunch. All right, thanks everyone. <laughs> I think you remember it. Like Good news, there's more food. If somebody just didn't hit uh, the, the bottom of their bellies with, uh, I know some people didn't get a, a full piece. They say they took a half. So, if, you know, but even if you took a whole piece, we'll think you took a half, but there is more food back there. Just leave one for me. And I'm gonna go be there in just a minute and go get that. But this amazing meal, uh, local caterers, and it's sponsored by the folks at Respect. And we're gonna uh, ask them, cause that's a, that's a new name, it's like Respect. I love the name, but I don't know uh, the, the, the company, but we do know the company. They've been around for a long, long time, doing a lot of work in the, the region, the state. And so uh, would you please give a, a warm welcome to our sponsors for the lunch program, Aaron and, I guess Doug's coming up with them. So yeah, yeah, Aaron, yeah. Yes, talk to them. Yeah, I, I know what you're all wor wondering and you're all really worried about it, right? Is that uh, you're scared of the future. And uh, I know why. You're wondering where is PDC engineers? Where do they go? And who are these people that call themselves respect? And what's up with that weird R? It doesn't even like look show up right. Anyway, but I can understand your concern. PDC is or, or was uh, a design and construction service in a uh, company that provided uh, engineering and surveying and construction management services uh, to the Southeast communities uh, for, in Alaska for decades. Uh, well, I'm here to tell you things are going to be okay. In fact, they're even going to be better because in May of 2020, uh, PDC Engineers was added, added to our capabilities and joined with Respect Company. And uh, by January 1st of this year, we'll, our merger will be complete 
and uh, will be fully rebranded as rebranded, excuse me, as RESPEC. Uh, but now with expanded staff and services uh, to complement all of the same great folks you've been working with for years. So uh, once again, PDC RESPEC team is thrilled to be a, a, a sponsor uh, of the Southeast um, uh, Conference and look forward to continuing to collaborate uh, with the communities of Southeast Alaska now and into the future. And uh, st let's see, I can make this. Oh man, look at that. There's, we, I just have a bunch of slides, but here's, here's the key piece here is just, we are the um, infrastructure group of now a large 400 person company that can provide uh, service in a lot of different areas, including mining and energy, uh, water infrastructure, and data management. So if you have any questions on uh, are, are any of those, or any, you know, any infrastructure needs in your communities, please uh, come to me or, or Doug, and, and I'm sure we can help you out. So anything else, Doug? That's good. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Aaron. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And, and they have been around for a while and done a lot of great work. And we appreciate the fact that, uh, you know, we meet face to face twice a year, but our committees carry the work on throughout the year. Uh, we do that do during uh, our Zoom sessions. And we're very glad to have folks like PDC uh, involved with those to help provide their technical expertise uh, as we move forward on our priority objectives. Now, without any further ado, I'm, uh, there's, there's, there's no introduction. Well, if I introduced her properly, there would go the next half hour and uh, we want to hear her remarks. And we're so, so thankful, not just for um, what she does, but for who she is. She is a genuine Alaskan that cares about every aspect and has been engaged on every front uh, and has, has delivered for the region and the state in amazing ways, uh, especially this last, uh, last few months. And so, even though her colleagues think she's back in DC, um, where, where some of them are gathered for work, uh, our, our senior senator has uh, come. She made the journey up with us on the ferry yesterday. And um, I know she worked uh, meeting with folks here locally till the wee hours of last night. And she's back up at the crack of dawn to engage with us. So would you please show our appreciation and welcome Senator Lisa Murkowski. Thank you. So Robert, appreciate the opportunity to, to be here with you and not be with you via the benefit of our technology. And I know we have that option, but for the past, past couple, sessions at least that Southeast Conference has met, I've been participating virtually. And what happens is I get to hear myself talk for 15, 20 minutes, but I don't really get this feedback. I don't get the opportunity to talk to folks as we're getting coffee or as we're sitting uh, gathered here in the morning or in the evening, or even better, coming up on the ferry. So the opportunity to be here with you today has really um, been a blessing to me. And I want to thank everyone who is gathered. I want to thank those who have put this conference on. I want to recognize Robert and his extraordinary team, all acting in a very nimble way to, to respond to how, how we gather now in, in times of, of COVID, um, how we are, how we're doing the business that we need to do in order to not only be Haynes strong, uh, to be Southeast strong and to really be Alaska strong. And I think we are at our best when we are working together, when we are collaborating as communities, when we are collaborating as, as Alaskans. And so the, the opportunity to be together in this, this forum, in this venue is, is really appreciated. I, uh, I'm sending greetings 
from uh, a fellow Southeasterner who loves to come to Southeast Conference and, and share his wisdom, Frank Murkowski. Uh, I woke up in um, mom and dad's house in Wrangell uh, yesterday and dad says, hey, when you go down to South, up to Southeast Conference, I got one message. I'm like, yeah, dad, what is it? Save the damn fairies. So that's the message from dad. So I am, I'm happy to carry that. In fact, the best picture of yesterday was the one that I took on the Lacanti with many of you and uh, sent it back to Wrangell saying, best news, the weather was awful in Juneau and so I couldn't fly. And so as a, as a true Alaskan uh, girl, you get the benefit of the, the transportation system uh, around here. I, I give a lot of speeches in a lot of different places, but I have to tell you, you really feel like you're home when you can be sporting your yellow extra tufts and uh, being ready for whatever comes your way. So I have so much that I wanna share with you today and I only have a half an hour uh, to, to talk about it. But you know, when, when you think about where, where we were with the conversation in, in February, when you had your mid session summit, we were, we were still gripped by, by uh, COVID. Um, at that point in time, the, the response was still really uh, very tenuous, let's just say. Canada had just announced a one-year ban on, on the cruise vessels in their waters. Uh, the discussion was really, really grim. You know, we were talking about how we get through to 2022. And I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're still in 21, we can't be giving up now. But it was really a grim time. And maybe it was because it's February and everything looks dark in February when you're in Southeast, but it was really hard. And when you think about where we are today, we're still not out of the woods, but we should all, we should all have that, that hope that I think we're seeing in these conversations about what we will see with the strength in numbers. And I wanna give a shout out to Melani. I don't see where she is here right now. Um, thank you, Melani, for, for your focus, what you do with Raincoast. They, it, sometimes the numbers are not the numbers that we wanna see. And I have to admit, when you pass that around, I did a kind of a, oh my gosh, because everything was down, down, down. But then, folks, we've got to acknowledge when we're, when we're down over here, how are, we going to, how are we going to be starting to build ourselves out? And so when we understand these numbers, we can work towards these solutions that will, will build that hope, that will allow us for the response. And it helps us build it smarter. So thank you for being honest with you, with us, not sugarcoating it. It's hard right now. It is hard, but we are, we're Alaska strong. We're Southeast strong. We're Alaska resilient. And we're going to climb out of this and we're gonna do it together and we're gonna be better because we've come together as communities. So we've got, uh, we've got more that we're gonna be dealing with, with with COVID, that is just our reality with this Delta variant. And we don't know how long, um, but I think we know that as Alaskans, we, uh, we, we come together with the solutions. I really want to applaud and recognize the, uh, the commitment from the people in Southeast. And when you look at your vaccine numbers, it's, I think it's a recognition that you're saying, look, if, if we want to get through this, if we want to welcome people back, what are we going to do to send that message that it's okay to come back here? Well, when you've got a 63% vaccination rate in, in Southeast, you're sending the message that we're safe, we want you to come back. And so thank you for, for just leading the way there. I think that that truly does make a difference. 
I'll tell you, it's tough around the rest of the state right now. On Friday, Alaska hit a statewide high for, for hospitalizations. We were among the top five states in the country for an increase in hospitalization rates in the last two weeks. That is not where we want to be. So I'm, I am one who says, I'm urging everybody, all Alaskans out there, get your vaccine. Let's get this pandemic behind us. Let's get moving. Let's get focused on the future and, and what, it will, what it will hold for, for all of us. So I think we all recognize we wanna get back to normal. We're not quite sure what's the new normal going to be. We heard a little bit, you know, the cruise industry is looking at this and saying, you know, what is our new normal? Are these protocols, are these going to be things that we're going to be living with? Well, we might not know what the new normal is, but let's, let's try to get back to normal. We're doing that with, our, with our, getting our kids back in schools. We're doing that uh, in a way that we're seeing, again, not only Alaskans, but people around the country wanting to get out, wanting to move, wanting to, to come together. In, in conferences. So let's, uh, let's make sure that we're doing this together. So I'm supposed to give you the view from, from Washington, DC. I had a choice to make. I had a choice to make about where I was going to be this week. We've got, we've got two days of work week back in Washington, DC. Um, it's, we're sandwiched in between the Jewish holidays. And so on Wednesday evening, Congress is gonna be adjourned for another four or five days there. And I could have spent a day getting back to Washington DC and a day getting back here for literally 24 hours in, in, uh, in DC. And I said, you know what? There is more happening in Haines, Alaska right now that is productive and good and strong I'm gonna to choose to be here. So thank you for letting me be in person. So when you look at my voting record, you're gonna see she missed a whole like eight votes on deputy secretaries of under education or whatever it is. I don't even know what it was today, but I wanna give you the, the kind of the update, what's go, what has been going on. We have actually been, been busy in Congress trying to respond to whether it is the impact of COVID around, around the country, around our state, um, but also what, uh, what we've been focused on in, in regards to, to some of the future and what that holds for us. Um, it's been mentioned that we had a good example of, of hope earlier this year when we passed the Alaska Tourism Restoration Act. This was the measure that uh, provides the temporary fix um, to, to deal with the Canadian ship ban by allowing our passengers to, to move between state of Washington and Alaska without stopping in Canada as, as they normally would. You know, this was one, I think, uh, Wendy used the term uh, pulling a rabbit out of a hat. But it's kind of interesting because I said, what are we going to do? Southeast is, is in an awful, awful place right now. They need some hope that there is going to be a return. And we might not be able to deliver a full season, but we've got to demonstrate. We've got to demonstrate that there can be something coming. And what I was told by super great staff that I have, and they're super fabulous. They're like, okay, we can, we can put this measure out there to just let Alaskans know that we're fighting hard for them, but it won't pass. And I said, that's not an option because it just can't be a message that we're working hard, but it's not possible. We have got to prevail. We have got to change this. We have got to get some relief this summer. And so, Melani, I took your charts that showed the numbers in 2019 at 1.3 million passengers and then 2020 at 48. And I used it in everything to anybody. I think I even educated the, the men and women 
who stand guard at the Senate doors. They've got no authority or vote, but I'm like, do you realize what's happening in Alaska? And, and I reminded him that 48 was not 48,000, that is 48 passengers. And people are like, oh my gosh. I was actually sitting on an airplane flight and Ron Wyden had the misfortune of sitting next to me. And I'm going through the Southeast by the numbers. I'm like, oh my gosh, Ron, look at this. And I made him go through the whole eight pages or whatever with me. Long story short, long story short, it was a wake up call to the rest of the country, to our colleagues that, wow, Alaska really got sucked. What can we do to help? And so what we were told was a virtual political impossibility became a, constant, a concerted effort by folks to address this very targeted relief for, for Alaska. And as was mentioned, it was not just the hard work of the delegation. There were so many, the mayors that we heard from, where's Andrew Cremata from, from Skagway, right there, right, you know, too close to me to even see here. But you know, we heard, we heard and we shared these stories about what this meant to be a community where you're losing, what was it, 80% of your revenue from year prior? So it was so important to have these messages from, from you all. We had uh, Russell Dick from Huna Totem who came back and testified before the committee. So what you did, what you did was you pulled this rabbit out of the hat. You you proved that nothing is impossible when we all come together and advocate for, for a, right, a right cause. I, I have tried now three times since November to get here to Haines. And I am absolutely mortified and embarrassed that yesterday when Mayor Allrod Put, picked us up at the ferry. And I jumped in the front seat of the van and I said, Mayor, I'm so excited. I finally made it to Homer. I was like, oh God, the biggest rookie political mistake you can make is when you get to a town and you say the wrong town. So Mayor, you know that it was an H town, at least I got that part of it right. But it, uh, it, it, it was a reminder to me that I, I've, been, I've been shut out of, of, of uh, Haines here because of weather issues. And fortunately, the ferry was there to make sure that weather was not gonna be an issue yesterday. But we recognize that this community has, has really um, seen significant impact. Uh, loss of life, loss of property, and, and the heart of a community really, um, really brought to a difficult place. And so know that by hosting this gathering today, bringing so many friends from around the region to, to the heart of Haines here, uh, to your leadership, uh, to that of the mayor, the community, the assembly, the, the emergency command team, the first responders, so many who have worked so hard to really help bring the community back. Just thank you for all that you have done to, to protect your community. When you speak of, of post-traumatic growth, we know that you will just continue to grow stronger and stronger and, and know that we want to be with you in that. And I think having the conference here in Haines is, is a, a real tribute to this community and what it means to be Haines strong. So to the good people of Haines, know that uh, you have all of us working with you. I think that uh, as, we, as we think about those areas, those um, opportunities for optimism, and I hope we seize on them as opportunities, because we need, to, we need to be able to hold this hope forward. We're going into winter around here. 
and uh, appreciate the fact that the cruise ships are, are going to try to stick it out till October. But we know, I mean, we're from Southeast. We know that it gets kind of snotty here pretty quick. And uh, uh, it's, it's a harder time of, of year. And, and for many businesses, they haven't seen the revenues that usually sustain them. So we're going we're gonna to be going through a little bit of a, of, a, of a slump here until we can come around to spring. But that's what happens every year. And so we will, we will get through this. But we want to be optimistic. And so let me talk about some of the things that I think we have reason to be optimistic about. And I'm going to start with a focus on the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. This is the bipartisan bill that we've been working on. Uh, I've been part of a small group of 10 lawmakers, five Republicans, five Democrats, who came together real early on this, uh, this session and said, wow, the president has this huge, enormous, what he's calling infrastructure, but it's more than just roads, rails, bridges, um, broadband. It is everything that you could possibly imagine, and we just call it infrastructure. And it's, it, wasn't, it wasn't realistic. I mean, in terms of what we were looking at on a price tag, somewhere between six, seven and a half billion dollars on, on, on infrastructure that was just so broadly defined, and I was talking with some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, and I'm like, surely you don't think that you're really going to be able to pass something like this as big as it is. Is there something that we can recognize that we can work on together as an infrastructure bill? Because whether you're Republican or Democrat, we like to build things. We like to build things that are lasting and that are going to contribute to the benefit of all of these local economies. And so what's the federal role in this? Can we agree on what core infrastructure looks like. And so we sat down, five and five, and we usually left the building, we went and had dinner somewhere and just, just talked through all these issues. And we came up with what we could agree was core infrastructure. Roads, rails, bridges, ports, water, wastewater, broadband, and when you don't have roads, what do you got? You have a marine highway system. So it's a great opportunity for me from Southeast Alaska to be able to educate my colleagues on, on what happens when you come from a state where 80% of your communities are not connected by a road. So I like roads, love roads, want more roads, but our reality is an infrastructure bill has to be about more than just roads. And so what does that mean? And we worked together in a collaborative, cooperative way that in and of itself generates headlines nowadays. But what we did is we came together with a proposal. It's about 550 billion over five years. We don't raise taxes. It invests in core infrastructure and uh, and, and really focuses in an area where there is that common ground. And after I speak, we're gonna hear from Garrett and Nils and, and, and John, um, who are gonna be talking about just the actual guts of it, but I'm not gonna leave it all to them because there's so much good in it that, that uh, I'd, I'd like to share with you. But one of the things that I do hope we will have an opportunity to, to share is, there, there are resources coming our way as Alaskans. There are resources coming our way to help us with our ports, with our roads, with our, with our marine highway. There are resources coming our way that will help our communities with, with water and wastewater, with broadband. But how we are gonna gear up to receive it, how we, we ensure that our limited capacity, because we, re we recognize that we don't have great grant writers in every little community. We have concerns about some of the local match requirements. How are we gonna leverage all of this in a way that's going to benefit all of our communities, little and big? And so these are, these are, part, these are so many of the things that we need to be talking about 
not in saying, I wanna get mine for my little community, but how are we as a region, how are we as a state gonna be benefiting from this? So we've got some work to do together on this, but what was fun for me, and it really was fun, I've been, I've been in the Senate now for almost 19 years, which I can't hardly believe because I just, I can't hardly believe that. But when I think about the satisfaction that came from being able to educate other members from around the country about Alaska's unique and specific needs, to, to, to ask for significant plus ups when it comes to water and wastewater, because in so many of our communities, we're not talking about replacing uh, lead pipe systems or, or systems that have been in place for 100 years. We're talking about communities that don't have anything at all. We're talking about communities that lack basic, basic infrastructure. And so there is significant focus throughout this on needs of rural communities and smaller communities. And you will see that throughout. We included a provision that is very Alaska specific. And this is for essential ferry systems. We know what essential air provides for us here in Southeastern and around the state. It's pretty unique, it's not unique to just Alaska Essential Air Service, but we benefit as a state more than any other. So I said, look, we've got communities that will never be connected by a road. We are islands. And so let's look at a program that allows for this essential ferry system. We've worked to not only create new programs, but to make some important changes in existing law that will make more federal funding available for operation and repairs for our ferries. So we've had the ability to utilize federal funds for construction, but we all know that it's not just about constructing the vessel, it's how we're able to, to operate and maintain. And so this is where we need to be working with the state very, very carefully, very closely, and working with the communities as we work to to rebuild, reshape our Alaska Marine Highway System. And I was so encouraged as I was listening to, to Governor Dunleavy's Chief of Staff, Randy Rowell, who is here this morning. I got to talk to him on the ferry uh, quite a bit yesterday. But I'm encouraged by what we're hearing from the state and the steps that they are, are, are taking here. And of course, Robert Venables has been such an advocate for what we do going forward to address the sustainability of this system. But this is, a, this is a system, a transportation system that is gonna be defined by your communities, not just here in Southeast, but, but elsewhere around the state where we have our marine highway system. But I would, I would ask you, lend a sense of urgency to working together to, to reshape, reimagine, because we have an opportunity. We have a window of time right now that I think is unique because you've got, you've got support at the federal side, but I can't guarantee that it's gonna be unlimited, that it will be this way going well into the future. We've got an opportunity right now at the federal side that is unprecedented. You've got a state administration that is making some changes and some reforms. Capitalize on that. Get your communities together to say, we, we need to reshape, reimagine, and, and, and really build out this system. It was a pretty sobering conversation to be on the bridge of the Lacanti coming over here and listening to a 40-year-old captain and a 29-year-old um, first mate who basically said, this was our dream job, but we've already made application elsewhere because 
we just didn't feel like there was a future with our marine highway system. So it's gonna break all of our hearts if we work together to, to build new ships, to kind of reformat, reimagine, and we don't have the dedicated workforce, the men and women that make it all happen. So I'm gonna urge you, um, maybe not as aggressively as my father who spares no words with, with urging forward uh, on the Amer Alaska Marine Highway System, but, but to recognize that our time is now. Our time is now and I'm excited about it and I hope that you are now are as well. Um, one of the other pieces of, of the, uh, the ferry funding that is included in here, I want us to have a marine highway system that not just works for today and the folks that we've got moving around. I want this ferry system to be 20, 30, 40 years into the future. We need to be thinking about what our ferry system means decades from now. And so why, why would we not want to have a system that is, is powered by the rain, by the hydro assets that we have? Electrify our ferries. And so I said, you know, if we're talking the big, big push, big push, we have to electrify all of our buses. That's the, that's the Biden-Harris vision. We're gonna have all these EV vehicles. And by the way, in our communities where we have an abundance of hydro and we're on islands anyway, we should be doing more EV vehicles all over it. But what about, what about the ferries? Why would we not want to imagine into the future? And so we've got, we've got funding, 250 million for an electric or low emitting ferry pilot program. Um, under the terms of the, of the infrastructure deal, at least one pilot program is required, required to be run here in Alaska. So the folks from Skagway, they've been leading the way, talking about what, what's going on. You've got Thrustmaster this and talk to him down in actually the high school students in Sitka that were the very first ones, even before the folks in Skagway brought it up, they were the very first ones to say, how come we don't have EV ferries? And I'm like, I don't know. Um, I think, it's, I think it, is, it is an opportunity for us to be thinking and, and leading in a way that is global and it's not like we're inventing anything brand new here. When you look at the Scandinavian countries, their ferries are, are, are EVs, many, many of them. So we've got some excitement going on there and I hope that you're excited as, as well. Um, our coastal communities need that support on the shore. They need to have the ability to, to house their fishing fleets, to, to to bring in the barges that, that bring the food and the fuel, um, move visitors around. So we've got significant uh, funding, 2.25 billion for port infrastructure development. This is, this is a program that many of our coastal communities subscribe to. Uh, 250 million for remote and subsistence harbor construction. This is going to impact again, many of our, of our ports in rural areas. Uh, funding for U.S. Army Corps uh, Continuing Authority Program, specifically designed, specifically designed to help some of our smaller uh, communities. Um, other things in the in the water space there, not very sexy, I guess, um, but funding for specifically for the replacement of culverts. So when I hear from people in Ketchikan. Um, they're always talking to me about uh, the Schoenbar Creek culvert there and how are we going to be able to, to get that replaced. So, so many of the things that we're working on are, are, are really specific. Uh, here in Haines, a real specific example of, of where you're going to see benefit from this bill is uh, working on the Alaska Highway up here from the border Beaver Creek. Uh, Yukon Territory, down to Haines Junction, the Haines Cutoff. Um, so 
this is going to allow us to, to be able to meet our obligation under the SHACWAC agreement with Canada. So all we need to do now is be able to get people to travel freely. We're working on that. That's, uh, I'll bring that up later. These, some of these things, these transitions are so awkward, but uh, it is, it, it, it is something that uh, on the SHACWAC funding, we've been trying to work that for, for years. On, on broadband and broadband deficit around the state, this was, again, uh, an area where it really helps to educate your colleagues. They're talking about the speeds uh, which, which should be determined to be a minimum. And I just kind of shake my head and say, oh my goodness, that's just like a dream to think that we would have uh, internet uh, at, at those speeds and, and, and abilities. So we recognize that if we don't have the ability to, to, to connect reliably and affordably, um, it's, it impacts everything from education to healthcare to uh, your ability to, to just participate in the broader digital marketplace. So uh, the effort there is considerable. We're, it's a minimum allocation of 100 million for each state. There's a dedicated carve out for high cost areas for broadband deployment, um, additional uh, support for tribes through the Tribal Broadband uh, Connectivity Grant Program, a um, billion dollars for middle mile broadband infrastructure grants. You're gonna be hearing from, from Garrett Boyle uh, here in just a, a bit, but Denali Commission is slated to receive 75 million from the bill. And part of that will uh, be able to help the required matching grant for grant recipients. Um, this is something that I hear from a lot of the small communities about, uh, not just on, on broadband, but thank you for making available funding through uh, various programs. But our challenge as a small community, I heard in Wrangell on, on Monday morning, is how do we meet the local match? And so included throughout the measure, we're, we're working to address some of the challenges that our smaller communities face and, and being able to utilize Denali Commission here is, is going to be uh, important and significant. I can't stand before you uh, without talking about the energy piece and, and what we're doing within this infrastructure bill to focus on, on more dependable, uh, more resilient, uh, cleaner energy. We've got to set aside for small utilities um, this is aimed at preventing outages and basically enhancing resilience uh, of the grid. We've got a billion dollars specifically for towns with not more than 10,000 residents. So it's designed for your smaller communities, but again, focused on, on resiliency, safety, reliability. Um, this, this is gonna go a long ways as we're looking to, to really help facilitate on the on the generation side, the trans, uh, transmission or, or distribution systems, um, and really helping to, to, to upgrade and modernize our, our generating facilities and also developing out our, our microgrids. We included a, a bill that I had introduced. This is the PROTECT Act that provides grants and technical assistance for our small utility providers that aren't regulated by the FERC. Um, to, to address some of the cybersecurity issues. I always like to think that, oh, we're so far away, our communities are so small, cyber is just not an issue. Gone is that pipe dream. Cyber is an issue for everybody. And we recognize that so many of our smaller, um, our, our smaller, smaller providers, it's just so hard to try to address these challenges because those, those resources aren't there. Huh been asked about where we are with some of our renewable initiatives. We got 146 uh, million to carry out hydropower and marine energy research. A lot of this is, is already being tested uh, up at the University of Alaska at Fairbanks. One of the things that we recognize as we try to build out projects in Alaska is it just the permitting process is never ending. And when the permitting process is never ending, that means 
it just adds dollars upon dollars upon dollars. And sometimes it makes the projects just simply not economic at all. So included within the measure, we have a, a permitting reform proposal that I had uh, included, but it, it is specific to critical mineral projects on, on federal lands, whether it's, it's UCOR's um, Bokan Mountain project. But what we've done with this, it's, it, it, they're, they're somewhat modest reforms, but I think that they are a starting point for a bigger discussion on what we can do to incentivize more domestic mining, um, allowing companies to be able to make their way through just this Byzantine complex uh, permitting process in a, in a more efficient manner. Um, we've also ensured funding for domestic critical mineral supply chains to, to boost the use of minerals that are produced here in the United States. We've got funding for demonstration projects to, to boost the domestic processing of those minerals as well. Uh, again, uh, the, the, uh, the folks down in, in Ketchikan are very familiar with the proposal there that uh, UCOR has been working. Um, it was mentioned earlier by, I think it was, it was Lee, um, that we have included funding for um, our public use cabins, um, whether it's construction, reconstruction, operation and maintenance. I, I kept hearing every time I would come back to Southeast, I'd hear from folks about the need to to uh, uh, deal with some of the Forest Service issues. We've got 155 of these public use cabins in the Tongas and um, they're good, they're good. People like them. Let's, let's make sure that we're taking care of things. So there's a lot that is included within this infrastructure bill that I think is significant for, for our state and for this region. We're not over the... Uh, we're not out of the woods yet on that legislation, though. Uh, it still has to pass, pass the House. Uh, Nancy Pelosi, pretty skilled politician in my view. She has her hands full on this one because she has some on the far, far, far left that are saying, we don't want to pass this unless and until you, we get commitment that we have passed this mega, mega reconciliation bill. And then she has her moderates uh, on the Democrat side that are saying, wait, this infrastructure bill is really good. It's really solid. Let's do what the president agreed to do, which is they're not tied to one another. It's already passed the Senate, it passed with 69 votes, which in the United States Senate today is really remarkable. So let's figure out a path forward on this. So They've got a, a vote that is promised on the infrastructure bill uh, on or before the 27th of September. So any of you that have any connections with any member in the House of Representatives, weigh in and uh, let them know that you think that this is important. Um, I think it is important and I think it will be significant for the state of Alaska and all of the United States. Um, this is, uh, this is something that, again, brings hope and uh, what you will see next coming out of the, of, the, of the Senate, at least, or at least the debate out of the Senate, will be on a 3.5 or thereabouts trillion dollar uh, uh, reconciliation effort. Um, in fairness, it's exactly the opposite of what we have built in the Senate with this infrastructure bill that was significantly bipartisan, built collaboratively, and, and again, with a focus on, let's make sure that we are, are spending wisely and, and we're paying for things. You're gonna have a reconciliation proposal that is everything but that. So there's gonna be a lot of fights going on um, uh, with regards to, to reconciliation. In the meantime, we're trying to move through appropriations bills. Uh, we've, we've moved out three so far. Um, big deal, not a big deal because the end of the fiscal year is coming. And so what we're gonna be dealing with is a continuing resolution, lousy way 
to do business, lousy way to, to run the country, but less lousy than shutting the government down. So uh, <laughs> I kind of feel like I'm going into the downer of this speech here after trying to give you all hope, but uh, I'm gonna switch from, from just the political morass of Washington, D.C. And, and share with you some of, the, some of the specific legislation that I've been working on uh, that impacts us here. I've been working with the delegation to correct uh, an inequity that we uh, see as an outcome of, of ANCSA. And this is the five communities that, that were left out of ANCSA, uh, the, the so-called landless. So we've, we've had a pretty strong listening tour around uh, Southeastern here, getting feedback. Um, we heard loud and clear that there is this support to correct this wrong, but also a real desire to make sure that um, access to the land can be maintained. So we're working to fold that into the proposed legislation. Uh, I mentioned to, to Lee earlier, uh, another legislative initiative that I'm working on that's really kind of fun is the Alaska Trails Act. Um, this is in addition to to uh, focus on a, a longer trail. Uh, we're looking to designate the Chilkoot Trail as a national historic trail. This would just be the second one in uh, second national trail designation in, in the state. So looking forward to advancing that. So I'm looking again at the mayor uh, of Skagway here, that, that, uh, that entry point there. Um, I also wanna share with you a a brand new piece of legislation that I've been working on and uh, give you a heads up about this. Um, I mentioned the Alaska Tourism Restoration Act uh, and what that did this summer. Um, I think we did see it, it really was uh, a lifeline for, for our communities here in Southeast that so depend on the, on the cruise, cruise industry and welcoming these visitors every summer. But what happened, what happened last spring should really never have taken place to begin with. Um, PVSA, I believe was well-intentioned. Um, it was designed to protect American jobs and businesses. We get that, but what we saw play out was this unintended consequence of, of putting Alaskan businesses at the mercy of the Canadian government. And we just cannot, we cannot be in that situation again. We just simply cannot. So next week, I'm gonna be introducing legislation that will permanently exempt Alaska cruises that are carrying more than a thousand passengers, exempt them from the PVSA. So what we're looking to do with this, we wanna create jobs for our American merchant mariners in the cruise industry. We wanna ensure that foreign built cruise ships do not compete with US built ships. And so this waiver from PVSA would end once there's a US built cruise ship that carries more than a thousand passengers. I think it's important to, to note here that a US built cruise ship with this capacity has never been successfully completed. The last attempt, there was one attempt, it was the Pride of America. It failed and was sent to Germany to be completed. But we, we, don't, wanna, we don't wanna be in the business where we're competing with US shipbuilders. And so that's why this legislation would end once there is an American market. So, I think this is good news for us here in, in this room, in this region. I think uh, it's welcome news from, from so many who've been really very, very frustrated here. Um, it's probably not gonna be so welcome by some in the, in the lower 48. So I'm gonna need your help in explaining why this fix is needed uh, and how it's going to boost American jobs and help our rural economies. But, but again, I wanna make sure that Alaskans don't, don't ever have to worry about another government shutting down their businesses. So we wanna work on this, we wanna do it with you, 
and uh, we, we've got some, some work there. I mentioned uh, just a moment ago, we've got a lot to, to do yet. We've, we've, got to, we've got to figure out on the, on the border reopening, um, how we ensure that there is that, that flow, uh, whether it is for recreation, whether it is for medical, whether it is for business, um, it is too important to our, our local economies to make sure that our borders with our friends in Canada uh, are, are accessible there. Um, I have talked way, way, way longer than, than I should, uh, but I can't sit down without mentioning the roadless. Um, my personal uh, disappointment with Secretary Vilsack's uh, announcement about rescinding the Alaska exemption for the roadless. Um, you know, we are, we're in a situation now where effectively it's just, it's just a ping pong back back and forth. And when you think about, uh, when you think about what the region needs for economic development, you need some kind of sustainability. You need that level of predictability. And we certainly haven't, haven't seen that uh, over the years. So how, how we address this, um, this limitation, this restriction, so that we can really develop a, a common sense, a durable fix is, is what we will need going forward. Um, we've, got, we've got some other significant challenges with the administration. We're a resource-based state. Uh, we know we have extraordinary resources. We want the opportunity to develop them, uh, but we also accept the responsibility that so many of us, um, it's, it's not just the jobs, but it is it's the opportunity to live in an extraordinary place with an extraordinary environment, uh, abundance of beauty and, and wildlife. And so we've got an obligation to, as we, as we access these resources, we do so with a level of, of, of sustainability and a level of, of stewardship. I don't think any of us are afraid of good stewardship. And so we want, to, we want the opportunity to be able to demonstrate that. I'm going to end my, my comments um, on perhaps a, a different note. And it's, it's certainly far more sober than anything that I've been dealing with because infrastructure and building things, those are things that we, we work through and we work through policy differences. But it has been, um, it has been a, a, a challenging time. Um, as we are, are recognizing the 20th anniversary of, of the, uh, the tragedy, the devastation that, uh, that came to our country when we were attacked by terrorists on our homeland on 9-11. And, and then we have just seen, as we are exiting the longest war uh, that this country has seen in Afghanistan, um, we have seen portrayed across our TVs and uh, through, through the social media, um, some sites and scenes that I think have rattled us all to the core. They certainly have me. And, you know, I think about, I think about all those who have served us in Afghanistan uh, over these past 20 years the lives that have been lost. I think about those service members who were injured um, and those 13 who, who gave, their, gave their lives um, uh, most recently. The, the decision to, to withdraw our troops was one that was made by President Trump when he was in office, said we're gonna come out President Biden says we're going to we're going to withdraw our troops. Um, I was one, am one, who said that there is there is a time when it makes sense to to bring our our folks home. But how we do it matters. How we do it matters, and making sure that we do not leave Americans behind, making sure that we do not leave friends and allies behind. 
simply because we have set a deadline, an artificial deadline. And my fear is, is that our credibility with our allies, those friends, those who look to us and have always said, if something bad happens here, we know the United States is always going to have our back. Well, maybe now some of our friends and allies are worried, are worried about whether or not America is going to have their back. And that's hard. That's hard. It should be hard for all of us. So I, I, I along with so many others, you know, we're calling on the administration. What are we going to do with those who are, are, are still uh, in Afghanistan? What are we going to do to, to help resettle those uh, who we will welcome to, to our country? But uh, I didn't want to, I didn't want to conclude my remarks to those of us who live and work and raise our families in a place like Southeast without kind of putting us into the context of the whole, of, of the fact that we are Alaskans, we are Americans, and we come together during really hard times, some really challenging times, but we are better together. We are better, we are stronger when we are working as communities, as neighbors, as partners, as friends, and as allies. And so I would just challenge us all as we, as we make it through this winter, as we look towards the optimism that next spring will bring, let's use this winter time to connect with one another, to say, how are we going to do this together, because when we do, we're going to be that much better. So here's to Southeast Strong. Thank you for letting me be part of your agenda. Thank you, Senator. Uh, you have, I mean, you have touched every one of us and every one of our communities in meaningful ways, and the extra effort you made to be here is very meaningful. I don't know if um, you ever listen to yourself, but um, you know, one of the final words you gave us at Mid-Session Summit was the charge to take care of each other, be strong, be healthy, and you used the words that became our theme for the annual meeting. You started that. Uh, the, you, those words came out of your mouth, and staff turned to one and says, "That's our theme for the year." So thank you for that. Um, before you leave the stage though, our next panel, uh, I work with the two gentlemen that'll be on the screen quite closely. Um, I have worked with the, the new federal co-chair off and on through the years, but it's been very disconnected. I wonder if maybe you have some insights and you could properly introduce the new uh, federal co-chair for the Denali Commission. Robert, thank you for, for that. And in fairness, I didn't realize that I had helped you with the brand, but uh, uh, I've learned that I uh, can look at good backdrops and figure out a good uh, photo, and maybe now I need to go into the branding sector. So I'll just work with the folks at ATIA and our travel groups. We'll, we'll work on next year's theme together. Um, so the opportunity to, to introduce um, Garrett Boyle is, is a great one for me. Um, I will just share with you that Garrett broke my heart because he came, he came to me, what, six years ago, seven years ago? Seven years ago. And uh, I hired him on. He was a, he was a, a young attorney and um, gave him a great portfolio. And he has moved his way up uh, in the, uh, in the DC office over the years, um, eventually becoming my deputy chief of staff and my general counsel. And um, he acknowledged at one point that he was ready to come home. And this is what I try to do. I try to bring young Alaskans, expose them to the opportunities to 
to get engaged with great policies. And then I expect them all to go back to the state and contribute to the state. But when Garrett said he was ready, I'm like, okay, yeah, we're, you know, yeah. But then what about me? <laughs> you know, who is going to help, help me? Um, because Garrett was not only, is not only um, a, a great legal mind, he has a heart and a passion for, for Alaska. And he spent many of his growing up years here. His dad was a superintendent down in Ketchikan and in parts in Unalakleet uh, and Uzinki, um, several others. But, but, and, but he's also had the opportunity to travel the world and live in different parts uh, of the world. And so through all of it, his heart is here. He understands Alaska in a way that uh, I think is unusual for most of us. Most of us are rooted in one area and know that well, but uh, Garrett has a more global view of Alaska and what its opportunities are as well as its challenges. And, and so when we were uh, looking at the Denali Commission and the recognition that we had an opening as federal co-chair, I really could think of, of no one better than Garrett Boyle to, to take over this position. Having worked at the federal level, having intersected with the state on so many different issues, but being keenly aware of, of the challenges that face so many of our, of our communities, particularly our smaller communities. Um, the Denali Commission is going to be tasked with an extraordinary amount of responsibility. And uh, it is going to require a, a level of, of support and um, management that I think you will be very, very impressed with what Garrett will bring. Sometimes he can be um, quiet and reserved in his words, but it does not mean that he has not processed everything and he's going to, uh, enunciate that to you in a, in a way that's very brief, very clear, and you'll just know it's right. So I am very pleased to, to be able to bring back to the state of Alaska a gentleman who has helped us at the, uh, the delegation level for years, and I'm really pleased that the Denali Commission is in your hands, Garrett. So. Thank you. Uh, well, I think I'll start by saying thank you, Senator, for that very kind but somewhat embarrassing introduction. <laughs> uh, and also thanks for not stealing quite all of my talking points on the infrastructure bill, though I think you got most of them. So it might be even briefer than usual. Um, I think I might, I might pivot from my original remarks here and talk a bit more about the process of this bill. We've heard a lot today about how the delegation kind of punches above its weight. And I think this bill is a great example of that. What the Senate did was take a surface transportation bill that had passed out of the Energy and Public Works Committee, or Environment and Public Works Committee, excuse me, and then a water and wastewater bill that also passed out of the Environment and Public Works Committee. And combine that with a whole bunch of other fun stuff that Senator Murkowski negotiated. But because Senator Sullivan sits on EPW, we had each Alaska senator with a great deal of influence on about half of the bill. And that was just a tremendous show of teamwork and why I'm really optimistic that this bill is going to have good stuff for Alaska in it. Uh, so I think I'll elaborate on a couple of points that the senator mentioned, one being the Port Infrastructure Development Program. Yeah, 2.25 billion is going to get plugged into that grant program. But the language of the bill specifically says that the administration needs to prioritize uh, projects for things like earthquake resiliency, to prevent tsunami inundation, to protect against sea level rise. And I think that's going to be very beneficial for Alaska. I know the administration is also quite interested in port electrification projects. So down here in Southeast, we've got a lot of hydro and you wanna run some electricity to your port to cut down on emissions. I think that's another great part to try to dig into. 
Uh, on the Army Corps of Engineers side, she mentioned the amount of money for the CAP authorities, the small programs. <laughs> the Corps is also getting $11.6 billion for construction funding. And that's a lot of money for them. And so if you've been hanging on to a, a project that you think you need to get done, now's a probably a, a good time to try to make that happen. And there's also $150 million on the investigation side. So if you're a, a town that needs to go out and start planning your project, designing your project, that's another slug of money that's going to be available to you. Uh, one thing I, I didn't hear you mention, Senator, was uh, a lot of money for the Coast Guard. So as we build out our ports and they get better and there's more traffic on the water, improving our Coast Guard infrastructure so they can get out there and patrol is gonna be great as well. Keep our fishermen safe. Um, so I guess I'm gonna dive into things I'm excited about now is in my role at Denali Commission. That is at $75 million in funding. No, we haven't determined how we're gonna spend that yet. I expect Nils and his fellow commissioners may have an opinion or two on how, how they wanna do that. So we'll, we'll dig into it as we go forward. <laughs> uh, but there's also a, an authorization in this bill for $20 million a year for the commission on the transportation side of things. 10 years ago, uh, Uncle Ted was sending us a bunch of money and we got to do a lot of good road projects. That's kind of lapsed in recent years, but hopefully we can get the transportation side of things stood back up and do good work on that front again in the future. And where I'm really, really excited to work on going forward is two pieces that may not be super pertinent to Southeast, but there's 200 plus million dollars for tribal climate resilience projects. That's something the commission has done a lot of work on. That money's going to the Bureau of Indian Affairs, but I think we can work well with them on it and carry it out. And then there's $3.5 billion for tribal sanitation funding. And 2.2 of that is directed to projects that do not meet what IHS likes to call the economical unit cost, uh, which basically means it costs much money for them to actually want to do it. And essentially, if I recall correctly, all of those projects are in the state of Alaska. And the commission plays a little role there where we get to go out and kind of put in matching funds for what IHS likes to call non-eligible costs. And so I think we can make a really significant dent in the problem of not having water and sewer in villages in years to come. I think I'll wrap it with that. All right, thank you. And we'll have questions. Maybe there's a suggestion on how to spend that $75 million. Um, but we're sure. going to uh, also welcome virtually, we've got uh, our, our other two panelists today who will uh, have, have brief remarks, and then we'll take the rest of the time the panel just to uh, ask questions and kind of explore you know, what might be in this infrastructure bill for Southeast Alaska and how to be better prepared for that. Um, so as he mentioned, uh, Nils Andresen, who we, uh, we, we know and have participated uh, back and forth between uh, AML and Southeast Commerce, appreciate that partnership, but he also served as one of the commissioners for the Denali Commission. And uh, he's kind of dug into kind of more of the ARPA side of, of, uh, of what's been passed already, the infrastructure bill uh, has not. But uh, Nils, uh, welcome to Southeast Conference virtually and real. Um, as much as you can blend those two. And uh, thanks for joining the panel today. Yeah, thank you, Robert. And uh, I'm sorry that I couldn't be there with you today. I'm uh, home with a four-year-old who's quarantining and hopefully his nap aligns with my remarks uh, this afternoon. Um, I, I guess, I mean, the, the thing that's important for AML right now is thinking about how to maximize the benefits coming into Alaska such that communities who lack capacity generally are able to take advantage of these opportunities. And, and right now the mismatch between local capacity to, to do that is, and, and the opportunity that's out there with the billions of dollars that are flowing is, is really incredible. Um, when we look at ARPA funds and you know roughly six billion dollars that have flowed to the state since March April timeframe, um, it's it's really a massive amount of money, um, and that much of which has gone to businesses and individuals already. Um, a sixth of which has gone to the state, um, you know, with their uh, one billion dollars. Uh, just. $230 million will go to cities and boroughs in Alaska. And, and keep in mind that only half of that is coming uh, to this year and half next. Um, 
you know, another billion dollars or so to tribes um, and, and maybe twice that. Um, so you've got all these kind of massive infusions of fairly unrestricted funds coming into the state um, and, and overwhelming local governments and others who are try, just trying to make sure the lights are on generally uh, and who you know, really are going to struggle and have been struggling to accommodate uh, the requirements that go through uh, that go with processing those funds. Um, I, I want to note that when it comes to ARPA funds that go to local governments, um, it's not a windfall. Um, and in fact, uh, the state and you know legislative action and, and through the governor's vetoes kind of used federal relief as a reason not to fund things like community assistance um, or to not uh, you know fund school bond debt reimbursement. Um, and those things will have impacts on, on local governments more directly even than, you know, the, the benefit from ARPA relief. Um, so all of, all of that's kind of what we're looking at. AML is supporting local governments and tribal governments and businesses and nonprofits uh, to try to figure out how to, how to work together to uh, make the most of this. Um, and that extends to figuring out grant writing services and technical assistance and uh, making sure all of this information is up on a joint a collaborative effort, uh, the Alaska ARPA.org website. It's kind of a clearinghouse for all this and which will serve, I think, as a conduit for if there's an infrastructure bill, here's how to make Alaskans aware of you know, an additional round of uh, federal infusion of cash that's gonna be really important for on the ground projects. Um, so, Robert, that's what I'm thinking about right now. I, that's probably a lot, but uh, welcome the discussion and Q&A. The other panels we have, John Bittner, and many of you are familiar with the Small Business Development Centers. There's, um, I don't know, seven or eight of them around the state. Uh, John is the executive director of SBDC and has been a, a very significant partner with the regional economic development organizations this past year and a half, uh, helping us uh, really up our game and, and being an effective allies uh, to the business community in each of our regions. So John, uh, welcome and thank you for joining us and insights that you've got on, uh, on, on both the, the current ARPA, the, uh, the infrastructure bill that's on the horizon and thoughts you have on, uh, on those programs, please. Sure. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I apologize again as well for not being there in person. I, uh, I just couldn't make the travel work this time around, but I, uh, I'm bummed I missed out on Haynes and uh, I appreciated all of Senator Murkowski's remarks. I couldn't agree with her more that we're all in this together and the only way out of it is together. Um, a couple of things that I wanted to cover and I had a PowerPoint, but since nobody else did one, I think it'd be weird if I tried to do that now. So I'm just going to, I'm going to uh, sort of describe the data instead of uh, letting you see it in a, in a pretty picture. Basically, to give you a sense of where we are, you have to understand where we've been, right? So since the passage of the, basically the CARES Act, uh, over $14 billion has been deployed in Alaska alone through direct disbursements, uh, special targeted programs, all of the business funding, the, uh, the Paycheck Protection Program, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, all of those things. That is an unprecedented and unexpected amount of federal dollars coming into the economy, into individual bank accounts to try and offset the global economic downturn that we just sort of are trying to transition out of. Now, that was the good news. And that kept a lot of businesses from failing. It kept a lot of individuals solvent. It kept a lot of government agencies and programs up and running and allowed them to expand in a time of difficult you know, financial straits in order to meet the needs that were, were uh, sort of becoming uh, critical as the as the pandemic raged on. Um, and it did what it was supposed to do. If you look at the amount of money uh, that was deployed, it was spread fairly evenly across almost all the different programs, particularly for businesses across the communities. I mean, was it a perfect deployment? No, but again, it was it was an unprecedented amount of federal money and through largely new programs or new avenues. And it did the job. It kept us at least stable enough that as the economy begins to recover, and we started to see that this last summer, we're able and our businesses are able to catch that wave or should be, and we'll be able to get back to some semblance of normal. The difficulty we're running into at this point is a few things. One is 
most of the programs and most of the funding has come to an end, particularly those targeting businesses. There's a handful that I'm gonna talk about at the end here that are still available, but by and large, the largest and most accessed programs have, have sunset. And so if we were to go into a situation where we need that level of support again, unfortunately, it's just not there in the direct targeted business and individual assistance that we had over the last 12 to 18 months. Um, the other thing that we're, we're seeing is that as COVID sort of resurges with Delta, it's having an additional impact on the workforce. And that's something that I think a lot of us didn't expect. So we're seeing indications across a lot of different sectors and a lot of different industries where the employment isn't coming back up to the levels that it needs to be for these businesses to stay open long enough to catch this sort of recovering economy. I'm sure all of you in your communities have seen at least one business, a restaurant probably, or something along those lines, saying that they're not going to be open for their normal hours. They're not going to be open for all of their different food services or even all the days they used to be open because they can't find staffing or they're having logistical supply issues or both. Um, and that's a big concern, uh, at least from the SBDC side, because no matter how well the economy does in general of, of recovering, if businesses can't stay open in order to generate the revenues to take advantage of that recovery, it's almost like it's not happening for them. And again, we're not having as much in the way of individual business support that we did over the last 12 to 18 months. A few things that we do still have or that are coming up on the horizon that I think give us hope that we still have some, some cushion left to get us through the next uh, however long this takes. The state of Alaska has a uh, ARPA funded business grant program that's hopefully coming online here in the next few weeks. It's about 90 million, I believe. And uh, they just um, announced that they've closed the RFP for the grant processor and provider. They're using a third party but that should uh, be able to deploy funding across the different communities fairly rapidly once it launches. Again, this is the second time that the states had to spin up a program like this. And so every time you do it, it gets a little easier in my, in my view. Uh, the uh, EDA also has a variety of, uh, of uh, COVID relief bill funded programs and grants. There's five of them that I think are, are of particular interest. There's the Build Back Better grant, which is for uh, new or existing industry development to try and grow uh, economic development opportunities. The difficulty with this one, it's the larger dollar amount if you win the grant, but there's much fewer grants available. I think they're anticipating somewhere around 60 grants nationwide for phase one, and of those, maybe 20 to 30 are going to get the phase two full funding. Um, it's worth looking into, and if you can put together a collaborative proposal with multiple aspects, I think that's really what they're looking for. Um, many groups working together towards the common good. Um, the, the Travel Tourism Outdoor Grant uh, through the EDA is also an excellent one. It's about $60 million available for our region, to specifically for the tourism, trade, and outdoor recreation industries, which obviously are extremely important, not just in Alaska, but particularly Southeast. This is a fantastic grant, but again, the competition is going to be high. So making sure that you put together the best proposal you can, as well as a, a collaborative proposal that leverages a lot of different players, I think is gonna be the key. There's the uh, uh, RNTA grant, which is a Research and Development National Technical Assistance Grant. And this is for determining the best uh, practices for economic development, growing industries and innovation, um, it's, a, it's another fantastic award if you can get it. And then last but not least, there's a Good Jobs Challenge, which is a workforce development grant through the EDA. And this is more to focus on the workforce issue, which as I mentioned, is still a pretty significant problem here in Alaska. I believe, and I, I think the latest numbers I saw were, were um, about to be updated here in the next week, but we're still about 30,000 jobs under where we were prior to COVID-19. So that's a bit of a problem on top of the difficulty people are having in getting back into the workforce for a variety of reasons. Uh, the other tranche of funding that's still available out there is of course through the Small Business Administration. This is the federal agency that actually uh, created the SBDCs. They have a variety of, uh, of programs still available. The Economic Injury Disaster Loan was recently uh, upgraded. Uh, the limit on that has been raised to $2 million, and this is more of a traditional loan, but the rates are exceptional and you can use it to pay off other debt. So it's a pretty flexible, uh, larger scale. It used to be limited during COVID when they had the most people applying for it 
to uh, 250 to 500,000. That limit's been raised to 2 million and there is funding available in that program. So if you're eligible, it's worth looking into. And then they have their traditional 504 and 7A loan programs. And these are through partnerships with private sector lenders. They're not specific to COVID, but they are available. And the, if your business is eligible and it's a good fit for your financials, it's still an option. Last but not least, um, I just will reiterate the fact that as long as COVID-19 is still a factor, it's going to have a dampening effect on our uh, economy and our businesses. There's just no way around that. Uh, we're going to have difficulty getting workforce back in. As long as that's a, a persistent problem, we're going to have difficulty in our businesses staying open to take advantage of the people wanting to go back to patronizing restaurants, going to healthcare, things along those lines. And so until we can manage to get those numbers down and until we can give workers the security that they need to feel comfortable going back to work, we're going to have difficulty no matter how much the, the basic economy starts to recover or how much the consumers uh, are interested in, in going back to normal in taking advantage of that. And so that's why I encourage everyone to hopefully do what they can to uh, mitigate what's going on with COVID-19 and the Delta variant in particular and whatever comes next. And I look forward to the questions uh, that hopefully will come out of this. Thanks, John. So uh, go ahead and bring Nils back up and we'll open President Scheer has got a microphone around here, but uh, Garrett, the, the, the talk about $75 million, is that like new program funds for projects or I heard the, the concept of matching funds in there. What, what, what is your understanding after nine days on the job of uh, what you've got to work with there? Well, fortunately I'm still on the job with her while that bill was being written. So a bit of insight, it's just additional appropriations for the commission to spend okay. on, on programs. Okay. And um, you've got some great staff there. Do you want to, to point out anyone in particular or talk about your staff while oh, well, you got, got, the, got the mic there? Yeah, uh, so there. Tom Wolf, who's the director of programs for the commission is here. Uh, we'd be happy to chat with anyone and everyone after we're off the stage here. And I promise you, he has a lot more smart things to say about the intricacies than I do. Yeah, and you know, I've worked with uh, Jocelyn on the transportation program, Eric on broadband and Mariculture, and uh, this is a great team there at the Denali Commission. And you know, the process for communicating with the Denali Commission has been very straightforward. And uh, that's one of the things I really appreciate is that it, it's not overly complicated. You've kind of taken a lot of the federalese out of uh, out of the process there um, going forward. Well, while uh, he's looking for someone with a, you know, a community project or question, uh, John, maybe uh, the, the, you know, the Build Back Better program has gotten a lot of attention because they've put big dollar signs, but you just said maybe only 30 projects nationwide getting funded uh, after 60 get looked at. That's not a lot of, of uh, programs. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering, are you aware of um, a lot of programs in the state outside of Southeast? And then I'm going to ask, you know, um, you know, folks in the room and throughout the region to communicate with us so we can try to help pair up, partner, and support uh, the projects that are being put together. But what, John, what are you saying statewide? Uh, I know of at least, I believe, three uh, proposals that are out there. One is focused on the aerospace industry. Uh, one that we're involved in is focused on uh, food manufacturing and logistics, and there's a third one that I'm not as familiar with, but that I've heard is, is being uh, worked on as we speak. Uh, and one is, I think, it has uh, some outdoor recreation and tourism. Is that a, would that be a fourth one, or is that the third one? Uh, that's that's uh, that would be the fourth one, actually. I forgot that there there was that uh, proposal as well, though I'm not sure if they're going to pivot to the tourism grant after speaking with them recently. Okay. All right. And then I think there's been discussions with uh, with JDC about uh, potentially a fifth one uh, with some regional partners, uh, with some Juno-centric projects, perhaps. Um, but there's been a lot of discussions throughout the region. So as you can see, you, the strength is in networking and putting things together. So uh, that's that's one of the reasons we're here is to you know, make one another aware of how we can support each other, but also how we can collaborate in order to get that scoring up because there's only gonna be a couple of really, I think, um, well-funded projects for that particular program. But questions in the room about the infrastructure bill or maybe the ARPA funds that are supposed to be coming in. It sounds like most of those funds, Nils, are being used to backfill existing programs, you know, prior pandemic, through the pandemic, um, not really any any new new funding, just trying to help contain the the bloodletting at the local level. Is that correct? Um, 
yeah, it really varies by community. Um, and, and so it's, it's not going to be the case that everybody just uses it to, to backfill, even, even for those who need that most. Um, I would imagine that there are some community projects that move forward. Um, I mean, I, I think I've seen Fairbanks, uh, North Star Boroughs plan, and it's almost all kind of capital improvements, maintenance uh, types, type projects. Um, so I think you'll probably see a mix, um, even even if even where the need is greatest to to backfill revenues. I, I think local governments are going to be responsive to community needs, and and there's there's plenty to do with with that level of funding, um, and that's just for the local government side. So also think about the collaboration that tribes can have with you with cities. Um, there can definitely be partnership there to leverage kind of. A, additional funds. Um, and there, I mean, there's still additional rounds of ARPA funding that will go out to cities and boroughs, uh, even in the coming month or so. Um, so we're, we're still waiting on some additional uh, buckets of, of ARPA funds to flow. Okay. And as far as the CARES program from the last year, are those totally expended and well spent and gone or are some of those still lingering funds to be expended? They are, of course, well spent, uh, Robert, very carefully, uh, responsibly, steward, stewardly uh, spent. Um, there's still CARES Act money to be spent. I think, uh, I forget what the tally was, maybe 8 million that hadn't been claimed yet as kind of for a number of communities, maybe 30 million total um, between all the different uh, kind of closing out that needs to be done. Um, and so we're reaching out actively to all those communities. It's 30,000 here and a million there. And um, all of which is gonna need to go uh, out by the end of this year and consistent with um, treasury guidance. Um, and all of that same thing will be true for Alaska Native corporations who receive their CARES Act money late because of the, uh, the, the court case uh, related to that. And um, John, you know, you've got, you've got SBDC network uh, through Southeast. How's the best way to, for folks to connect with you? Yeah, I, I highly recommend uh, anybody that's interested in partnering with us uh, can reach out to me directly, uh, jon.bittner, B-I-T-T-N-E-R at aksbdc.org or through our website, aksbdc.org. Uh, all of our contact information is on there. I also highly recommend uh, anybody that's interested in supporting lo by local initiatives or, or similar programs in your, um, in your communities. We have the Buy Alaska program, which is a fantastic partnership of several dozen organizations, communities, chambers of commerce, things along those lines. Uh, FedEx is a partner, ACS is a partner and they provide uh, services and discounts to uh, businesses that are part of our directory. It's all free for businesses. We've partnered with organizations and communities all over the state to help them either launch, grow, or um, develop by local initiatives. This is really how we're going to recover, I think, is really getting Alaskans invested in Alaska uh, on the grassroots level, and then uh, using that to sort of expand and grow on the economic growth now that the federal dollars, at least for the direct business disbursements, are starting to decline. We really need to make sure that we save as many businesses as we can, because for everyone we lose, it'll be 10 years before we come back. Okay, thanks. And uh, Garrett, what, um, what's the best approach for communities and folks that want to access um, and help you out with that 75 million? <laughs> Uh, we're on the, the web, Denali.gov. You can look at me, you can look at Tom, you can look at everybody else on the staff by program and issue area they want to handle. So come look us up and let's have a chat. Okay. And this is your first official uh, event as federal co-chair. I've been on the job for two weeks and two days now. So Excellent. All right. Started. Well, I think we really appreciate you uh, making, making that effort to be here and seeing firsthand what some of the, the needs are. You know, Southeast Conference, our chair for economic development committee is Caitlin, um, and she will be communicating through the committee work as we're pursuing some of these projects. We've got our partners, uh, I call it the cousins of the cause. There was JDC, right? We're on the same building, so we're communicating. Their team is here as well. And as I mentioned earlier today, we are looking to see, uh, you know, how we can line up some 
four or five different projects in Southeast that were tourism related in infrastructure to help uh, move some of those forward. So as we have more information, uh, we're certainly going to network with all of our partners and all of you throughout um, uh, the days ahead as we see what actually gets passed for the infrastructure bill and how these programs evolve um, in, in states, uh, through the state of Alaska, through the Denali Commission. And we've got a question over here, um, Jody. Do any of you have funding for small salmon friendly run of the river hydro? <laughs> Please. If, if nothing, she's relentless until you say yes. That's what shuts her up. You got to just say, here's the check, Jody. Uh, I don't think I the check. <laughs> <laughs> but I can say uh, putting a little bit more money into renewables is something I'm hoping to do with the commission, of course, subject to agreement from the commissioners and uh, the administration to a certain degree. But come talk to us about that and let's see if we can work on something. And I think said commissioner had a comment. No, you box a little. I was just going to point the finger that somebody else probably did. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I um, want to thank you all for being uh, part of the panel and helping us showcase uh, these resources that, you know, we are going to certainly uh, access to the maximum possible uh, amount we can for, for the region. So um, we've got another, two more uh, panelists that's going to be appearing virtually. So we'll say uh, thank you to uh, John and to Nils and to uh, Garrett as well for uh, uh, helping us see through this stuff. Thank you, everybody. So coming up next, we have uh, two two individuals that were that were, had hoped to be here, but um, for various reasons, and there's lots of them, um, got sidelined at the last minute. But uh, we're willing to appear virtually. So uh, we've got both the uh, the Region Ten uh, Regional Forester for the U.S. Forest Service. Uh, oh, that's um, hmm. that's that's a, we work on that. Oh. <laughs> Oh, well, Dave, uh, welcome. We've got you uh, upright and, and, and lined out nicely. Uh, we're still trying to uh, there we go. jump with the commissioner. There she is. <laughs> okay. Well, welcome to the both of you. We're really uh, glad to hear from you as you know, we're, we're taking a look at both the, you know, the, the big picture and then in other panels where we'll dig into some of the details uh, with some of the other uh, staff and panels that we, we've got lined up throughout the day. But Appreciate you both taking time to, to join to join us here. Um, we on the agenda is no particular order, but we have Commissioner uh, Corey Feige listed first. So we'll uh, uh, go for her remarks and then hear from uh, Dave and then uh, take some questions as well from the floor. But uh, you know, the commissioner who did address us, uh, I think at our last meeting, which was uh, sadly two years ago, uh, but yeah. uh, it was a, a joy to have her there. And uh, we really um, appreciate you being here virtually, even though you can't make it here. But she has been a long time veteran in the field, both uh, in, uh, you know, accomplished in her own way as an engineer and geophys geophysicist, I think it is. Yeah, that um, is. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but um, so anyway, we're glad to have you online. Uh, tell us what is happening as far as you know, the, the title for the for this session is Natural Resource Policy and Regional Economic Roadmap for Southeast Alaska. So yeah. what do you see in our future as our folks are getting a little bit um, uh, refreshed in the back there? And I'm sure it'll be quiet enough so they can all hear you. So that was just a free editorial for the room. <laughs> and uh, Commissioner, <laughs> welcome and thank you. Well, thank you. And I'm so happy to be here with you all. And I have to tell you, I think that these, these inclusive virtual slash in-person panels are a pretty phenomenal outgrowth of what was pretty awful experience with the COVID pandemic. I think we learned how to come together and share ideas and communicate and stay connected. And I think the fact that we're continuing to use them is a phenomenal thing because getting the message out is what's most important. And I also wanna thank John Bittner for guilting me into not trying to throw my slides up on the screen. I mean, given that I came out 90 degrees askew, it wouldn't have been good. So I'm just going to, to just work from my notes and I can absolutely, Robert, make slides available later that just sort of pretty graphically present what we're gonna be talking about. But 
as I look at various regions around the state, and in particular Southeast, I like to look for what I call resource hotspots or, or those hotspots that are really gonna be driving the economy and, and driving development and employment, which is particularly important as we just heard um, post COVID. And certainly when I look at Southeast Alaska, um, there are there are three big hotspots that I'll talk to you about today. One that I'm just gonna intro with, and then I'm gonna set aside because Helge Ng, who is our new state forester and director of the Division of Forestry, is gonna be on the panel on Thursday with uh, Tessa Axelson from AFA talking specifically about forestry. I will just say that from the administration's perspective, having not just a surviving timber industry in Southeast, but a thriving timber industry in Southeast is the goal of this administration. And so you'll hear a lot from Helge on Thursday about things that we're doing um, in Southeast in particular, and then other places around the state as well to really make that a reality. Um, the three other hotspot areas that I wanted to talk to the group about today, First of all, obviously aquaculture. It's a big growing industry in Southeast. And when we look back from 2018 to today, the amount of acreage that is held under aquaculture and, and aquatic farm leases has tripled. So we're up significantly in the number of active farms and that, that acreage piece is, is really growing and growing very rapidly. The industry got a real shot in the arm with the passage of Representative Story's bill, which was a House bill, I think it was 115, last session. Governor passed or signed that rather on the 15th of June. And so starting tomorrow, September 15th, DNR will be able to issue farm lease renewals rather than having to go back through the whole application process as we were forced to do until that statutory change was made. So looking toward the 15th of September, DNR's team internally has been working on prepping the new decisions, getting all of that basic work done so that we can roll those out just as quickly as possible starting after, uh, after the 15th. So when we look at aquatic farms across not just Southeast, but the state, First thing I wanted to point out, and you guys all probably know this, two of the largest aquatic farms in the state reside in Southeast Alaska. We've got, um, what is it, Silver Bay Seafoods and, and the other one, if I can read my thing here so I get the name right, Premium Aquatics, both in Southeast and both in that range of 100 to 200 acres per farm size. So the farm size is growing and that's important for really driving that industry and, and really making it viable and impactful. Statewide, DNR has six applications for farms in that 100 to 200 acre size and two more of those are gonna be for farms in the Southeast. With the Biden administration, and we've talked a little bit, we've heard references to this earlier today, there is a focus obviously on decarbonization and on renewables and on carbon offsets. And as a part of that, I believe that Southeast Alaska really has the potential to attract and retain investment in very large blue carbon capture projects. The state has already been contacted by one company, a firm called Kelp Blue, which is scoping areas for uh, a kelp farm, a blue kelp farm for carbon offset that's on the scale of a thousand acres or more. So these are very, very large, a full order of magnitude over what we're doing presently. Their scoping is in early stages, but we know that there are other companies out there as well that are doing this kind of work. They're trying to offset carbon footprint and, and uh, carbon operations footprint for big tech firms. Google, Amazon, others. So I think uh, Southeast Alaska is, is really uniquely positioned to try to capture some of that and recruit some of that investment and really grow the business. The other project that we've got out there that DNR is currently engaged in with our sister agencies at Fish and Game and DEC is what is NOAA's Aquaculture Opportunity Area Program. So the state has indicated that we are interested in participating in this program and our nomination has been put forward and now we're just waiting for NOAA to get back to us with a decision. What this program will do is help the state to survey and identify areas that are suitable 
for, uh, for aquaculture, mariculture, aquatic farming, all of the above. And so it will provide additional resources and help us fast track, if you will, the identification of areas uh, around Southeast and, and other coastal areas in the state for specifically aquaculture. And it's important to note that from, from the state's perspective, we're always cautious when we examine these kinds of programs because we need to make sure that no federal program is going to place a designation on, on state lands or state waters and create you know, challenges, roadblocks, or any kind of hindrance for Alaskans to access and use our uplands, our submerged lands, our tidelands, et cetera. And one of the things that we really like about NOAA's project is that it makes, this program makes no designations at all. Uh, and so we're very excited to see what, what comes of, of that program. Um, um, the, the woman who asked the question about hydropower, I think I know exactly which project you're talking about. And hydropower is the second hotspot that I see in Southeast Alaska. And I realize that hydropower is probably more Curtis Thayer and the Alaska Energy Authority's bailiwick, but I wanted to bring it up here because there are some phenomenal projects that are, are coming online now and that are just on the horizon. And I wanted to, to let Dave know and, and his colleagues at, at um, USDA were well aware that Forest Service and USDA are making grants available for small community hydro projects throughout the Tongass. Tongass and that's a, that is a really good thing. And we're very, we're very supportive of that. Anything that regionally, and this goes for Southeast in particular, but any place in Alaska, any, any kind of activity that's going to drive power costs down is gonna markedly improve economics for developments of any kind. Small business, your local family household, um, as well as large industries. And so diversification of power through hydro and divesting ourselves of diesel generated power, I think is critically important to driving that cost down, improving the economic footprint, really kind of modernizing the way we generate power and then generating efficiencies in power that make our communities more secure and give us more resilience at that community level as well. All of which are, are critical, especially now as we, as we come out of COVID. So there are just a small handful of those hydro projects that I specifically wanted to call out and share some metrics. The first one is the Gunnock Creek, which I'm sure you all will know outside of Cake. This is a 500 megawatt capacity project that came online in late 2020, I think in the fall. It, will es it is estimated that it's going to, once it's up and running full, offset 120,000 gallons of diesel annually. That will be the diesel that's used to generate 55% of the local power generation. That's an enormous offset. And it's got, it's got the, the collateral benefit of providing an increased and reliable water supply to the Gunnett Creek fishery. So it's those kinds of products or projects rather that, um, that are really good for the region and they're good for power costs and good for the community. We've got three others that are proposed and in various processes or various stages of the permitting process. And collectively, they're going to offset just about 3.2 million gallons of diesel. We've got Sweetheart Lake about 30 miles to the south of downtown Juneau. That's gonna be about 20 megawatts. That one alone is gonna offset 2.8 million gallons annually, and it'll increase power in the Juneau area by 25%. The Thayer Creek project near Angoon, this one, just an 850 kilowatt project, but is gonna result in a 41% reduction in electric costs in the community. And then lastly, Crooked Creek and Jim Lake, which is the run of river hydro with the storage at Jim Lake, that's gonna provide 90% of the Elfin Cove community service needs and offset about 15,000 gallons of diesel. All of that comes together to drive those power costs down. And when power costs come down, the, the economics of any business, any household, and industries like the mining industry, which is incredibly critical to Southeast Alaska. And I frankly, from a geologic perspective, believe we've only begun to scratch the surface in, in what there is to be found in Southeast Alaska and developed. And I think we're gonna see Southeast Alaska grow in terms of being a critical asset, 
not just for Alaska in terms of mining, but for the nation as well, because of the critical minerals and the rare earths in the area. Uh, in 2019, most recent statistics that I have, and these endured through COVID, we had about 934 mining jobs in the Southeast region. That was up 5% over 2018, and it constituted about a $95 million or so payroll on the year. So none of those operations shut down because of COVID. They all stepped up, you know, developed mitigation plans and really got very thoughtful about how they're moving their people how they're, they're cohorting people uh, and in the work environment uh, and have just done, I think, yeoman's work on, on managing the pandemic. Both Greens Creek and Kensington are now moving into expansion phases. Um, both of them have st had steadily increasing production since 2018, and that's very exciting for the region. Um, I think that, that in terms of exploration projects, in 2021, we've really seen a resurgence in that. You know, in the Haines area itself, we've got the Constantine project there at Palmer. They have a budget, I think, this year of almost $9 million uh, for exploration drilling and for geotechnical drilling and continuing to advance that project. Down at Niblack in Southern Southeast, uh, Black Wolf Copper and Gold is advancing their underground drilling program at the Herbert Gold deposit with, and that is a, a company called Grande Portage, which you guys probably all know well. Um, they are planning up to 24,000 feet of additional core drilling this year. So everyone's trying to make up for a little bit of time lost in, in 2020. And then at Helm Bay, we have Agnico Eagle, who is actually now doing some early stage exploration drilling to test targets that were defined through their geological and geophysical uh, field season in, in 2020. And then I think what I think is exciting for not only Southeast region, but is gonna have implications from Southeast throughout the rest of Alaska and perhaps even throughout the Pacific region is the work that UCOR is doing to continue to try to advance their strategic metals complex to be placed in Southeast. We had an update from them, I want to say about a week and a half ago, where they talked about the new extraction technology that they're looking at. And this is very high tech. It addresses a lot of the environmental considerations for those kinds of processing operations, uh, making it almost a closed loop kind of system. And I think it's going to be a phenomenal addition to Southeast. And I think it's got implications for the rest of the state because we will now then have a facility within Alaska that can process rare earth ores that can be sourced from throughout the state, as well as ores coming in for processing from around the Pacific region. So a lot of really exciting developments coming on the mining. And then lastly, we have to we can never, and I have a great slide that I wish I could share with you, but I'm not going to try. Um, we have always got to think about the land holding position in Southeast Alaska, especially when we're talking about economics and when we're talking about, about generating, you know, activity in the economy. About 73% of the land in Southeast Alaska is held by the U.S. Forest Service, and it's another 13%, I think, uh, that's held by um, the National Park Service. And so it's important that we have a really good working relationship that's going to allow us to have a thriving timber industry, that's going to allow us access to connect our communities and develop those local and regional power supplies, and then to access our minerals and make those minerals available, not just to, you know, to the state, but the mineral resources that we have in Southeast have a national significance. And again, that's that critical mineral uh, component and the rare earth component as well. So I really look forward to continuing to work with Dave and his colleagues at uh, USDA, and then you'll hear from, uh, from Director Ng on Thursday and Tessa more on what we're doing for Vision Timber while we uh, work out a plan for the Tongass in conjunction with USDA. So at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Dave, or possibly, I guess, um, Robert, we can have some questions if you'd like to do that first. Great. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, well, I will say we do have Mariculture on our agenda for tomorrow at 2.15 if you have an opportunity to uh, 
So I understand, where's Helgi? Uh, she, where, where, where is he? There he is, okay. Just uh, we'll look forward to hearing from him on Thursday morning, but uh, since she gave a shout out, I want to kind of put a, a name to the mask there. So um, <laughs> you, can, uh, you can look him up as well. So next we're going to hear from uh, Dave Smith, who is no, uh, no stranger to this, this group in this region, Region 10 Forester, um, 22 million acres of joy. And, uh, you know, our discussions over the last year, you know, really revolve around how do we make this forest a multi-use uh, in, in so many different sectors depend on the forest. And so uh, just glad to be able to uh, have continue that conversation here at Southeast Conference. Dave, uh, thanks for, for beaming in and uh, the floor is yours. Hey, thanks so much, Robert and, and others uh, for uh, accommodating me here today. I, um, uh, I, I really was bummed when I was unable to travel with y'all up to um, uh, Haines here. That is one of my favorite places in Alaska. Uh, and it's great to share the, um, uh, the screen, I guess not the stage here with Corey, uh, because we do have uh, such common and, uh, uh, interest here and, 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 and how we're going to move forward here. And so, you know, it's been about a year since I think I was able to um, talk to this group last and, and with an update on the forest services work in Southeast and Robert's right, you know, we talked about working forest. We are a multiple use agency and, and, and how we move forward together with all of our partners and, and, and other agencies. But uh, uh, as, as you are all aware, a lot has changed in this last year, uh, not just COVID and, and things, but uh, we've had a national election. Um, we have a new administration We've got a new secretary. Actually, it's uh, it's not a new secretary. It's a different secretary. Secretary Tom Vilsack is back here after serving eight years in the Obama administration. And so he did get very familiar, not when he first started, but over time with the Forest Service, our mission, and uh, looking forward to uh, working uh, uh, under, under his leadership here within the uh, Department of Ag. Uh, we also have a new chief of the Forest Service here just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm just absolutely delighted. Uh, Chief Randy Moore is a good friend and uh, a mentor of mine for many years, and I really applaud uh, his leadership and willingness to step up at uh, a very difficult time across our, our country here. If you're uh, watching the news in the West on our landscapes and fire and, and things here as well in Alaska. But, um, but I gotta say, uh, I heard and uh, really appreciate the Senator's remarks here as well. Um, and can't thank her enough for uh, the way that uh, she can represent Alaska, Southeast Alaska, uh, and will help all of us here, especially our agency, USDA, when we look at, they'll talk a little bit about um, the infrastructure bill, but there are, there are parts and pieces there that are, are going to uh, help Southeast. And, and for, I think I met most of you, I can't see you today, but um, you know, it's been my honor to come back to Alaska. I spent uh, well over 25 years now living and working in, in, uh, in rural and coastal Alaska. And my commitment has, has truly been uh, to the communities, especially the small communities, but all the communities in, in Southeast and, and, and in South Central Alaska. And so uh, while we're going through change again, um, you know, we keep, uh, we keep old Gifford Pin shows uh, famous quote in front of us for our agency, and that's that we are gonna to try to manage our, uh, serve our communities and manage our forests, you know, for the greatest good, for the greatest number over the, the long haul here, the longest time. Um, I will just catch the policy a little bit here. I think that was part of our, our talk, uh, 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 the presentation this afternoon. Of course, the first day in office, President Biden set, uh, set some uh, pretty broad priorities for this administration. Um, those were uh, certainly COVID, which has been front and center. It was how, how we respond to COVID. Uh, the, the next here was advancing uh, racial equity. And, and certainly um, here in Alaska, when we look at some of the underserved communities and populations that, that we have here, that's, that's front and center. Of course, uh, supporting economic recovery. And that's what we wanna talk a lot about today here, uh, as well as tackling climate change. Um, we've taken these, the department, the Forest Service, uh, we're trying to align, you know, with these national priorities. Uh, most, in, uh, most of our work here in Southeast Alaska um, uh, to deliver on these priorities will be through a new uh, Southeast Alaska sustainability strategy. This was announced by Secretary Vilsack here back in July. 
And um, there's, there's a couple of pieces to that. I'd like to just take a little bit of time to, 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 uh, to speak to those here today and then maybe have some discussion with folks. But, um, uh, you know, this strategy is, is implemented to uh, support a diverse economy and really try and enhance uh, community resilience and as well as conserve natural resources. And there's, there's really four parts to it. Uh, everybody, not everybody, many people jump uh, to different parts. One of those is, is, um, um, uh, is identifying uh, the investment part of that. I'll, I'll, I'll get to that toward the end. But uh, the first piece was, it was a proposal to uh, restore the 2001 roadless rule protections. And uh, we've heard from the Senator. And I think every time I've addressed uh, Southeast Conference, this has been on the agenda. It's been on my agenda since 2000 when I was a ranger uh, back in Thorn Bay uh, on Prince of Wales. Um, and so they are proposing, uh, um, I'll, I'll get in a little bit. Uh, the other one is, uh, uh, as well was to end large scale old growth timber harvest uh, on the national forest and really refocus um, some of those efforts or a lot of those efforts around forest restoration, uh, recreation, climate resilience and, uh, and, and uh, develop a sustainable young growth management here well into the future. Um, another piece of this, as I said, was identifying near and long-term opportunities for investment uh, that reflect these diverse opportunities and needs uh, within the region. Um, and then I think the fourth uh, component, uh, which we have been working closely with, was engaging in a real meaningful consultation with tribal governments and Alaska Native corporations. Um, so let me just uh, dig into those a little bit here. Uh, the roadless uh, component, um, you know, as, as I shared, uh, USDA is proposing to repeal or replace the Alaska roadless rule, which uh, exempted the Tongass uh, from the 2001 rule. As the Senator said, this has ping pong back and forth for quite some time. Uh, this proposal is, um, is pending uh, uh, federal register notice. We expect that to happen. Uh, it's on the regulatory agenda uh, with a public comment period uh, expected later this fall. Uh, I'm uh, assuming somewhere in late this month, but more likely into October where we'll see that uh, announced. And then, but I did wanna to speak that throughout the Alaska rulemaking process here, you know, I'm continuing to review and make decisions on projects that are allowed under the 2001 rule. And those include mining, hydropower, uh, inner ties, other activities. There are, there are a number of, of perceptions and, and, and thoughts around the roadless rule, what it does, what it doesn't do, but it does provide these exemptions. And uh, uh, Corey brought up a couple of mining, really important to our economy here locally. Just the last two decisions that um, uh, I've been able to make here or approve, one was Herbert Glacier, the exploratory work that's going on out there, which is, is important and, and, and even more so maybe at Kensington Mine with the expansion of their tailings um, into roadless areas. And so, so those will provide for uh, some road development and, uh, and uh, timber harvest as required to, uh, to meet the uh, objectives of those projects. Um, you know, since 2001, we've had over 60 project proposals uh, that have come in uh, uh, that include allowable timber harvest and some road construction in inventory roadless areas. Um, these have all been reviewed either by uh, my position here, the regional forester, the chief or the secretary of agriculture and all of those projects have been approved uh, to date. Um, I know there are some other projects that may not have gotten to that formal proposal stage and some others that may have been uh, interpreted a bit differently by other uh, folks, my predecessors, but um, uh, to date, um, those have all, um, have all been approved. Uh, the other component talked a little bit about around natural resource management, uh, ending um, the larger scale uh, old growth harvest on the national forest system. Uh, and again, refocusing uh, uh, those efforts uh, to support forest and habitat restoration recreation, climate resilience, and uh, again, a sustainable young growth management. Um, uh, there is going to be an, a lot of emphasis around increasing the pale and scale, uh, pace, pale, pace and scale of uh, restoration and, and really leveraging resources across partners, federal agencies and tribal nations. Um, we're also really looking to improve and increase federal access, uh, access to lands that, um, 
that will aid and, and help and assist here in business uh, economic recovery. And, and one of the areas that I've put a lot of focus around as well, and we will continue, is how do we modernize and, and can, how best to modernize the tools to increase efficiency in our uh, managing our outfitter and guide services. Uh, most of the uh, folks, whether you're traveling on a cruise ship, uh, visiting Ketchikan, Juneau, um, uh, elsewhere in Southeast, they, they visit, they see the forest through our, our special use uh, permittees, our outfitter guides, our concessionaires, and and that process, we are looking to add capacity and, and also at the same time, uh, really uh, look to um, reduce some of the burden and, and create uh, efficiencies uh, around that. Uh, we are going to continue. Uh, we are not ending all growth by any means. Um, we are continuing to support small and micro sale old growth programs uh, here across the uh, Southeast Alaska, while there are not a lot of volume associated with those, they do provide opportunities. Um, I think we had seven or had 11 sales last year um, in this arena. Uh, we're, we're looking at 15 to 18 um, sales as well this year. And again, those are to uh, a number of businesses and, and several small communities as well that do provide uh, uh, jobs. Um, really going to be working across the land ownerships here to uh, integrate some of the co-intent of the ecological restoration and the community uh, economics here, uh, helping to drive that transition to a predominantly young growth forest. Um, currently working with, uh, with Helge uh, here, we just met yesterday as well with the state of Alaska uh, at DNR, as well as uh, with Sea Alaska Corporation and a variety of other partners uh, here, especially with the Tongass Forest and the timber industry to, uh, uh, to um, uh, develop that strategy, develop a plan so that folks can invest in the long-term future and have some type of assurance that, um, that there will be a, a, a young growth uh, program here in the long haul. Uh, I will also uh, uh, share that we did just uh, complete the uh, mental health trust land exchange here over, uh, took uh, quite some time, but we did finalize that. We are still uh, uh, just finishing up some of the road access and that uh, while some of the old growth that uh, we have been trying to uh, um, uh, develop here and, and sell off of federal lands, uh, that has been a challenge as most of all of you are aware, acutely aware um, that uh, this may provide uh, some opportunity there as well uh, as part of uh, uh, developing some of that old growth bridge. Um, next area I talk about was the investment. A lot of folks jumped to that. Um, guided, uh, you know, we have pulled together a USDA team. We've been charged with doing that. I think um, that USDA is uh, certainly the Forest Service, uh, um, the uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service, NRCS. I think I saw Keith Perkins on here from Rural Development, certainly a big player uh, in the steering uh, committee, but we pulled this team together uh, and have been tasked here in the very near term to identify locally driven priorities um, where, where USDA uh, has uh, the ability practicable ability to develop and, you know, and deploy this investment, you know, of up to $25 million. Again, I say this is a, this is the near term um, investment that we were uh, charged to move forward with. And over the next 30 days, uh, this team that's been pulled together is going to be meeting, consulting with tribes, uh, corporations, uh, meeting with Alaska, uh, key stakeholders here uh, in Alaska, and, uh, and also taking input from the public to help uh, inform recommendations for the secretary. Uh, we hope to have these recommendations uh, by early November back to the secretary uh, for funding immediately. Um, I recognize some of this is happening at the same time we're here together, or you all are at Southeast Conference. Um, uh, we do have uh, some outreach sessions scheduled for tomorrow. We'll make sure that there's links to those recorded sessions. And I encourage anyone here, any folks here, we will be reaching out to you, but don't hesitate to reach uh, uh, to us uh, directly. We'd like your inputs uh, and thoughts online. And uh, also um, we're certainly offering to meet, uh, the team would be happy to meet with any of you. Uh, as well. So we will uh, be extending those opportunities. Um, and then really even greater opportunity, we've been talking a lot today about the infrastructure uh, 
um, uh, bill that's pending in Congress. There is uh, a lot of potential here through USDA uh, to, uh, again, help um, uh, support the communities, support the goals here Southeast as well. Um, I would also say, we doesn't mention today here, but the America Great Outdoors Act, which was um, passed and, and began funding last year. And we have been very successful here, I think in Southeast Alaska, uh, the region received about $12 million last year. And these are primarily for um, deferred maintenance recreation projects. Um, I know the Senator spoke of cabins. They are a popular um, recreational experience here throughout the region. Those are just uh, types of the projects we expect to receive uh, the same or a little bit more funding in that arena as well as we move into 2021. So Robert, I'm gonna toss it back to you. I hope I generated a few questions here and uh, thanks for sharing the space here with me, Corey, um, but I'll, I'll uh, close there. All right, thanks, Dave. And let's go ahead and bring the commissioner back on screen side by side so we can take a couple of questions, but just working backwards on a couple of your comments, Dave, um, uh, there's uh, about you know 150 of us here that won't be on that uh, that that call, but we've got 60 uh, some odd folks online that uh, can uh, certainly uh, provide you some input tomorrow night, as well as uh, folks that are following this media wise. So we'll certainly get the word out there and look forward to working with you and your team. And I really appreciate your staff um, uh, reach, reaching out and, and communications. I think are um, are moving forward well. So I thank you for that, and also. Just uh, to recognize some of the the um, the ways that that the Forest Service has been really cooperatively working, you know, you mentioned mining. I think uh, the UCOR folks uh, have seen uh, some some cooperation with with you uh, on on some regards there. And then uh, I know the folks uh, in Angoon for uh, Team Thayer uh, is uh, very appreciative of uh, your team's support for that project moving forward. So. Um, lest anyone uh, draw the wrong conclusions, uh, we are very glad to be partners with the Forest Service here in Southeast Conference. So we look forward to working with you there. Uh, questions in the room. I know uh, the commissioner mentioned uh, some permitting uh, uh, improvements for uh, new, 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 new approvals. I know that's going to make a lot of folks here glad. Uh, <laughs> Us too. We we got a question, and maybe maybe we can pan, we use the camera to pan the room a little bit. Are we doing that? Um, so yeah, there we go. Alec. Yeah, uh, yeah, I do. Uh, my name is Alec Mezdag. I have a question for the commissioner. Uh, my wife runs a small oyster farm and she in uh, April of 2018 submitted an application for an aquatic farm lease uh, near Juneau. And, you know, and about six months later, she got a letter acknowledging receipt of the application. And then the following summer, she had a little back and forth with staff on, on completing, uh, you know, sending documents back and forth. Uh, by December of 2019, she had a preliminary approval, and a few months after that, she had a uh, final finding and decision in favor of issuing the lease. That was appealed, uh, you know, so this is about uh, April of 2020, and since that time, we haven't heard uh, anything about that appeal, and, you know, we're getting to the point, uh, you know, her farm has grown a little bit, uh, she's uh, been operating long enough, she started making sales in 2020, uh, she's, uh, the, you know, one of the biggest problems that she's facing is she's not going to be able to, on the site that she has now, which is very small and constrained, she's not going to be able to grow the product that she needs to meet demand. Mm -hmm. And we're wondering, you know, when, when is that uh, appeal likely to be processed, you know, so, and so I guess my question is, you know, what is the average time between when DNR receives an appeal mm -hmm. and when that appeal is decided? And what sorts of actions is the department taking to reduce that time frame? Yeah. And then, you know, what have the results of those actions been in terms of, you know, a percentage of the time frame that has been reduced? Great. Now, thank you very much for that question. I'm glad that you called out the appeals. When Governor Dunleavy and our administration took over in late 2018, my office had a backlog of about 155 appeals that I kid you not went all the way back to some of them 2007. That has been a huge focus for myself and my staff. And we have managed to adjudicate and render decisions on just over 50 appeals a year. 
uh, since we came in. And so we're, we're rapidly chopping away at the backlog. Um, what we try to do with, with appeals when they come in the door is first of all, if it's an appeal that can impact ongoing business, um, then we try to flag those we can we can stay activities or lift stays on activities depending upon what the appeal deals with so that we don't impact business and the um the appeals are dealt with on first in first out type of basis and aside from the fact that we had the backlog and trying to churn through those and and sort of get our head back above water again um i will go back and and inquire about this one to find out what the status of it was when it came in if it was stayed um and then what the what the um what the matter on appeal is we're trying to deal with these in a very expeditious manner there's no set rule of thumb because as you can imagine we get appeals on everything from from you know mariculture to oil and gas to mining to you know to parks activities and so each one is very unique and it has to be taken a look at and we gather the administrative record go back and take a fresh look at uh, at the decision tree that went into each one of those. So I've taken down some some notes and the the last name, and if I may reach out to Robert, or if you could send me an email directly um, with some of the information there, we can pull it up and I can see where it's at in the queue. It isn't one that comes to mind, but if it's impacting business, then obviously we want to get it picked up and get it cleared. I appreciate that. You know, I, I think. You know that that might be good for us if you're willing to take that specific look at it. But uh, you know we clearly aren't the only people in this situation. No, you're right. Yep. You know, ideally we'd see some sort of systematic solution to this yeah. that would allow businesses. You know, because this will be something that I know impacts our ability to grow in a very meaningful right. way very soon. And I'm right. sure that that is the experience of many others. So I appreciate your work mm -hmm. on on the mm -hmm. larger issue of processing all of these. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. Okay. You know, I think along those lines, I'm just curious if there is uh, any criteria for determining standing for an appeal. I mean, if I, I don't like the taste or texture of oysters and yeah. I file an appeal on, uh, you know, said permit, is that really, you know, yeah. sufficient standing to tie it up for two years? Um, yeah, and there are there are statutory criteria that determine what the standing is, you know, traditionally, uh, and this very high level, but traditionally, if there's some sort of a of a monetary impact, or if there is a land title issue, uh, it, you know, it can't be uh, in standing, it can't just be, as you said, I don't like the taste of oysters. So therefore, I don't want anybody, you know, farming oysters. All right, thanks. No question? Uh, yeah, maybe I can. Uh, uh, I have uh, a couple of mariculture leases, and and that process of uh, of the appeal. So I have two two comments about that. Uh, one is uh, we specifically haven't been subject to appeal, but a number of people that I am familiar with in the industry are are subject to the uh, the appellate process. And as I understand it, the standard for for uh, it uh, initially is that. They will they had to object during the public comment period, um, whether or not that uh, you know where that adjudication as to whether that standing is valid. Beyond that, there is, as I understand it, no there's no statutory or regulatory framework under which an appeal will occur, and when those timelines. You know, it, um, I've, I practiced law for you know, about 20 years, and in most appellate processes, there is a specific timeline that goes through that's a, you file within this period, you have to respond within this period, the adjudication occurs within this period, and you'll get a decision within this period. That's part that hasn't, that doesn't exist in, uh, in, right, in not the yet. regulatory structure now. And so my question for you is, uh, is there uh, interest on the part of the department to, uh, to coordinate with industry too. Uh, and I think it probably requires a legislative uh, action yeah. to modify the, the language to, uh, to include that kind of structure. You know, is that something that you're uh, open to uh, that discussion um, and uh, you know, even for as quickly as in the next session? 
Mm -hmm. And yeah, actually a great point because when we took up the backlogged appeals, that was one of the things that we dealt with first was what kind of structure and framework and what kind of timeline would be appropriate to put around the appeal processing um, you know, gambit. But one of our challenges, we've developed some draft language, but one of our challenges now that the team is working on is how do we establish appropriate timelines in each of the buckets for where those appeals may fall? Uh, some of them, for example, that may have questions of law that are still pending in litigation that aren't yet ripe for, um, for deciding on need to be able to linger. And if we, if we establish hard and fast statutory timelines, obviously that's gonna run afoul and won't necessarily protect the best interest of the state or the businesses that, uh, in, that are being addressed through whatever the, the merits of the appeal may be. So it's a little more loaded than, than a simple, you know, cut and dry, it will be six months or it will be seven months. But do know that that language is under development and it is a, a, a process that as we've worked through that backlog and had a chance to really see what a lot of those appeals deal with, we have some common themes and in those areas, uh, we're feeling like we can put some, uh, put some sideboards around that. All right, uh, Dave, who would have thought that at a session saw these conference that the commissioner was going to get the get the grilling and uh, you're going to get let off easy. So uh, <laughs> I good, have days, a good for, days ahead. For Dave, if I could. <laughs> no, we appreciate both of you and what you're doing in the region and across the, the state. Uh, you know, I think uh, Dave, we're going to have a few projects and some input for you for some locally driven projects uh, that uh, and really appreciate you getting that process kicked off sooner than later. So I appreciate that. There's never an optimal time. So uh, the, yesterday's good, today's okay. Um, so thanks for what you're doing there. Commissioner, thank you again, as always, for, for joining us. And uh, we hope you can follow along with some of the other sessions and look forward to continued working relationship with both of you. So a round of applause, please, for our panelists from afar. Thank, thanks, Robert. Thanks, Corey. Thanks, Dave. Take care. Thanks, Robert. So I'll switch over to this mic over here. Because I'm really interested in hearing from our, our, our next panel, and I've not had the pleasure of meeting Elliot in person, uh, but uh, coming from the vice president of search, who has done just a remarkable job uh, during this pandemic in so many different ways. And his specialty over the last 20 years or so, you know, working both the, the tribal and the non-tribal, which is kind of, well, you know, I think Haynes was, I believe, one of the first places that really tried that model out. And uh, being a, a, a multi-decade veteran of, of Haynes, I've, I've watched with appreciation the service that has grown throughout the region. Um, I'm going to invite you to come on up with our other uh, healthcare panelists, uh, Ms. Rose Lawhorn, who is also um, uh, a delight because not just because um, longtime friend, but because she is exactly the type of story that we are so proud of in this region. Someone who has started at entry level in an industry like healthcare and worked her way through the system and with diligence has now has reached uh, the leadership position that she now has. And so we're so, uh, so proud to see that kind of advancement in the region is something that we, um, go, go, please, please have a seat. You'll, we'll give you the mic one at a time. I'm just going to, I'm just going to ramble on for a couple more minutes because, um, you know, uh, we did a Southeast, by, we did a healthcare by the numbers just a couple of years ago and really identified some of the stress points is pre-pandemic on the, on the healthcare workforce. And it is, uh, it was astonishing then to see the numbers that uh, were going to be necessary and I know that's a, a track that the university folks are watching. We've got folks there today, uh, both in the room and, and online. And so we're just really uh, grateful to have you both here. Uh, you see our commitment to doing what we can as, as, as leaders in the region, through other, uh, the communities and business sector to get vaccinated, mask up, <laughs> help support one another. But where, where, where are we at? And what are, the, what are the stress points that you see going forward? And uh, we really appreciate. So we're gonna, we'll start off um, and uh, with Rose and uh, have you give your remarks and then Ellie, if you just follow her after that and then we'll take some questions from the floor. But um, thank you for joining us. Yeah, yeah come, come on, come, come on up. Make this fit me a little better. <laughs> thank you, Robert. 
And thanks to all of you at Southeast Conference and around our region for taking the time and effort to join forces like this in Southeast Alaska and find our strengths, find our unity. And my background, of course, is healthcare. And working at Bartlett has given me the firsthand look of the challenges that we're facing and that many of my colleagues are facing in healthcare. The beginning of 2020 was uh, appeared to be a reasonably normal year, and then the pandemic hit, and we started seeing the changes and how it, the landscape was changing and how our approach to healthcare was changing. We know about science, we know about rationales and, and how to respond to disease processes, but COVID changed all of that. We were chasing science that was evolving. We were trying to educate our, our clinical workers and, and develop an environment that provided for their safety. And that included building walls, changing ventilation. A lot of effort and energy went into just ensuring that we could continue to meet our mission of providing safe quality care to our patients. And we had, um, of course, increased cost. We've heard a lot about the, the federal funding that's available and how we can use that to the best ability to continue to grow and evolve as healthcare industry uh, partners. Um, we've come together greatly as our um, uh, community agencies, um, developing solutions, sharing challenges and saying, how can we do better coming together? How can we be stronger as a team, not just in our communities, but in our region and in the state? Of course, we've partnered with ASHNA, our Alaska State Hospital and Nursing Home Association. They have strong advocacy for patient care and for our leaders. Um, and it's just, it feels so good to know that we have strength together. We come together in unity. We find that we appreciate diversity, but we also can come together with a, a single focus and build each other up and say, what can we do to take care of our patients better? What can we do to protect our communities? What can we do to bring us back to what normal is going to look like and improve the economy and improve the schools and getting the kids out there? And part of that is, finding out where the gaps are. We need, we need more healthcare um, workers. We need, how do we get healthcare workers? We provide a, a robust education and opportunities for them in an innovative way, not just the routine, go to the college and, and get their classes, but now we're looking at virtual care, virtual education, virtual conferences, and all of this has to happen in order to be successful. We need to, to be robust as communities. We need to be thriving and engaged. And right now, the current state of affairs is a, is a significant challenge. And maybe Dr. Rules will say more about that. Anchorage is overwhelmed. Fairbanks is overwhelmed. There are beds in conference rooms. There are desperate cries for help, for resources, and people to come and take care of patients. And we can do this. We can win this war. <laughs> it feels like a war. 20 years ago, the nation came together in solidarity. We found our passion in patriotism. This is a different kind of battle. We're fighting for our health. We're fighting for unity, for equity, delivering health care to all. Everyone in our country deserves a good quality experience in healthcare. Let's come together, find our find where we are the same, appreciate the differences, and keep our community healthy and strong together. We can do that through vaccinations. We can do that through masks. Do I like wearing a mask? No, I do not. I'm just going to tell you. <laughs> That's my, <laughs> my honest moment there. But you know what, it keeps us safe. It keeps my kids going to school. It keeps our kids, it keeps us coming to events like this and doing so safely. And it keeps me doing what I can to ensure that my healthcare workers are not overwhelmed 
that we get to have this community experience in whatever way is possible. So thank you for joining me. Thank you again, Robert, for giving us this opportunity to just share. I have to give a nod to our, our CBJ um, Emergency Operations Center. We've gotten a lot of work. We've set up vaccination clinics. We've um, put on alternate care sites and, and the, there's plan A, B, C, D, because we know things change. And it's just been this incredible opportunity where diverse healthcare groups come together. The lines are blurred. I am not an acute care hospital, but I do reach into public health. I do preventive care and follow-up care and the primary care comes in and helps us. So this is a real time when we can come together as a healthcare community and as all of you working together to meet the right goals and to keep us all moving forward together as, a, as an organization. So thank you so much. There we go. Um, is it okay for me to call you Rose? Yeah, yeah. thank you, Rose. Um, so uh, it's an honor to be here and um, really a kind of a pleasure to be talking to a group that's interested in economics and economic development. Um, as a physician for the last couple of years, it's been an awful lot of time talking about the pandemic and talking about the medical issues surrounding um, uh, surrounding the pandemic, uh, but really um, it's cool to be um, talking about healthcare and it was really very heartening to see how healthcare has been sort of a foundation for our economy as we've been going through really a healthcare crisis. Um, uh, unlike anything that's been seen um, in generations. So um, it, it really is a challenge that we're all being confronted with to, uh, to deal with. And um, I, I know because I've participated with Rose in a number of um, the healthcare uh, planning sessions and so on for, through, the, um, through ASHNA, the Alaska State Hospital um, and Nursing Home Association and uh, other leadership groups uh, that we're all, we've all been facing the same kinds of crises in terms of not just medical care, but also in terms of staffing and um, uh, the, the shifting sands, um, which continue to shift. Um, you know, currently there's a lot of uncertainty um, for coming from the federal government, <clears throat> excuse me, um, about the timing of booster shots for vaccines and and um, so these are, these are logistical and operational challenges. Um, as a physician, it's been great to travel out to many of your communities over the last 25 years that I've been practicing, um, you know, from Haines down to Prince of Wales, Cake, Angoon, all of those places. And um, I think if we're talking, uh, and I'm gonna speak just for a few minutes about search um, the Southeast Alaska Regional Health Consortium. And uh, we have a presence in most of your communities. And uh, it's sort of like, I think the, the parable of the blind man and the elephant, uh, which is an old, you know, it comes from 500 BC. And it's a story about a, a group of blind men who encounter an elephant. And one of them, uh, and, and they're trying to describe the elephant to one another. And one of them touches the the side of the elephant and says, the you know, elephant is like a wall. And another one touches the leg and says, it's like a tree. And another touches the tusk and uh, elephant is like a spear. Um, we, we provide care in 27 different communities. And while in a given community, it feels like search is a Search is a small clinic with a treatment room that's open 24 hours a day. In another community, it's a hospital with, um, with specialists and surgeons. In another community, um, it's a clinic that provides care on an itinerant basis. There's a physician or a, a nurse practitioner that um, comes to, 
to provide care. So it's a very, very complex system of care um, around the region. Um, so um, in the 27 different locations, we provide hospital care. So last year we provided uh, uh, over 6,000 hospital days um, in our two hospitals, once in Wrangell and once in Sitka. Um, uh, 188,000 clinic visits, um, 17,000 behavioral health visits. Um, a new thing in healthcare is telehealth, and that's been growing for all of us. And, and last year, we, um, we surpassed 20,000 telehealth visits. Um, we have two long-term care facilities, one's in Sitka and one's in Wrangell. Um, and uh, they have 14 and 16 beds that are continuously full because we all know that um, care of elderly patients is a growing demand and um, really uh, an opportunity for us as a region to provide more care um, is for um, long-term care. Um, we also provide a lot of specialty care, over 7,000 visits last year. Um, and that's everything from orthopedics to gynecology, to urology, nephrology and most of it's itinerant. Um, we provide health education. Last year, over 535 events that touched over 11,000 participants in our region. Those are events like healthy living events, learning, um, learning about healthy diets um, and exercise. We have behavioral health um, programs for adolescents, including substance abuse treatment um, and just behavioral health treatment for adolescents. And we also provide substance abuse treatment for adults, um, uh, both intensive outpatient treatment and intensive outpatient treatment with adjacent um, living opportunities. Um, so really, um, the diversity of different activities and operations is quite complex. Um, and there've been a number of large capital projects that we've been involved with recently. We built a hospital in Wrangell, the new Met Wrangell Medical Center that um, includes a long-term care facility with 14 beds, as well as eight acute um, hospital beds, an emergency room and an adjacent clinic. That was a $35 million project. And we're just about to embark on a $300 million project in Sitka to um, reconstruct the healthcare campus there. And some of you may know about Monagecom Hospital, which is a hospital that dates back to the Second World War. It's about 70 years old. And although it's been kept up to date, you know, it's really reaching the end of its useful life. And so we're gonna be building a new hospital campus there. Um, but really um, in healthcare, uh, the story is not so much about uh, capital projects as much as it's about operations. And operations is really, um, you know, the most challenging thing, both in terms of um, uh, economic sustainability, as well as keeping ourselves staffed. So, um, you know, we have throughout the Southeast Alaska region, we have, um, uh, we have a, a, a payroll of $132 million and uh, also an additional spend in our communities of about $85 million. So um, uh, what does that translate to in terms of jobs? That's about 1,400 um, uh, paid positions spread out over the region. So for example, here in the Haines uh, Upper Lynn Canal area, um, including Kluckwan, we have about 75 employees. Um, in um, many of our smaller communities, we're the largest employer. Um, and we're proud of that. Um, it's a big responsibility and um, really a big effort. On top of that, um, we've had the joy of providing about 500,000 COVID tests in the last year. And um, the challenge of trying to distribute vaccine you know, over this area, the size of, uh, I guess the size of California, the size of Florida, huge area, um, flying vaccine um, around. And, and I think um, the latest is um, we've given about 15,000 vaccinations. All of, none of that really would be possible without um, tremendous collaboration with different communities. Um, 
and with the leaders of not just tribes, but also of uh, municipalities and um, other organizations. It's an honor and a privilege for us. We're so proud of our relationships with communities. And I, I think the thing that the COVID-19 epidemic has helped us to really reflect on um, in terms of our company's values um, and the emphasis on our commitment to each individual in our communities and our efforts to try to live up to that. And I think um, nowhere has that um, been more evident than, um, than the, the efforts and the lessons that we've learned um, uh, trying to vaccinate all of our communities. We're very proud of those efforts. They've been, um, uh, it's been challenging for our staff and uh, for our leadership, um, but all for a good cause. I think um, these challenges are going to continue. And um, as Rose was saying, I think um, only through collaboration and um, some cautious optimism um, can uh, the leaders of our region pull our communities through this and pull us um, through um, the challenges that we face. But I, I'm, I'm confident we'll, do, we'll make it. Thank you both. Um, so we'll take a few, we've got a few minutes for, for questions that we can uh, we take from around the room, but how, how are staff holding up? I mean, you guys are on the front lines. Uh, you talk about all the employees you have, but how are they holding up? You know, 18 months of COVID is a long time. And so it's really our job as leaders to reinfuse them with with energy, with support, um, counseling, rolling chocolate trays around, <laughs> whatever works. So they're hanging in there, but it's time for some reinforcements. Elliot, uh, yeah, I, 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 I've done the chocolate thing too. <laughs> it's most effective at about one in the morning. Yeah. Um, I, I'm really proud of the fact that we've really only turned over about 5% of our um, physician staff and provider staff and maybe uh, nine or 10% of our nursing staff. Um, I like to think that we're doing something right there, but it also means, it also reflects the staff's commitment to their communities, I think more than anything. I think, you know, people who work in this region, you know, don't sort of, they don't um, sort of land here accidentally. And so once they're here and they, they really connect to the communities, then um, that commitment is, is of, you know, really it's a foundation. So, uh, you know, uh, our challenge is to live up to that. It's to live up to their commitment. Um, you know, kind of like, you know, the way that hopefully we're treating our first responders, you know, because, you know, although we don't really employ first responders, I'll tell you what, this has been very, very difficult for for fire departments and for ambulance groups, um, you know, the volunteer um, fire departments are, they have been stretched to the end. And, and I think, you know, for our professional staff, um, it's really, um, it kind of comes with the territory. You know, I mean, when I, when I went to medical school, you know, you, you take an oath, the same with nurses, you know, you take an oath and a you have a dedication to your patients and an expectation around that. And, um, and I think most people find that drives them forward. But, you know, there's, we, the majority of our staff are not doctors and nurses. They're people who have jobs that keep, the thing, keep things rolling. And the real challenge is to, you know, help them to um, identify with the mission and to feel valued as, as employees. And um, I'm not going to joke. I mean, that's just really serious these days. It's hard. So what, what are you seeing longer term as, as far as the after effects? Uh, we've heard stories of just uh, mental health issues going down to age, ages that is just mind boggling, uh, pulmonary long-term uh, concerns. 
infrastructure that might be needed that is beyond your current capacity? Are those, uh, how, how are you addressing those and helping communities be more supportive of, of those needs or are there others, if those are accurate? Uh, you wanna go first? Or I, I, yeah. The behavioral health crisis is certainly significant. We're seeing before COVID we saw, um, and this is, we're talking about pediatrics, kids 14 and less, we saw, you know, three a quarter coming through the emergency department. And now we're seeing three to five a week. Mm. And that has a place as burden on the staff who are trying to, and, and who try to care for these patients. And it is a profession that we've signed up for, but it, it does require support. And, and we did offer that to our teams in terms of counselors and, and you know, they don't wanna go to the counselor who is in the same system. So we're reaching out so that they can get support. Also just um, the infrastructure bills and, and there aren't a lot of uh, available workforce reinforcements locally. And so like the infrastructure bills for, for the telehealth and changing regulation allowing us to pull on resources, reciprocal licensing, those provide this pathway for assistance so that these overworked um, EMS teams, I mean, you know, can get some relief. And, and we are hiring EMS in the hospital and having to think outside the box and look at new ways of operating. And, and that, requires us to follow regulatory changes and what is gonna be an emergency use or an emergency declaration or, or um, regulation that's changing, but we'll go back. And so it, it does require a lot of advocacy to get these things changed, these system changes. And then you have patients who are used to receiving care virtually or receiving care through telehealth and they don't wanna have to drive drive in and make all go to this, you know, the clinic and then the lab and the x-ray, you know, they'd rather just get it all done in one fell swoop. So advocacy as regulations are changed is another way we can support that. And then again, fund education. We need new people coming into the field um, because we are going to retire out of it someday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think um, the old solutions of just simply hiring, um, hiring into positions and filling them with um, live people um, just seems increasingly difficult. And so thinking laterally, um, both in terms of extending our staff geographically and um, our ability to do that um, is enhanced the same way that all of you have been learning how to use virtual meetings in your work. Um, I think, you know, we've been, um, through COVID, we've been forced to, um, to become experts at providing virtual care. Now that's not a complete substitute. Um, it isn't, um, you know, ultimately medicine is about trust. It's about having a trusting relationship, a real relationship with somebody. And there's some very there's some barriers to that with virtual care, and and uh, as well as of course the inability to to physically examine somebody and fully react to them. But I think um, you know that's been that's been the backstop. But right now in mental health, the ability to hire mental health clinicians is it's extremely difficult and not just in Alaska. It's always been hard to hire them in Alaska, actually. I'll tell you over the last 25 years, I've been in this business here, but you know, uh, it's much, much, it's a totally changed landscape. So um, yeah, so particularly in behavioral health, you can have some success with virtual care and we've greatly expanded that in the last um, 18 months. And just going back to the workforce piece, it we've heard that the, the itinerant support sometimes you have to bring in from outside is is really a significant piece of the cost component of healthcare, and that the ability to home grow and have you know full time employees that live in the region uh, would be a component of stability and and may perhaps impact the price. Can you speak to the the, the cost of care uh, that that the having the the lack of workforce has in the region? I'll go first this time. Um, well, 
the, the cost of healthcare in this country continues to grow. Um, and, and, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's upsetting for all of us, right? Because we all see how our insurance costs go up and our out-of-pocket costs go up. There's so many things that are driving that. Um, I think something like 34% of all economic activity in this country at this time is healthcare, um, which is hmm. um, startling. Some people are very upset about that. Um, um, I think there's an alternative view that um, taking care of each other and providing care to one another is a very important part of what we do in our society. But uh, certainly um, there's lots of studies that show that the quality of care and the amount of access to care that we have as Americans is, is great, is really comes up short compared to the amount of money that we spend for it. And there's lots of reasons for that. Um, you know, certainly um, there's lots of third parties, people who are not in the room when a, when a nurse or a physician is caring for somebody, whether, you know, um, who uh, uh, increase the amount of that spend I think that the, um, you know, Senator Murkowski, the congressional delegation, um, they've really stepped up to um, support healthcare in terms of the increased cost of doing business in the last year and a half. I think the big challenge that we have is actually not right now, but it's, what is it, two years down the road when you know, that added support um, is no longer there. And how do we, um, uh, you know, how do we navigate those challenges at that point? I think that's going to be a reckoning for, I mean, not just for us, I mean, for everybody. Right. Rose, the cost of itinerant care versus uh, regular workforce that you live in town? I'm sorry, I heard, I couldn't the, the, the cost of bringing in, you know, oh. the, the itinerant uh, workforce versus it is, yes, workforce. absolutely. It's, I mean, you look at contract labor um, and just the time, the time delays with background screening. And we do appreciate the changes and the streamlined processes that um, made it, a, made us able to per, deliver the care more quickly and, and give our in home people a reprieve. Um, it, it's well known. And so, we look at, again, alternative ways to get them into our long-term workforce and um, see if we can woo them in and, and make them fall in love with Alaska. <laughs> it's like an eight or nine month process and the best of circumstances wow. to, get somebody, to get somebody licensed, credentialed and moved, which, okay. um, you know, it's like driving at high speed, looking in the rearview mirror or something. It's just really a kind of a, a crazy circumstance and, and um, so, you know, Rose was talking about the fact that there's several initiatives to, to help us to be able to um, uh, take people who are properly credentialed from other locations in the country and create reciprocity or process that allows us to more rapidly um, get them um, into the workforce. And I think, um, you, you know, we're part of professional organizations that have been pushing on that. Um, and it, it is important. It's pretty frustrating to find somebody who wants to work um, and then to wait for, you know, four to six months for, you know, for a regulatory process to kind of catch up to that decision. Mm -hmm. So that's, there's, there's one thing that's pretty cool that's going on that's new um, or kind of new is a behavioral health aid program that the state has that allows, um, allows folks that do not necessarily have um, any kind of advanced degrees to go th through a series of stepwise training um, mm -hmm. to become a behavioral health provider. Uh, it's, it's pretty rigorous. It takes a couple of years, but it's much less rigorous than having to go and get a bachelor's degree and then go to uh, get a master's in counseling or something. So um, this, uh, and that's in partnership with the um, ANTHC and that's, um, uh, and that's a great program that's hopefully going to expand the behavioral health workforce. Great. All right. Well, we're going to take a break now, but uh, on behalf of our great speakers and the wonderful frontline workers that they represent, so we give them a please a, a resounding Thank round of you. applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Nice to meet you. I look forward to it.